Star Wars, Choices of One By Timothy Zahn A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the choices of one shaped the futures of all. Jedi saying, The last hyperspace jump had been a tricky one, starting ASID did in one minor star system barely on the charts and ending in another even more obscure one. But the ISD Chimera's officers and crew were the finest in the galaxy, and as Commander Galad Pelian looked over the repeater display he confirmed that they'd made the jump precisely. He strode down the command walkway, gazing at the Chimera's long prow, wondering what in space they were doing here. The Chimera was an Imperial Star Destroyer, a kilometer and a half of heavy armor and awesome weaponry, the very symbol and expression of Imperial power and authority. Even the arrogant anarchists of the rebellion hesitated before going up against ships like this. So with that same rebellion boiling ever more loudly and violently across the empire, with Lord Vader himself tasked with tracking down and destroying their leadership, what in the name of Imperial Center was the Chimera doing on passenger transport duty? This is insane, Captain Carl Drusen muttered as he came up beside Pelian. What in the galaxy is Command thinking of? It does seem a bit odd, Pelian said diplomatically. But I'm sure they have their reasons. Drew Sand snorted. If you believe that, you're a fool. Imperial Center has gone top-heavy with politicians, professional flatterers, and incompetence. Reason and intelligence went down the garbage chutes a long time ago. He gestured at the starlit sky in front of them. My guess is that someone's just trying to impress everyone with his ability to move fleet units around. Could be, sir, Pelian said, a small shiver running up his back. In general, Drew Sen was right about the way the Imperial Court was going, though even a ship's captain shouldn't be discussing such things out loud. In this case, however, Drew Sen was wrong because this particular order hadn't come from some flunky at Imperial Center. That was how it had looked, and how it was clearly intended to look. Unlike the captain, though, Pelian hadn't taken the order at face value, but had taken the time to run a backtrack. While it had indeed come through proper channels from Imperial Center, it hadn't originated there. It had, in fact, come from an undisclosed location in the Outer Rim, According to the top-secret dispatches Drew San had shared with his senior officers, that was where Grand Admiral Zarin was right now, quietly turning the edge of Imperial space aboard the ISD predominant. Which strongly implied that the Chimera's orders had come from the Grand Admiral himself. Incoming ship, Captain, the sensor officer called from the starboard crew pit. Just jumped into the system. Sensors read it as a Cazellus glass like freighter. Drew San whistled softly. A Cazellus, he commented. That's a rare bird. They stopped making those years ago. We have an ID yet? Yes, sir, the comm officer called from the portside crew pit. Code response confirms it's the Saliban's hope. Pelian cocked an eyebrow. Not only had their mysterious passenger arrived, but he'd arrived within minutes of the Chimera's own appearance. Either he had a highly developed sense of timing, or he was remarkably lucky. Vector? Drew Sen asked. Directly starboard, the sensor officer called. Range 80 kilometers. Not only practically on top of the Chimera in time, but in position as well. Pelian's estimation of the freighter's pilot went up another couple of notches. Of course, not everyone saw it that way. Criffing fool, Drew Sand grunted. What's he trying to do, run us down? Pelian took a few steps forward and peered out the starboard viewport. Sure enough, the glow of a sublight drive was just barely visible out there against the background stars except that the glow shouldn't have been visible. Not at that distance. Not unless the pilot was hauling his sublights for all they were worth, 
and then some. And the only reason someone would do that. Captain, I recommend we go to full alert, Pelian said urgently, turning back to Drusan. That ship's running from something. For a moment Drusan didn't reply, his eyes flicking past Pelian's shoulder to the approaching freighter. With an effort, Pelian forced himself to remain silent, letting his captain work through the logic in his own unhurried, methodical way. Finally, to his relief, Drusan stirred. Full alert, the captain called. And reconfirm that identity code. Just in case he's not running from anyone, but is thinking of ramming us. Pelian turned back to the viewport hoping he'd been able to keep his bewilderment from showing before the captain could see it. Did Drusen honestly believe anyone would be stupid enough and suicidal enough to try such an insane stunt? Even the lunatics of the rebellion knew better than that. Still, as long as Drusen's paranoid assumption got the shields up and the turbolasers charging. Incoming! The sensor officer snapped. Six unidentified ships jumping in, bearing in sweet cluster pattern behind the Saliban's hope. Come about, Drusan said, his voice taking on an edge of eagerness. The captain loved it when he had a chance to fire the Chimera's turbolasers at something. All turbolasers to full power, Pelian grimaced. As usual, Drusan was following standard combat procedure. Only in this case, standard procedure wasn't going to work. By the time the Chimera was ready to fire, the attackers would have caught up with the Saliban's hope and be swarming it. But if the Chimera threw power to its sublight engines and headed straight toward the freighter, they might scare off the attackers, or at least give them a moment of pause. Closing the distance would also mean getting to the Turbolacer's effective range a little sooner. Captain, if I may suggest. No, you may not, Commander. Drew Sand cut him off calmly. This is no time for your fancy theories of combat. Captain, the Saliban's hope is hailing us, the comm officer called. Lord Odo requests your immediate attention. Pelian frowned. Lord Odo was the sort of name that belonged in the Imperial Court, not way out here in the Outer Rim. What would a member of the court be doing this far from Imperial Center? Put him through, Drusan ordered. Yes, sir. There was a click. Captain Drusan, this is Lord Odo, a melodious voice said from the bridge speaker. As you may have noted, I've come under attack. I have indeed, Lord Odo, Drusan said. We're charging the turbolaser batteries now. Excellent, Odo said. In the meantime, may I request you shunt all other available power to the tractor beams and pull? Not a good idea, my lord, Drusen warned. At this range, a full power tractor beam could severely damage your hull. That you shunt all power to the tractor beams, Odo repeated, a sudden edge to his voice, and pull the two and most attackers toward you. And if we breach, belatedly, Drusen broke off. Oh. Yes. Yes, I understand. Ensign Kaun, tractors on the two and most raiders, lock up and reel in. Pelian turned back to the viewport, a lump in his throat. The engine flares of the attacking ships were visible now, blazing against the stars as they drove hard on the Saliban's hope's stern. Drusan had been right about the dangers of full-power tractor beams at this range. Clearly, that was what Odo was hoping for, that the Chimera's tractors would be strong enough to crack or even shatter the raiders' hulls. But if the attacker's ships were stronger than Odo thought, all the maneuver would accomplish would be to pull two of the raiders forward into close-fire range faster and easier than they could manage on their own at which point the Saliban's hope would have enemy lasers behind it and on both flanks, and it was unlikely that it would have enough shield capacity to handle all three. Hissing softly between his teeth, 
Pelian watched. Abruptly, the two pursuing ships on the ends began corkscrewing violently, their drive trails spinning like children's wind sparklers. Tractors engaged, the tractor officer called. Attackers locked and coming toward us. Any signs of hull fractures? Drusen asked. Nothing registering, sir, the sensor officer reported. Acknowledged, Drusen said. So much for that, he added to Pelian. Well, at least they can't fire on the Saliban's hope, Pelian pointed out. Not with that helix, y'all. Difficult to get a stable targeting lock that way, Drew San agreed reluctantly. But not impossible. And then, suddenly, Pelian got it. Oda wasn't just hoping the Chimera's tractors would tear the attacking ships apart. He was letting the Imperials pull the raiders up alongside him, banking on the Helix Yaw to interfere with their own firing long enough. He was still working through the logic when the Saliban's Hope's lasers flashed to either side, blasting the two tractored raiders to scrap. And as the expanding clouds of debris twisted free of the tractor's grip, they naturally and inevitably fell backward past the still-accelerating Saliban's Hope and directly into the paths of the four raiders still chasing it. Captain, turbolasers online, the weapons officer reported. Target the remaining attackers, Drew Sand snorted. That is, if there's anything they're still worth targeting. And alert the hangar bay duty officer that he has a ship coming in. He looked at Pelian. If this Lord Odo is a member of the Imperial Court, he murmured, at least he's a competent one. Yes, sir, Pelian said. Shall I take over here while you go down to welcome him? Drew San made a face. Fortunately, I'm too busy cleaning up this mess to bother with visitors, he said. You go. Get him aboard, get him settled. You know the routine. Tell him I'll be down to greet him as soon as we've made the jump to light speed. Yes, sir, Pelian said. Maybe I can get him to tell us where exactly that encrypted course setting we were sent is taking us. Don't count on it, Commander, Drusan said. The Imperial Court loves its secrets as much as anyone else. He waved a hand. Dismissed. Pelian had never before had the dubious honor of welcoming an actual member of the Imperial Court aboard his ship. But he'd heard all the stories about the nobles' arrogance, their love of all things rare and expensive, and their colorful and sycophantic entourages. Lord Odo proved to be a surprise. The first person to emerge into the hangar bay from the docking tunnel was an old, Frail-looking human dressed not in lush and expensive colors but in plain, drab pilot's garb. The second was another human. Pelian assumed he was human, anyway, dressed in a gray and burgundy hooded robe, black gloves, boots, and cloak, and the black metal full-face mask of a pantomime mute actor. There was no third person. If Odo had an entourage, he'd apparently left it behind. Pelian waited, just to be sure, until the pilot signaled for the boarding hatch to be sealed. As it closed with a thump, he stepped forward. Lord Odo, he said, bowing at the waist and hoping fervently that the visitor would forgive any unintentional lapses in proper court etiquette. I'm Commander Galad Pelian, Third Bridge Officer of the Imperial Star Destroyer Chimera. Captain Drusen asked me to greet you and to inform you that he'll pay his own respects as soon as his duties on the bridge permit. Thank you, Commander, Odo said in the same melodious voice Pelian had heard on the bridge, now muffled slightly by the mask. There was no mouth opening, Pelian noted, nor were there even any eye slits. Either Odo could somehow see right through the metal, or else there was a compact heads-up display built into the inside. Are we on our way? Yes, sir, Pelian said, glancing at the nearest readout panel just to make sure. 
I believe the encrypted course data that arrived with your boarding authorization said it would be a 10 standard hour journey. Correct, Odo confirmed. I trust you'll forgive my appearance. My reason for this visit must remain private and my identity unrevealed. No explanation necessary, sir, Pelian hastened to assure him. I understand how things are done in the Imperial Court. Do you now? Odo said. Excellent. Perhaps later you can instruct me on its more subtle aspects. Pelian felt a frown crease his forehead. Was Odo merely having a joke at a lowly fleet officer's expense? Or did he really not know the nuances of Imperial Court procedure and behavior? In which case, he was obviously not a member of the court. So who was he? I trust you have quarters prepared for us, Odo continued. The journey was long and fraught with danger. The masked and hooded head inclined slightly. Speaking of which, may I also thank you for your assistance against those raiders. Our pleasure, my lord, Pelian said, wondering for a split second if he should point out that the main tactical thrust of the engagement had in fact been Odo's. Probably not. It wouldn't do for the Imperial fleet to admit that a visiting civilian had come up with a better combat plan than they had. And yes, quarters have been arranged just off the hangar bay for you and your pilot. He looked at the pilot and raised his eyebrows. Your name? The pilot looked at Odo, as if seeking permission to speak. Odo made no move, and after a moment the pilot looked back at Pelian. Call me Soro, he said. His voice was as old and tired as the rest of him. Honored to meet you, Pelian said, turning back to Odo. If you'll follow me, my lord, I'll escort you to your quarters. Exactly nine and three-quarter standard hours later, even though it wasn't his watch, Pelian made sure to be on the Chimera's bridge. It was a waste of effort. The Star Destroyer emerged on the dark side of a completely unremarkable world, with an unremarkable yellow sun peeking over the planet's horizon and an unremarkable starscape all around them. And we aren't likely to see anything else, either, Drew Sand growled. We have orders to hold position right here until Lord Odo returns. There he goes, Pelian said, pointing at the glow of the Saliban's hopes drive as the freighter emerged from beneath the Chimera's long prow. The freighter headed toward the planetary horizon ahead, its image fogging briefly as it circled past the edge of atmosphere, and then vanished. What do you think about that mask of his? With an effort, Pelian dragged his mind away from the mystery of where they were to the mystery of who Odo was. He definitely doesn't want anyone knowing who he is, he said. Who or what? Drusan said. I had environmental services do a scan of the air outflow from his quarters. I thought. You what? Pelian interrupted aghast. Sir, the orders made it clear we weren't to question, interfere, or intrude upon Lord Odo's activities. Which I haven't, Drusan said. Keeping tabs on my ship's systems is part of my job. But... Besides which, it didn't work, Drusan said sourly. There are fifty different species biomarkers coming off him, at least eight of which the computer can't even identify. Probably coming from his mask, Pelian murmured, remembering now the sets of parallel slits set into the mask's curved cheekbone areas. I assumed the cheek slits were merely decorative. Apparently, they're stocked with biomarkers, Drusan said. Clever little flimp, isn't he? Still, whatever the reason for his visit, it should be over soon and we'll be able to take him and his ship back where we found them. Unless he wants us to take him elsewhere, Pelian pointed out. What does he need us for? Drew Sand countered. He's got a ship and a pilot. Let him go on his own, 
he exhaled noisily. Well, there's no point standing around waiting for him. I'm heading back to my quarters. I suggest you do likewise, Commander. Yes, sir, Pelian said. Giving the planetary horizon one final look, he followed Drews and back down the command walkway. Well? The Emperor asked. For a moment Senior Captain Thrawn didn't answer, merely continued to gaze out the viewport at the forested landscape stretched out below. An interesting situation, the blueskin chis said at last. Seated at the helm of his freighter, George Cardas kept his gaze straight ahead at the moon's horizon, wishing fervently that he was still in his self-imposed exile from the rest of the universe. Thrawn clearly didn't need him here. The Emperor clearly didn't want him here. But Thrawn had quietly insisted. Why, Cardas didn't know. Maybe Thrawn felt he owed Cardas. Maybe he thought he was doing Cardas a favor by bringing him back into contact with the High and Mighty this way. Cardas also didn't know why the Emperor hadn't chosen to make an issue of his presence aboard. Maybe he regarded Thrawn highly enough to forgive the other's little quirks. Maybe he was just amused by Cardas's obvious discomfort. Cardas didn't know. Nor did he really care. About anything. First of all, the multi-frequency force field you have set up should be more than adequate to protect the construction site, Thrawn said gesturing past Cardassa's shoulder at the huge half-finished sphere floating above the moon's surface. I trust the generator has redundant energy sources, plus an umbrella shield to protect it from orbital attack. It does, the Emperor confirmed. There are also a number of fully crewed garrisons in the forest around the generator. Has the moon any inhabitants? Primitives only, the Emperor said contemptuously. In that case, multiple garrisons are an inefficient use of resources, Thrawn said. I would recommend burning off the forest for a hundred kilometers around the generator and putting a small mechanized force of AT-ATS and juggernaut heavy assault vehicles under the umbrella shield. Add in point support from three or four wind clusters of hover scouts, and the rest of the troops and equipment could be reassigned to trouble spots elsewhere in the Empire. So you would suggest I make the generator completely unassailable? Palpatine asked. I assumed that was the intent. Thrawn paused, and Cardas glanced back in time to see the captain's glowing eyes narrow. Unless, of course, you're setting a trap. Of course, the Emperor said calmly. You of all my officers should understand the usefulness of a well-laid trap. Indeed. Thrawn agreed. One final recommendation. Don't dismiss too quickly those natives you mentioned. Even primitives can sometimes be used to deadly effect. They will not be a problem, the emperor said, dismissing the natives with a small wave of his hand. They don't like strangers. Any strangers. I leave that to your judgment, Thrawn said. Yes. Palpatine said flatly. And now, I sense you have a request to make. Speak. Thank you, Your Highness, Thrawn said. If he was surprised or discomfited by the Emperor's casual reading of his mind, it didn't show in his voice. It concerns a warlord named Nuso Esva who has become a serious power in the unknown regions. Palpatine gave a small snort. I wonder sometimes if you focus too much of your attention in those far reaches, Captain. It was you who authorized me to make such surveys, Thrawn reminded him. And properly so. The rebellion is a threat, but hardly the most serious one facing the Empire. In your opinion? Yes, Thrawn said. There was a short pause. Continue, the Emperor said. Warlord Nusso Esva has become one of those threats, Thrawn said. He possesses an unusually strong space-going navy, 
along with many slave and tributary worlds stretching into wild space and to the edge of the empire. I believe he is even now planning to extend his influence into imperial space. An alien, I presume, Palpatine said, his voice dripping with disgust. Can he be bought? I've sent, bargained with, or allied with. I've sent several communiques to him suggesting each of those options. He's turned down all of them. And what makes you think he wishes to extend his reach into my empire? He's begun a campaign against some of the worlds at the edge of the territories I've pacified, Thrawn said. His usual pattern is to use hit and fade tactics on shipping, or attempt to bribe or otherwise suborn the officials on those worlds all of whom are also aliens, Palpatine said with a sniff. I've warned you before that such beings cannot be molded into any sort of permanent political structure. The history of the Republic proves that. Perhaps, Thrawn said. The point is that Nusso Esva is using these raids to pin down my forces, and the only targets I can see that are worth such efforts are in Imperial space. Obviously, this cannot be tolerated. Then deal with him, the Emperor said flatly. I intend to, Thrawn said. The difficulty is that my forces are already overextended and overcommit. In order to deal a crushing blow I'll need a minimum of six more Star Destroyers. Out of the corner of his eye, Kardas saw the Emperor's eyes narrow. Do you seriously believe I have six Star Destroyers to spare, Captain Thrawn? I wouldn't ask if it wasn't important, Thrawn said evenly. It's not just the border sectors that are at risk, either. There are indications he may also be making overtures to the rebellion. Then perhaps you should speak to Lord Vader, the Emperor said. The rebellion is his special interest. Perhaps he can give you the Star Destroyers you require. An excellent suggestion, Your Highness. Thrawn said, inclining his head. I may do just that. It would be interesting to hear what the two of you have to say to each other. The Emperor gestured. We're finished here, pilot. Return us to the predominant. Yes, Your Highness, Kardas said. Getting a firm grip on the yoke, he put the ship into a smooth curve and headed for the Star Destroyer orbiting in the near distance behind them wondering distantly if Thrawn realized what he was getting himself into. Sitting here with the Emperor and a silent pair of Imperial Guards behind him was bad enough. But Vader was even worse. Ever since Yavin, every report Kardas had picked up had indicated that the appropriately titled Dark Lord of the Sith had grown a whole lot darker. The thought of asking him for anything, let alone Six Star Destroyers, was something Cardassa's mind wasn't up to. It hadn't always been that way. Once, Cardas had been head of an organization that had spanned the galaxy, a network of smugglers and information brokers who had serviced everyone from the huts to the highest levels of the Imperial Court. Cardas himself had been to the edge of Chiss space with Thrawn, back before the Clone Wars had savaged the Republic. He'd worked with the young commander watching as he defeated forces far larger than his own. Later, as Cardassa's organization grew, he'd had many occasions to speak directly with some of the most powerful men in Palpatine's new empire. In those days, standing before Darth Vader would have been little more than an unusually interesting day. But that had been before Cardassa's nearly fatal encounter long ago with that dark Jedi before his subsequent illness and weakness and impending death, before his abrupt decision to abandon his organization and leave it helpless before the infighting that was probably tearing it apart at this very moment, before he'd given up on everything. Still, even with his past burned behind him and his future lying bleak and formless in front of him, Cardas could feel an unexpected and unwelcome flicker of old curiosity stirring inside him. 
It really would be interesting to hear what Thrawn and Vader had to say to each other. Pelian had returned to his quarters, and had been asleep for nearly six hours when he was awakened by the insistent buzz of his intercom. Rolling over, he tapped the key. Pelian! This is the captain. Druzen's voice was practically quivering with suppressed emotion. Report to the bridge immediately. The rest of the senior bridge officers were already assembled across from the aft bridge turbolift when Pelian arrived. He eased his way through toward the front, noting uneasily that the group also included all the off-duty engine room officers and the senior commanders of the Chimera's TIE fighter, trooper, and stormtrooper contingents. Whatever was going on, it was big. He found Drusen waiting stiffly beside one of the consoles. Beside the captain, standing silent and still, was Lord Odo. Now that we're all assembled, Drusen said, his eyes flicking to Pelian, I have an announcement. We've been selected for the honor. He leaned on the word just a bit too hard, of acting as Lord Odo's personal transport on a special assignment. His lip twitched. As part of that assignment, Lord Odo will be in ultimate command of the Chimera. He continued. I trust all of you will respect his position and give him your full measures of skill, effort, and obedience. Questions? The first officer, Senior Commander Grandal, cleared his throat. May I ask the nature of this assignment? He asked. It's important, Odo told him evenly. For now, that's all you need to know. There was a brief, awkward silence. Have you orders for us, my lord? Drew San asked at last. Odo's hand came up from beneath his cloak, a data card in his gloved fingers. Here's our new course, he said, offering the card to Drew San. Our first stop will be the Runa system. And what exactly is that Runa? Grandarl asked. Commander, Drusen said warningly. That's all right, Captain, Odo said. There's some specialized equipment that I'll need to fulfill our mission. The equipment is at Runa. As it won't come to us, we shall have to go to it. Grandarl's eyes narrowed but he knew better than to rise to the bait. Better officers than him, Pelian knew, had been shunted to nowhere stations for reacting to the sarcasm of superiors. Yes, sir, he said. Take this to navigation, Drew Sen said, handing Grandal the data card. Get us moving as soon as the course is loaded. Yes, sir. Taking the card, Grandal strode through the pathway that opened up for him and headed through the archway into the main bridge. The rest of you, as you were, Drew Sand continued, looking around the group. The watch change is coming up. Don't miss it. He looked at Odo. Our new commander, he added, wouldn't like it. Pelian was back in his quarters by the time the Chimera made the jump to light speed. There was, he judged, enough time for him to grab another two hours of sleep before his next shift. But sleep wouldn't come. Lord Odo wasn't human. That much was pretty well guaranteed by the extraordinary means he'd taken to disguise himself, with the mask and the confusing mix of biomarkers. Pelian himself didn't have anything against aliens, and in fact had known and worked with quite a few whom he'd greatly respected. But the Emperor wasn't like that. His opinion of aliens was well known, and while he was willing enough to make alliances with aliens when it served his purposes, there were virtually none in the senior positions of the court or the military. The only exception Pelian knew of was senior Captain Thrawn, and even he was frequently sent away into the unknown regions to get him off Imperial Center for a while. So who was Odo? That was the question that kept chasing itself around Pelian's brain. Who was Odo, and what was this mission that was important enough to take the Chimera off patrol duty and put it under an alien's command? Pelian didn't know, 
and it was clear that Odo himself wasn't going to tell them. But maybe there was another way. The Empire, after all, was the greatest repository of information the universe had ever known. Maybe Odo had left a trail somewhere that could be followed. Getting up, Pelian put on a robe and went to his desk. He turned on the computer and keyed the intercom for the duty security officer. This is Commander Pelian, he said when the officer answered. Where are Lord Odo and his pilot? Lord Odo is on the bridge, the officer replied. Soro is in their shared quarters. When was Soro last out? Lord Odo, it appears that when they returned, Lord Odo doesn't eat on the bridge, does he? He hasn't so far, the officer said. Sorrow typically brings food back to their quarters for him. Any particular types of food? There have only been three meals, so I can't make any generalizations, the officer said. But so far it's been a different menu each time. Would you like a list? Yes, send it to me, Pelian said. A person's taste in food and drink could be useful clues in establishing his identity. And set up a standing order to inform me whenever Soro leaves his quarters. I presume Captain Drew San has already told you to keep track of them both? Yes, sir, he has. Good. Carry on. Pelian keyed off the intercom and for a moment he gazed off into space. Then, settling himself in his chair, he began punching computer keys. Somewhere on his way to gaining the Empire's trust, someone had to have crossed official paths with Odo, Soro, or the Saliban's hope. Wherever and whenever that was, Pelian was going to find it. The crawl space under the mining operations complex had been tricky to find. It had been even trickier to get into, and it had been trickier still to find the right junction box. But it had been worth it, Han Solo decided with satisfaction as he poked his probe around the tangle of wires. Even with the dirt and the heat. Even with the company. Han? Luke Skywalker murmured from behind him, for at least the fifth time. How's it going? It'd go faster if I didn't have to keep stopping to answer your questions, Han growled, easing a group of wires aside with his probe. The kid was good enough in a fight, but he had a bad habit of talking too much when he was nervous. Right, Luke said. Sorry. Han grunted, blowing a drop of sweat off the tip of his nose as he pushed his way past another knot of wires. Why Imperials couldn't keep their wiring nice and neat and easy to track through was beyond him. Not a hut's curse worth of pride in their work. Still, if the workers had had any pride, they probably wouldn't have put a nice convenient junction box down here beneath the complex's reactor heat exchanger where anyone with half a brain could get to it. In which case he and Luke would have had to do this the hard way. I just wanted to remind you that I'm ready whenever you are, Luke said. Great, Han said. I'll let you know. There it was, the junction he was looking for. Keeping the other wires out of the way with his probe, he maneuvered his jumper clip into the gap. A little delicate maneuvering, a little gentle touch. And without even a spark, he had it sealed. Also, Leia just called, Luke continued. She said we're pushing the timing here. All done, Han said, easing the probe back out of the box. Great, Luke said. And with a sudden snap hiss, the blue-white blade of his lightsaber flared into the narrow crawl space. Hey, watch it! Han snapped, flinching back from the blade hovering way too close over his head and arm. I said it's done. For a moment the hum and blaze of the lightsaber continued to fill Han's ears and eyes. 
Then, to his relief, the kid finally closed it down. I thought I was supposed to take care of the alarm and lock once you found the right junction, he said, an edge of not quite accusation in his voice. Sure, if you don't mind everyone knowing someone with a lightsaber was messing around down here, Han said. Maybe they'll blame Vader. Funny, Han grunted. A lot of people have seen you running around with that thing you know. And not just rebels. Anyway, it's done. I hotwired around it. Oh, Luke said, and as Han's eyes recovered from the lightsaber's glare he saw an uncertain frown on the kid's face. So why am I here? Maybe Leia didn't think I should be out at night without supervision. Han pulled out his comm link and flicked it on. This is Solo, he said, identifying himself. You're clear. Right. Princess Leia Organa's voice came back, the word sharply clipped, her tone no-nonsense and business-like. But Han could read beneath the tone. Whatever she said, whatever she did, she was crazy about him. He was pretty sure anyway. Now what? Luke asked. We get out of here, Han said, stuffing his tools back in their pouch and closing the junction box cover. I just hope whatever they want in there is worth all this. I hope so, too, Luke said. We really need a new base. Han frowned. They're looking for a new base? He nodded upward toward the building above them. In there? Yes, Luke said, sounding surprised. Didn't Leia tell you? It's a mining clearinghouse with records of all the major mining operations in this part of the empire. I know what it is, Han said patiently. I thought we were looking for some bulk cruisers or or carriers we could grab. That's the cover, sure, Luke said. But that's just to leave a false trail. The real plan is to download a bunch of locations where mining operations were started but abandoned. Leia thinks that. Yeah, I know what she thinks, Han growled, wiping irritably at the sweat on his forehead. A place with no mining usually means there's nothing else worth grabbing, either, which means no one wants the place. That's what she said, Luke confirmed. Sorry, I thought you knew. I guess not. Han jerked a thumb back along the crawl space. Go on, get moving. The trek back down the crawl space was just as long, hot, and dirty as the inward trip had been. Finally, they reached the access point. Too bad tree was too big to fit in the tunnel, Luke commented, grunting as he pushed up the access cover and maneuvered it off the opening, letting in a rush of cool night air. If he'd come with us instead of Leia. Quiet, Han interrupted, pushing up beside him and listening hard. Somewhere in the near distance he could hear the whine of an approaching landspeeder. Out of the way, out of the way. What is it? Luke asked, pressing himself against the side of the tunnel to let Han pass. Security patrol, Han said, easing his head up out of the opening. The narrow alleyway they were in was about 200 meters long squeezed in between two windowless walls and lit by half a dozen pole-mounted globe panels spaced along the sides of the buildings. The distant whine was getting louder, which meant the security patrol was getting closer. The crucial question was, was it heading toward the building Leia and the others should be leaving right about now? Or was it headed away from them? There was no way to know. But this was no time for taking chances. Give me your lightsaber, he said, pulling himself out through the opening. What? Luke said. But! Give it to me and then get out of there, Han snapped. We need to make a distraction. Reluctantly, Luke unclipped the lightsaber and held it up. Han snatched it out of his hand and ran to the nearest of the light poles, peering at the lightsaber's grip. If he remembered right, the activation switch was right there. With its usual snap hiss, the blue-white blade appeared. 
gripping the weapon with both hands, making sure to keep the blade pointed away from him, Han brake to a halt by the pole. If this was a standard design, the power conduit should run right up through the center. Setting the tip of the blade against the housing, he gave it a firm push. And with a small flash of yellow white, the glow panel above him went dark. What are you doing? Luke gasped. Getting their attention, Han told him, glancing back over his shoulder. The land speeder still wasn't visible, but it was getting louder. Come on, he added, heading away from the sound at a quick jog. First close that down and give it back to me, Luke said, running beside him at a cautious distance. You're going to get one of us killed. I got it under control, Han assured him. No, Luke said firmly, starting to reach out a hand and then apparently thinking better of it. Come on. Han rolled his eyes and shut off the weapon. Fine, you do the next one. Okay, Luke said taking the lightsaber and sprinting toward the next light post. He had reached it and had just ignited the weapon when the security land speeder swung into view at the other end of the alleyway. Han! Luke bit out. Yeah, I see them. Han growled, snatching out his blaster. Get that light out. His answer was another brief sizzle as the glow panel overhead went dark. The land speeder had meanwhile turned into the alleyway and in the glow of the remaining light panels Han could see there were four men in the vehicle. Lifting his blaster, he carefully lined up the muzzle on the land speeder's front left edge and fired. With a gratifying crackle of metal and plasteel, the land speeder dropped onto its side. There was a brief ear-splitting screech as the vehicle's edge scraped against the permacrete and then all four passengers were dumped out as a land speeder made a hard left and slammed nose first into the building on that side. Go! Han ordered Luke, turning and sprinting toward the other end of the alleyway. If they could get out before the men back there pulled themselves together and called it in, they should be able to get back to Leia and the air speeder before reinforcements arrived. They made it halfway to the far end of the alleyway when another land speeder blew into sight directly ahead of them. It wobbled slightly and then braked to a halt across the opening, blocking their escape. Han? Luke called. Yeah, yeah, Han said, skidding to a halt and wondering what they were going to do this time. Hitting the forward power coupler like he had with the other land speeder wouldn't do any good now that the thing was already stopped and its occupants were climbing out. There was no cover anywhere nearby, and no way out. Unless Luke could cut a new door for them with his lightsaber. Luke! No, behind us. Luke cut in. Han twisted around. Their airspeeder had appeared behind them, burning through the alley with its stabilizer wingtips running bare centimeters from the walls. Hanging half out one of the side doors, his hairy arms stretched down toward them, was Chewie. Get ready, kid, Han said. Spinning back around toward the security men forming up behind their land speeder, he fired off a few shots to keep them occupied and then stuck his left arm straight up into the air. This was probably going to hurt. An instant later Chewie's hand closed around his forearm and yanked him straight up off the permacrete. There was a muffled yelp from Luke as he was similarly grabbed. Clenching his teeth, squinting his eyes against the sudden windstorm in his face, Han fired off a couple more wild shots at the security guards. The airspeeder swung over the guards and the landspeeder, and Han felt himself swing to the side as the pilot made a sharp left around the side of the building. Fumbling his blaster back into its holster, he squeezed his eyes shut wondering if Leia was going to make them ride like this all the way back to the rendezvous point. Then, abruptly, his body swung forward as the pilot slowed, his stomach lurching as they dropped back to the ground. His feet touched permacrete. Get in! Leia snapped as Chewie let go of his arm. Ten seconds later they were back in the air, now with Luke and Han safely inside.
What in space was that all about? Leia demanded as Han rubbed his shoulder. I heard a security patrol, Han told her. I thought it'd be a good idea if they didn't know about the evening's company. So naturally you start waving blasters around. She transferred her glare to Luke. And lightsabers. You're missing the point, sweetheart, Han said calmly. Okay, so they know we were in the alley. But thanks to us, they don't know which building you were in. Leia opened her mouth, closed it again as she apparently got where he was going. Knowing which of the complex's buildings the intruders had invaded would considerably narrow security's search for what they'd been up to. There are still only four buildings whose alarms you could shut off from that alleyway, she said stubbornly. And they don't know which of the four it was, Han repeated patiently. And they didn't get to see which door you came out of either. Leia's face darkened. She'd lost this one, and she knew it. If security had spotted the team leaving, it would have not only told them which building to focus on, but also given them a clue as to which part of the building they'd been in. This way, they would have to search everything. That's okay, you don't have to thank me, Han said into the stiff silence. Luke and I are part of the team. He looked at Luke, but the kid was keeping exceptionally still and quiet. For that matter, so were all the others. He looked back at Leia, to find that she turned away from him and was staring out the side window, and was also being still and quiet. The trip back to the rendezvous point was a lot longer than the inward trip had been. At least General Carlos Rican was happy. Not that Han would have cared much if he hadn't been. Excellent work, princess the general said, nodding to her and sweeping his eyes approvingly around the rest of the group gathered at the table. Well done, all of you. With Vader breathing down our necks, we desperately need to carve ourselves a little breathing space. Hopefully, one of the planets on this list will fit the bill. He picked up the handful of data cards, fingering them as if they were some kind of anti-Vader Jedi magic. That's all for now he said. Your individual commanders will have your next assignments. Princess Leia Skywalker, I'd like you to stay behind a moment. The rest of you dismissed. There was a general scraping of chairs and feet as the team left the table and headed for the door. All, of course, except Leia and Luke. And Han. Leia seemed to be the first one besides Rican to notice that Han was making no move to leave. She gave him a puzzled look, then a frown, and finally a glare. It was on the glare that Luke also noticed Han's lack of movement, though all he did was look puzzled. Chewie gave him one of those what-are-you-doing-now sort of looks, but left without saying anything. Rican, predictably, didn't react at all. He waited until everyone else had left before speaking. Is there a problem, Solo? He asked calmly. I'm here for the extra meeting, Han told him, just as calmly. I thought I was part of the team. Rikin nodded. And you are. So let's get on with it, Han said, folding his arms across his chest. For a moment Rikin eyed him in silence. Then, gesturing Han toward a door at one side of the conference room, he stood up. Will you two excuse me a moment? He said. Solo and I need a word in private. Han had been on the receiving end of enough reprimands during his time in the fleet to know that this one was likely to be a Class A windstorm. But to his surprise, Rikin merely let the door slide shut behind them and raised his eyebrows. All right, he said. Let's hear it. A straight-up question, Han decided, deserved a straight-up answer. I wasn't told what the real mission tonight was, he said. I did not understand. I was deliberately not told. Would knowing we were looking for a new base have made a difference in how you handled your part of the job? 
My part, probably not, Han conceded. But it could have made a big difference in Leia's. I know something about mining operations, and there are a few tips I could have given her. Such as? Such as to stay clear of anything that smells of hut, Han said. And I don't just mean places with hut in the name. There are at least 15 different covers and shells they like to use. That's good to know, Rican said, nodding. Maybe you can help the analysts sift through the data once it's been compiled. That's not the point, Han growled. If I'm going to be part of this rebellion thing, I need to be kept up to speed with what's going on. You think that, do you? Rican asked. We just agreed I'm part of the group, Han countered. What do I have to do? Become an officer? Rikin looked him straight in the eye. Basically, yes. Han stared at him. The question had been one-third rhetorical and two-thirds sarcastic. Rikin's response had been neither. You're kidding. Not at all, Rikin said. You were in the fleet, you know how this works. The upper ranks get the data and the authority to make decisions. The lower ranks get just enough of both to do their assigned tasks. Fine, Han growled. So how do I get the big rank bars? You know how that part works too, Rikin said. To be a leader you have to lead, Han snorted. Now you're flying in circles. Not really, Rikin said. Lower ranks get limited data and authority, like I said. But they also have limited responsibility. Leaders don't have the luxury of passing the blame elsewhere. I've led teams before, Han reminded him. That Shalkinwa thing for one. Luke and Chewie and me did pretty good on that one. And you've done well on teams with Princess Leia too, Rikin agreed. But all those people are friends, or at least associates. People you know and trust. They're not a group of soldiers or pilots whose strengths and weaknesses you don't know and can't compensate for. Soldiers you have to order into a battle, knowing full well that some of them, maybe even most of them, are going to die. Han felt his stomach tighten. Yeah. That's the hard part, isn't it? It's the worst part of all, Rikin agreed quietly. There's an old saying, I don't know where it comes from. Jedi, probably. It goes like this, the choices of one shape the futures of all. Ever heard that before? Everyone's got a version of that one, Han said. Doesn't mean a lot. My point is that true leaders are fully and constantly aware of that fact, Rikin said. They understand the possible consequences of their decisions and are willing to bear that weight. He cocked an eyebrow. The question is whether that's a step you're willing to take. So you're saying you want me to be an officer and a leader? Han asked. To his mild surprise, Rikin not only didn't take offense but even chuckled. Point taken, he conceded. I've known a few officers who weren't leaders and some leaders who weren't officers. For no particular reason Han's mind flashed to those five rogue stormtroopers who'd helped him and Luke get Leia off Shalkinwa. The head of that group, Laron, had definitely been one of those rankless leaders. So what now? He asked. Rikin shrugged. You go off and think about it, he said. Because I want you to be very sure you're ready before you make the commitment. Han nodded. Fair enough. Good, Rikin said. In the meantime, it occurs to me that there may be a part you can play in the mission I was going to discuss with Princess Leia and Skywalker. You're welcome to sit in and make comments and suggestions. He gestured. Shall we go? 
Luke and Leia were still sitting quietly when Han and Rikin returned to the main conference room. A third person had also joined the group, a grim-faced man probably twenty years older than Rikin, with the broad shoulders and chest of a former rink fighter and what looked like a permanent downturn to the corners of his mouth. Who had, maybe not coincidentally, taken the chair Han had been sitting in earlier. Ah, Master Axlon. Rikin greeted the newcomer with a polite nod. Thank you for joining us. My apologies on my tardiness, Axlon said, nodding in turn. My meeting with Mon Mothma ran longer than anticipated. That's all right, Rikin assured him. May I present Master Skywalker and Captain Solo? Princess Leia you already know, of course. This is Vestin Axlon former governor of Logara district on Alderan. Han grimaced. An Alderanian. No wonder the man had a permanent sour on. Pleased to meet you, governor, he said. It's Master Axlon now, Captain Solo, Axlon corrected darkly, his mouth turning down a little more. Alderan. You did hear about Alderan, didn't you? Yeah, I heard about it. Han said, annoyed despite himself. Matter of fact, I was the first one on the scene after Tarkin hit the place. Leia stirred in her seat. Han, she murmured warningly. That's all right, your highness, Axlon said, a ghost of a smile briefly turning his mouth upward again. Yes, I remember now where I heard your name, Captain. My apologies. We owe you a great debt. Don't worry about it, Han said. At least someone appreciated him. If you'll take a seat, Solo? Rikin said, gesturing to the chair beside Axlon. Sure, Han said, pulling out the chair beside Leia and taking that one instead. What's going on? Actually, we're not sure, Rikin said, resuming his seat at the head of the table. It's either a great opportunity or an extremely obvious trap. Master Axlon? Axlon cleared his throat. A few days ago I received a communique from Governor Bider Faraus of Kandora's sector, he said. I'm sure a seasoned traveler like Captain Solo knows all about Kandora's, but for the rest of you it's an outer rim region that edges into wild space and sort of trails off into the unknown regions. Under the Republic it was considered something of a bulwark against potential threats from both those areas. Under the Empire, he made a face. It's apparently considered expendable. Since Governor Farrow's communique arrived we've been working our usual information sources, trying to learn everything we can about the situation out there, Rikin said, touching a key on his control board. The table's holo display lit up, showing a portion of the outer rim and a small, ragged-edged sector bordering on the blank area of unknown space. As Master Axlon indicated, Kandoras is far from the mainstream of imperial life and commerce, with a sector fleet consisting of four antiquated dreadnoughts and some smaller ships, and limited resources of all sorts. Unfortunately, they also seem to have an alien warlord named Nuso Esva edging his way along their border, Axlon said grimly. According to our sources, Nuso Esva has already conquered a number of systems in the unknown regions and is thinking about adding some imperial territory to his collection. Kandoras, apparently, is number one on his list. So what does this have to do with us? Han asked. What it has to do with us, Captain, Axlon said heavily, is that Governor Faraus is offering a very intriguing deal, a full-fledged base for the Alliance, complete with logistical support, docking facilities, and one of the finest natural supply depots in the galaxy. Wait a minute, Luke interrupted, his eyes wide. He's offering us a base? Not just an anchorage or hiding place, but an actual base. That's what he says, Rikin said. He manipulated the controls, and the hollow zoomed in on a single star and then on a double planet circling that star. 
This is the Poln system, Kandoras' capital. Poln Major, the larger world, is the actual seat of government. The smaller world, Poln Minor, used to be a center of mining and manufacturing, and while its significance has decreased over the years it still has a fair role in both areas. That's where he proposes we establish our base. I've already confirmed that the system has enough ship traffic to disguise our own movements. Pole Miner also has a network of deep caverns and abandoned mining hubs, Axelon said. Some of them are being used as storehouses, but others are empty and would be ideal for caching our own equipment, he gestured. That's what I meant by a natural supply depot. A few of the caverns are just under the surface, but others are deep enough to be completely hidden from any external scan. Sounds ideal, Leia said. What does Governor Farrows want for all this generosity? According to the communique, nothing, Axelon said. He assures us we'll be safe, protected by his sector fleet, and more than welcome. He also hints that he's planning to secede from the Empire in the near future and throw his official support to the Alliance. Hans snorted. Like we haven't heard that one before. Granted, Axelon conceded. And no one's saying that we necessarily believe him. The point is that we've been offered a base where, if nothing else, we'll have plenty of warning before a major attack. The question is, a major attack by whom? Leia asked. I assume it's obvious to everyone that Farrows is angling to have Alliance firepower on hand to bolster his defenses if this Nusso Esva character tries to move against him. Or like you said, it could be a straight-out trap, Luke said. The minute we settle in, 50 Star Destroyers show up and we're caught like womp rats. That's certainly a possibility, Axelon agreed. But it may surprise you to hear that I think the odds of that are fairly small. Our sources say Pharaohs petitioned the fleet for more warships about four months ago, and no one even bothered to respond to his request. All indications are that Imperial Center has largely forgotten Kandoras even exists. Besides, if they wanted to lay a trap for us, there are more likely places to do it, Leia commented. Some place with a decent sector fleet, for starters. Getting a strike force to Kandoras would mean shifting and retasking a lot of ships. That would take a lot of time and effort, and be pretty obvious to our spies. So instead we move in and get hit by Nusso Esva, Han said. Not sure I see how that gains us anything. Axlon turned a scowl toward him. Captain. It gains us in two ways, Rikin interrupted. First, if the presence of an alliance force makes Nusso Esva reconsider his invasion plans, that risk goes completely away. Second, if Nusso Esva does attack, our forces may be able to help Pharaohs beat him back. Since when did we start doing the Imperial Fleet's job for them? Han asked. Since the ultimate goal of the rebellion is to free the galaxy, Rekin said with an air of strained patience. It wouldn't be much of a victory if we overthrew one tyrant only to have him replaced by another. Is Nuso Esva that powerful? Luke asked. We have no idea how powerful he is, Axelon said. All we know is that Governor Farrows is clearly concerned. Let's talk about Farrows for a moment, Leia said. What do we know about him? Ten years ago he was considered an up-and-coming young politician, one of the brightest to have come out of Imperial Center over the past decade, Axelon said. He's young, barely into his forties, with a wife and a six-year-old daughter. He's also apparently an excellent administrator. He shrugged. Unfortunately, that's all we know. Which is why someone has to go out to Pole Major and actually meet the man, Rikin said. Mon Mothma and I think a small group could slip in without any difficulty. Wait a second, Han interrupted. You're sending Leia into danger again? Mm -hmm. 
Master Axlan has volunteered for the negotiator's position. Han looked at Axlan, feeling the unpleasant sensation of the deck dropping out from under him. Oh, he said lamely. The original plan was to fly him to Pone Major in one of our transports, Rekin continued. But I'm thinking now that you and the Millennium Falcon would be even better. That's not a bad idea, Axlon said, eyeing Han thoughtfully. With the deterioration of Pone Miner's mining infrastructure over the past few years, a lot of smugglers and other criminal types have taken over significant parts of the planet. You would fit right in. Han grimaced. Didn't the Alliance know any other smugglers they could use for these things? He opened his mouth to point that out. And only then did he spot the look on Rekin's face. A cool, measuring, judging look. Sounds wonderful, Han growled. When do we leave? Rekin turned to Axlon. Master Axlon? After that I'll be ready to go. Fine, Han said, standing up. I'll go find Chewie and see what it'll take to get the Falcon ready. He headed away, slapping Luke's shoulder lightly and passing as he headed for the door. See you, kid. He ignored Leia completely. Not that she probably noticed. The meeting had ended, and Luke was heading down the corridor when he heard a voice from behind call his name. He turned to find Axlon hurrying toward him. A word, if I may? The older man said. Sure, Luke said, frowning. He wasn't very good yet at sensing moods and emotions through the Force, but even with his limited skills Axlon had struck him as an odd mixture of icy calm and burning passion. Is there something you need? As a matter of fact, there is. Axlon said as he trotted to a halt. I want you to go to Pone Major with me. I appreciate the invitation, Luke said. But you heard General Reekin back there. I'm on first wave fighter duty. Which would be a complete waste of your talents, Axlon scoffed. The Alliance has any number of men and women who can fly transport escort. He lifted a finger but it has only one Jedi. I'm hardly a Jedi, Luke said. Not yet. But you're the closest we've got, Axlon persisted. That makes you someone I very much want beside me when I sit down to talk with Governor Faraus. Not for defense, but for psychological insight. If you want insight, you'd do better to take someone like Admiral Akbar, Luke said. Even Leia is better than I am. Both of whom are busy with assignments of their own, Axlon said firmly. Don't worry, I've already talked to General Rekin about this. That's why I stayed behind just now. He said that if you're willing, you can go with me. Luke pursed his lips. Though he would never have said so aloud, He'd been less than enthusiastic about having to stay behind and put together an escort for the First Alliance forces into Pone Major. Especially when Han and Leia had been given much more interesting assignments. Going in with Axlon would definitely be a step up. If the general's game, I guess I am too, he said. Excellent, Axlon said. One more thing. I want you to come into Pone Major independently of Captain Solo and me. A wild card, as it were, in case Pharaoh's offer isn't what it seems. Oh, Luke said, his growing excitement taking an unpleasant power drop. Even with the Falcon's many quirks, he always enjoyed flying aboard her, especially when she was working well and Han was in a correspondingly good mood. And Chewie was good company. So I'll be coming in one of the Alliance's other freighters? No, no, Axlon said. You'd be coming in one of our Z-95 headhunters. A Z-95? Luke echoed, feeling his eyes widen. Isn't that a little obvious? Not at all, 
Axlon assured him. Z-95s are a common enough sight in that part of the galaxy. A couple hours' work to get rid of the Alliance markings, swap out the ID transponder for one with a copy of the safe conduct code that Governor Farrows gave us, load the hyperdrive course, and you'll be all set. I suppose, Luke said, his enthusiasm dropping another few points. Alliance Z-95s had perfectly capable hyperdrives, and even though they weren't equipped with astromech droids, they could comfortably hold the settings for a trip to and from the Poland system. On the other hand, X-Wings weren't exactly designed with long-range travel in mind, and Z-95 cockpits were even more cramped. If you really think that's necessary. It is, Axlon said firmly. So that's settled. Good. I don't know how long Captain Sola will take getting his ship ready, but I don't want you too far behind us. Behind you? Luke said, frowning. We're not even flying in Conva? Axlon shook his head. As I said, Z-95s are common enough, but they're usually with private security firms that only fly escort for liners and other top-end ships, he considered. Besides, it might be best if Captain Solo didn't know you were coming along. The more freedom of movement you have, the better. Luke thought back to Han's reaction in the crawl space when he'd found out that Leia hadn't told him the true nature of their information raid. That might not be a good idea, he warned. Han likes to know what's going on. Captain Solo is a soldier, Axlon said, his tone cooling. He gets to know what's necessary for his part of the mission. No less, no more. Sure, I understand, Luke said. But in Han's case. And we really don't have time to discuss it, Axlon interrupted. I've alerted the mechanics to start removing the markings, but I imagine you'll want to supervise the ID swap-out procedure personally. Good luck and I'll contact you once we're on Poln Major. Without waiting for a response, he gave Luke a brisk nod and walked away. Luke watched him go, wincing. Despite its downsides, this was definitely a more exciting mission than the one he'd originally been given, and he was grateful to Axlon for getting it for him. But Han wasn't going to like being left in the dark twice in two missions. He was likely to not like it very loudly and probably with a blaster close to hand. And it occurred to Luke that Chewie wasn't always good company. But Axlon was right. This was war, and they all had to do what they were told. Han would get over it. He hoped. The man was fat, red-faced, and sweating profusely. The kind of sweating that could only come of having the muzzle of a small holdout blaster a meter from one's face. Mara Jade had often seen men in that kind of sweat. Far too often. Judgment has been passed, Judge Lamos Chador, she said formally. Have you any final words to say in your defense? Only that your so-called judgment is insane, Chador ground out. Because of a single dubious decision, one decision, after twenty years in the judicator's seat, you condemn me to death? Mara sighed. The sweating was common. The passionate and self-serving rationalizations were universal. You haven't been listening, she said. A single decision may have brought you to my attention, but it's hardly the reason for your sentence. Then what have I done wrong? Chater asked, his voice half demanding, half pleading. I've worked hard to dispense the Empire's justice to the best of my ability, in deeply trying circumstances that were not of my making. How can you hold an occasional lapse of judgment against me? He was stalling for time, Mara knew. But she was willing to oblige. Even when the evidence was clear and her mind was made up, she never entered into these things lightly. We're not talking lapses of judgment, she said. 
We're talking five years of systematic extortion, theft, and influence selling. You've made a second career of levying extra fines and declaring overline surcharges, then shunting the extra money to your friends and supporters. They were people in need, Chator insisted. Is it wrong for a judge to have friends among such people? It is when the so-called friendships are based solely on the exchange of money and favors, Mara said, a flicker of sensation stirring at the back of her mind. Two men were coming through the empty courtroom back there, making their stealthy way toward the chamber door behind her. That's not friendship. She went on, subtly shifting her weight onto her left leg. That's criminal collusion. But I've done nothing illegal, Chador persisted. You can look at the records, speak to the people involved. And right in the middle of his sentence, the door behind Mara slammed open and a pair of blaster bolts exploded toward her back. The shots never reached their intended target. Mara had already dropped her blaster, letting it fall with a clatter onto the judge's desk, and spun around, yanking out her lightsaber. The magenta blade snap hissed into existence in front of her, deflecting those first two bolts into the walls. Unfortunately for the gunmen, they continued firing. Mara sent their next bolts, one each, straight back into their own chests. She waited until both men had crumbled lifelessly to the floor, just to be sure. Then she spun back around, tucking her elbows and twisting her lightsaber with her. Just in time to halt Chador's desperate lunge across his desk as he tried to reach her dropped blaster. For a long moment, she held the pose, the tip of her lightsaber blade almost touching Chador's throat, his own hand frozen bare centimeters from her blaster his face white and contorted with fear and impotent rage. For the record, Mara said at last, keeping her voice steady, the innocent never tried to shoot an imperial agent in the back. You can't win, Chador bit out, his voice hoarse. You can kill me, you can kill a hundred like me, but your precious empire is still doomed. If the rebels don't bring it down, it'll collapse from its own internal rot. His eyes bored into hers. And then where will you be, my arrogant young imperial agent? Your power will be gone, your protectors dead or imprisoned. You already don't have any friends. He turned over his outstretched hand so it was palm upward. But I can help you. I can be your friend. Spare my life, leave me in my position here and I can create a refuge where you'll be safe when it all falls apart around you. With a flick of her wrists, Mara passed the lightsaber blade through his neck, silencing his voice forever. For a moment she remained standing there, gazing at the body slumped over the desk where so many quiet deals had been made to defraud the Empire of its rightful assets and the Empire's citizens of their lives and liberty. In the name of the Emperor, she said softly, Shutting down her lightsaber, she retrieved her blaster and slid it back into its forearm sheath. Then, turning her back on yet another bit of freshly cleansed corruption, she left the chamber. She passed fifteen more people on her way out of the courthouse. All of them stared at her, openly or furtively, as she strode past. None of them was foolish enough to try to stop her. Her rented airspeeder was waiting unmolested where she'd left it three blocks away. Her transport, a heavily modified Sinar Lambda-class shuttle that she'd left on an out-of-the-way field 200 kilometers north, was likewise. She was sitting at the computer desk in her quarters, filling out her report, when she heard the familiar voice in her head. My child. She smiled. My lord, she responded to the emperor's silent call. Your mission? Complete, Mara said. Justice has been done. Excellent, the emperor said, and Mara could visualize his thin, satisfied smile. She could also sense that he had a new assignment for her. And now? She asked. Treason, the thought came, and she could feel his dark, 
brooding scowl. An image flashed into her mind, the picture of a surprisingly young imperial governor. One allied with... Rebels? Mara felt her lips twist. Like that ugly little affair with Governor Cord on Shalkinwa three standard months ago. Didn't these high-ranking politicians ever learn? His name? Pharaohs of Kandora's sector, the emperor told her. Data sent. Mara looked over at the comm panel. The computer's download light was glowing a quiet blue. Confirmed, my lord. Then go, the emperor ordered. But I warn you, this will not be easy. Mara had to smile at that one. Of course it wouldn't be easy. Easy tasks could be given to the military, or the heavy-handed thugs of the Imperial Security Bureau, or even Lord Vader and the Executor's massive firepower. The hard jobs, the subtle jobs, those were reserved for the Emperor's hand. I have confidence in my training, she said. Go, then, and dispense my justice. I will, my lord, Mara promised. Yes, the emperor said, and once again Mara could see his smile. We will speak again after. Farewell, my child. With that, the image of his smile faded, his voice went silent, and he was gone. For a moment Mara sat motionless holding on to that last glimpse of his face. On one level, Judge Chador's dying ploy had held a grain of truth. Mara really didn't have any friends. But that was all right. She had her work, and she had the Emperor's approval and respect, and she had the sure knowledge that what she was doing was right. Friendship was a luxury, and something she could do without. The last ray of the Emperor's presence faded away into the darkness of space. Taking a deep breath, Mara turned back to her computer and keyed for the download. She skimmed the data first, catching all the high points. Then she read it more carefully, studying every detail that the Emperor had seen fit to send her. Then, just to make sure, she read it through again. He was right. This wasn't going to be easy. A rumbling in her stomach reminded her that she hadn't eaten since leaving for Judge Chador's court fifteen hours ago. Getting up from the computer, she went into the galley and pulled out a packet of rye beans with white glaze. If Pharaohs was planning to secede from the Empire, she reflected as she put the rye beans into the cooker, he was certainly going about it the right way. His sector fleet, while laughably small, had been dispersed to a number of different systems close to Poln, where it couldn't be taken out with a single blow but at the same time could respond quickly to any threat against the capital. He'd done the exact opposite with his sector's stormtrooper contingents, bringing most of them to Poln Major to bolster the defenses of his communications and the governor's palace itself. Then there was the other half of the double planet, Poln Minor. Large enough to support only a marginal atmosphere, the place was honeycombed with mines, both working in abandoned, storehouses, maintenance centers, and large-scale work posts. If pressed hard enough, and if he could get across the gap separating the two worlds, pharaohs could probably hold out there for years. Certainly other unsavory people had done so. Poland Minor was reputed to be the home of hundreds of smugglers and other criminal types that years of sporadic imperial efforts had failed to dislodge. Pharaohs might even have been in communication with some of those groups, opening up the possibility that he might bring them onto his side in a fight, or at least hide behind them should things go sour. Poland Minor was also the key to any deal he might be making with the Rebel Alliance. A small army could hide within all those abandoned mines, along with a good-sized task force of small ships, ready to throw against whatever force the Emperor sent in response to Pharaoh's bid for independence. Between the rebels and his own sector fleet, Pharaoh's might be willing to gamble that he would be more trouble than he was worth, especially that far out on the Empire's periphery. And finally, just to make things interesting, Poln Major had over the years also become home to dozens of different non-human species, 
many of them unknown groups who had apparently drifted in from wild space and the unknown regions and settled in and around the capital. The ISB section of Mara's report warned that some of those aliens might be mercenaries brought in by the governor. Even if that proved to be untrue, the mere presence of unknown aliens with unknown abilities and temperaments always added an extra layer of risk to a ground operation. Pharaohs was smart enough to know that and exploit it. At least Mara now understood why the emperor had chosen her for this mission. Someone had to slip into Poem Major, get to Pharaohs, and dispatch him before any of the defenses and responses could be triggered and launched. Pharaoh's probable successor, General Kofi Larno, was about as unimaginative a military commander as could be imagined, but the ISB profiled him as stolidly loyal and certainly capable of taking back the capital and evicting whatever rebels Pharaoh's might have already brought in. The cooker signaled, and Mara pulled out the tray and took it back to her desk. Setting it down beside the computer, she pulled up the map section of the report. The first step, obviously, was to get to the Poland system. Her current ship was a capable enough transport, but arriving on Pole Major in an Imperial shuttle wouldn't be a very smart thing to do. Her very first step, therefore, would be to get herself a more inconspicuous ship. Once she was on the ground, the next step would be to get into the governor's palace. Given all the extra stormtroopers Pharaohs had brought in, it might be handy for Mara to bring in a few of her own, for both reconnaissance and possible cover. She felt her lip twist as she gnawed a bite of cream-glazed meat off the ribene bone. She'd worked with other Imperial forces over the years, of course, many times. But that didn't mean she'd ever really liked it. Commandeering temporary allies meant revealing at least part of her identity, even if it was just the fact that she was a vaguely defined Imperial agent. Such revelations automatically added to her vulnerability. Worse, walking into a local garrison or fleet anchorage meant taking whatever they had available, whether good and competent or lazy and useless. Picking out random stormtroopers was an even shakier proposition these days, given Vader's habit of periodically combing through the ranks and transferring all the best and brightest into his personal 501st Legion. On the other hand, there was a group of stormtroopers Mara had worked with before. A group that had proved itself capable, competent, and trustworthy. A group that even had its own shabby-looking transport. The downside was that those particular stormtroopers were military deserters. Taking another bite, Mara key for one of her private consolidation search files. Back on Shelkenwa, after that unpleasantness with Governor Cord, she told Laron and the other four stormtroopers to get off the planet and stay out of sight and out of trouble. The first part of her order they'd obeyed. The rest they hadn't. She ran her eyes down the list of little news tidbits that her search engine had gleaned from the Empire's vast information networks over the past three months. Here, a small-time warlord had disappeared, his control over a terrified countryside ended. There, commerce from a small farming and manufacturing colony suddenly resumed as a pirate nest went up in unexplained flames. Elsewhere, a regional administrator abruptly resigned his post, and the increasingly distressed citizen petitions against him stopped arriving at the sector office. Small injustices, of the sort that too often slipped through the cracks of the overextended government machinery. All of them corrected, usually overnight always accompanied by rumors of a stormtrooper vanguard that had apparently proved that the Empire was finally taking the problem seriously. And somewhere in the vicinity of every one of those incidents, buried unnoticed in the thick stacks of docking listings, had been a Sowentech TL-1800 transport. Always with a different ship's ID, of course. But always the same ship. The self-named Hand of Judgment was alive and well and cutting a private fireline through the galaxy's criminals and petty tyrants. Mara had been following the group's movements since Shalkanwa with decidedly mixed feelings. She'd looked into their story as to how and why they deserted their posts, and as far as she could tell it had more or less checked out, 
though a lot of the key evidence had been buried or destroyed by the ISB's cover-up specialists. She'd thought about bringing in Laron and the others and getting them acquitted at a proper trial so that they could return to the imperial service they'd been trained for and sworn to serve, the service that desperately needed men of their quality. On the other hand, the ISB would be out for vengeance, and with the distractions inherent in Mara's job she knew she couldn't even guarantee a fair trial, let alone an acquittal. And she had to admit that Laron and the others had found a niche for themselves in bringing imperial justice to the galaxy on a more informal basis. The long-term question of what to do with them was still without an answer. The short-term question, though, was much clearer. They were going to pull Major with her. Whether they liked it or not. There was still the matter of finding them, of course. For that, Mara had her computer its predictor capabilities, and her history of Laron's recent movements. More important, she had the force. She finished cleaning the meat off the last of the rye beans and set the tray aside. The last record she had of the Hand of Judgment placed them in the middle of a minor water dispute in Gryron province on the planet Haper. Taking Haper as a center point, she keyed for a summary of nearby citizen petitions, complaints, and back-pocket police and military reports. A few minutes of consolidation on the computer's part, a few more minutes of reading on Mara's, and she had it narrowed to three likely possibilities. Taking a deep breath, she stretched out to the force. She hadn't spent much time with the renegades, but that brief period had been hardened in the fire of combat against mutual enemies. Deep within her, Mara understood these men, had an indescribable yet solid sense of how they thought and acted. And as she gazed at the three possibilities, letting her mind focus in on those missions and the multidimensional images of the five stormtroopers, one of the listings slid inexorably to the foreground. She had them. She took another deep breath, allowing the focus of her mind to open up, letting in the gentle breezes from the transport's air system, the coldness of the control panel beneath her hand the delicate leftover smell of the rye beans. Standing up, she headed to the cockpit and keyed in the startup sequence. The minor world Elegasso, where a local election had been blatantly rigged, was the spot that logic and intuition told her would be Laron's next target. The planet was a good distance away, but her ship had a better-than-average hyperdrive, and she should be able to get there within a day or two. It was unlikely that Laron would be able to arrive, assess the situation, make a plan, and deal with the crooked politicians before then. All she had to do was get to Elegasso, settle in, and wait. Sooner or later, whatever the Hand of Judgment was up to at the moment, they would find their way to her. Derek Laron's last thought just before the hail of blaster bolts blew the last bit of roof off his partial shelter was that this would be a really rotten place to die. Laron! Someone shouted faintly through the static filling the headset of his stormtrooper helmet. Sabrin Marcross, probably, though it was hard to identify voices through the partial calm link jamming the mercenary group out there was using. You all right? I'm still alive. If that's what you mean, Laron shouted back. What in space is the matter with these guys anyway? Don't they know that stormtroopers always win? Some people have to learn things the hard way, Taxtro Grave put in. Can either of you see behind what's left of that fountain? I think that's where their heavy repeater is, but I can't get a clear shot. Ignoring the blaster bolt steadily eating away at the pockmarked wall in front of him, Laron popped his head up for a quick look. Sure enough, he could see the repeater peeking out from behind one of the slabs of broken stone. I can see the muzzle, but that's all, he reported, ducking down again. It's at the south end, between the fountain and that big broken slab. That should put the gunner in my field of fire, Marcross said. Any chance you two can pull some of their blanket off me? Believe me, I'm trying, Laron assured him, wincing as an extra-large chunk of wall blew free and bounced off his armored shoulder. 
The guys over here burn fire like they own a Tabana mine. Same over here, Graves said. This would be a really good time for either Brightwater or Quiller to make a dramatic entrance. You listening, you two? Larone called. Brightwater? Quiller? His only answer was a fresh volley of fire from the mercs. The other two members of their little group must be out of comlink range. Or else they were dead. Larone bared his teeth in a snarl leaning around his shelter to fire off a few more shots. They weren't dead. They couldn't be. They were just taking their time about bringing in backup, that was all. Across to his left came a sudden crunching of masonry, and he heard Marcross grunt as part of his firing position came down on top of him. Larone opened his mouth to call to him, to make sure he was okay. He paused his ears straining against the high-pitched blaster noise. Someone in the distance was screaming. Someone or something. The scream grew louder. And with as dramatic an entrance as Larone could have hoped for, Brightwater and his Aerotech 74Z speeder bike roared into view over the ridge behind them, the bikes under slung blaster cannons spitting death and destruction at the mercenaries. The stream of fire that had been focused on Larone faltered as some of the mercs flinched or else shifted their attention to this new threat. There was the sudden thunderclap of a shattered Tabana gas canister, and the whine of the repeater abruptly went silent. Got him! Marcross called. Overhead, bright water blew past, turning and jinking as he wove his screaming speeder bike in and out of the bursts of enemy fire. Larone leaned out of his shelter again, shifting his Bloss Techie 11 to full auto and raking the Merc's positions. He was still trying to draw their fire away from Brightwater, and Brightwater himself was dangerously close to getting swatted straight out of the sky, when a bellowing roar hammered across the sounds of battle. Larone looked to his left and saw their tricked-out Suintec TL-1800 freighter rise into view above the ruins of the old city its heavy laser cannons blazing across the morning sky as they hammered the enemy positions. Abruptly the static vanished as the cannon fire found the calm link jammer. Quiller, what V you got? Larone called, easing his head up for a better look. All the targets a growing boy could ever want. Joe Quiller returned tautly from the Suintec. Man, they really have a nest back there, don't they? Like you wouldn't believe. Larone agreed tightly. Can you handle them? Of course, Quiller said. They're not exactly geared up for this kind of firepower. We should have gone this route in the first place. Larone grimaced. Except that bringing in the Suintec would have instantly alerted the mercs that this wasn't just a standard stormtrooper unit with standard stormtrooper weapons and equipment. That was a conclusion Larone had very much hoped to avoid drawing for them. Which meant that he and the others now had no choice but to finish the job. Completely. Just make sure it's done, he told Quiller grimly. Make sure it's all done. Either Quiller caught the sudden change in Larone's tone, or he'd already arrived at the same unpleasant conclusion on his own. Understood, he said. Keep your heads down. Fortunately, Larone supposed it was fortunate anyway. This particular band of mercenaries didn't seem interested in survival if survival meant surrender. By the time Larone and the others were finally able to leave their splintered cover points, all fifty mercs were dead. And it was way past time to go. A standard hour later, having hurried through an abbreviated round of thanks from the grateful farmers who now had their land and their lives back. The five stormtroopers were aboard the Suwintec and getting the blazes out of there. Well, that was fun, Quiller commented from the helm as the sky faded around them, turning from blue to dark blue to starlit black. Speak for yourself, Grave grunted as he applied a burn patch to his arm. His fifth, Larone noted, and that was just the ones he could see. That's one more set of armor down the disposal. My third in two months, 
if anyone's counting. That's because you insist on standing still while you line up your shots, Brightwater said. I'm telling you, speeder bikes are the way to go. Yeah, and how's your armor holding up? Grave countered pointedly. It's not parade ground quality anymore, Brightwater conceded. But it's still there. Barely, Graves said. Like everyone else's, Marcross said. Laron, we can't keep going this way. Our armor's being shot off us piece by piece. We're running out of Tabana gas, grenades, and other supplies, and that admittedly impressive scream that was coming from Brightwater's speeder probably means something aboard is about to fail there, too. It's the accelerator pedal linkage, Brightwater said. This'll be my third fix on the thing. And the other speeder bike isn't in any better shape, is it? Marcross asked. Brightwater shrugged. A little. Not much. I might also mention that the stash of credits the ISB was kind enough to leave aboard this ship is likewise starting to run thin. Ditto for the stash of ship IDs, Quiller put in reluctantly. We're burning through those like hut promises. Even if we weren't, all the fancy IDs in the galaxy aren't going to help us if enough people figure out the connection between us and this ship, Marcross added. There aren't that many Suintex still flying around this part of the galaxy. I know, Laurent said, an ache in his heart that had nothing to do with the burns throbbing on his arms and chest. Ever since they'd left their posts aboard the Imperial Star Destroyer reprisal, he still couldn't bring himself to use the word deserted, not even in his own mind. He and the others had been fighting their own private crusade against evil and corruption in this corner of the Empire. The fact that they'd survived as long as they had was due partly to their own combat skills, but also in no small part to their good luck in having grabbed an Imperial Security Bureau covert ship on their way off the reprisal. Thanks to the ISB's extensive weapons upgrades to the Suintech and its hidden caches of equipment and money, they'd been able to take on injustice wherever they'd found it. Mercenaries, swoop gangs, pirate bases, none of them had been able to stop the hand of judgment. But the others were right. The end was rapidly approaching. Once the supplies and money ran dry, they would be finished. They would have no choice but to do as that Imperial Agent Jade had ordered them three months earlier back on Shelkanwa, stay out of sight and out of trouble. And their private war for justice would be over. None of which is to say we're ready to hit the escape pods quite yet, Quiller said into his thoughts. We've still got at least five IDs we haven't used, and we can probably recycle some of the older ones that we haven't used for a while. That won't help with the armor, Marcross pointed out. We've got, what, a couple of fresh sets each, and that's it. Plus we still have the damaged ones, Brightwater said. I don't know about yours, but I can probably cobble another set of scout armor out of the various bits and pieces. We can probably do the same, Laron said. But that's not really the point. The point is that, no matter how carefully we stretch our resources, we can definitely see the end ahead of us. For a long moment, no one spoke. It's been a good run, Grave offered at last. I've got no regrets. Me either, Brightwater seconded. We've helped a lot of hurting people over these past few months. A lot more, I dare say, than we did when we were official stormtroopers. Marcross murmured. Agreed, Quiller said. So what's the plan, Laron? We skip that stolen election thing on El Agasso and start looking for someplace to go to ground? I hate to pass up something that blatant, Grave murmured. It's small enough, and they're mostly just armed politicians. We should be able to show up in armor and frighten them into backing off and calling a new election which they might steal again, Brightwater pointed out. I doubt it, Graves said. 
There's something very persuasive about having a Blastek E-11 stuck in your face while an Imperial Stormtrooper warns you that he'll be watching your political ethics from now on. Which we won't be, Marcross pointed out. But of course they won't know that. Graves right, Laron decided. I think we can handle that one before we retire. What about that pottery thing I told you about? Brightwater asked. Laron scratched his cheek. The pottery thing was a report one of the farmers back there had heard about from his cousin on another world. A small group of dirt poor artisans had found a patch of exotic, one of a kind clay, and had finally started making a successful living by creating striking and marketable sculptures from it. Or they had been until the local government had gotten wind of the operation and decided to take it over for their own profit. Since the bureaucrats didn't have a gram of artistic skill themselves, their solution had been to turn the genuine sculptors into slave labor. Laron knew nothing about art, and even less about sculpture. But he knew a lot about greed and oppression, and didn't much like either. Neither did his four comrades. I don't see why we can't do both, he told Brightwater. Pickerin's only a few hours from Elagasso and it's more or less on the way. There's also a decent imperial database on Picarin, Quiller said, peering at his data display. Maybe we can sneak in there after we break the sculptors loose and get some ideas of where we can, you know, bury ourselves away from the universe? Brightwater suggested. Something like that, Laron conceded. Quiller, go ahead and set course for Picarin. If we're going out, we might as well go out with a bang. The landing field they were directed to on Picarin was about as small and isolated a place as Laron had ever seen. Still, it was only a few kilometers from the town where the enslaved artisans were producing their statues under the guns of their oppressors. Quiller landed the Suintec, keyed the systems into lockdown standby and lowered the landing ramp for the customs officials and the usual brief questionnaire and collection of landing fees. Laron was waiting at the top of the ramp, their latest set of forged ship's documents in hand, when the ramp area erupted with a blast of cold, bitter-smelling gas. Cover! Laron snapped with his last breath, grabbing for his blaster as he dived for the ramp control. He was unconscious before he reached it. Lord Odio's previous time away from the Chimera, during his mysterious meeting at the Unknown World, had lasted over five hours. His visit to Runa lasted precisely one. Signal from Lord Odo, Commander, the comm officer announced. The Salban's hope has reached docking position and is being tractored aboard. Lord Odo requests that we set a course for the Poland system in Kandora's sector and that we leave as soon as the freighter is secured aboard. Pelian nodded. Navigation? Running the calculation now, sir, the NAV officer confirmed. It'll take a few minutes. Acknowledged, Pelian said. Turning, he walked back along the command walkway to the aft bridge and keyed the pawn system into the computer console there. He was skimming through the summary when the turbolift door hissed open and Captain Drew San appeared. Report? Lord Odo is on his way back from Runa, sir, Pelian told him. We are to leave for the Kandora sector and the Poland system once he's aboard. Kandoras? Leaning over Pelian's shoulder, Drew San peered at the display. What is there that anyone could find interesting? I don't know, sir. Pelian gestured toward the screen. I was hoping I might find a clue here. So far, though, nothing's jumping out at me. Drew Sand grunted. What about that computer search you've been doing? He asked, lowering his voice. Any luck? Not yet, sir, Pelian said, wincing a little. He thought his search had been more discreet than that but I've only made it through the top three data tiers. There are at least four more to go, plus the obscure single-system ones that are already half-legend. But that doesn't make sense, 
Zhu San insisted. Someone with Lord attached to his name should be right there on the top tier. Yet you say he's not. So where exactly does his title come from? Possibly one of the smaller systems, Pelian said. Some of those are very big on titles and general pageantry. Maybe. Drusen lowered his voice still further. What do you think of him, Commander? Do you think he can be trusted? I hardly think my opinion matters, sir, Pelian said carefully. Someone in authority clearly trusts him. Maybe, Drusen said again. Well, I suppose we'll just have to see how matters unfold. Are the watch reports finished? Yes, sir, I believe so. Good. Drusen turned and stalked through the archway into the main bridge. Pelian was still trying to find something interesting in the pwn system when the turbolift door once again opened and the masked, robed figure of Lord Odo swept onto the bridge. Commander Pelian, he said, greeting Pelian briefly as he turned to look down the command walkway at the stars still filling the viewport. I gave orders to leave as soon as the Saliban's hope was aboard. The delay was my decision, my lord, Drusen said, reappearing through the archway. I wanted to make sure your errand had been successful before we left the region. It was, Odo assured him coolly. The equipment you required has been brought aboard? Drew Sam persisted. It has, Odo said. You will speak to the helm now. Drew Sam seemed to draw himself up. Helm? He called. Engage new course setting. Activate hyperdrive. Acknowledged. The faint call came back. Across the bridge, the stars exploded into starlines, and the chimera was on its way. Thank you. Deliberately, Odo walked over to the captain, stopping bare centimeters away from him. The next time I give an order, captain, he said, his voice low but curiously carrying. I expect it to be carried out. Drozen's lip twitched, but to his credit he stayed where he was instead of backing up. Understood, my lord, he said. For a long moment, Odo held his pose. Then he turned his mask to Pelian. I believe your watch is over, Commander Pelian, he said. You may go about your other activities. Pelian looked at Drew San. Technically, only the captain had the authority to dismiss the senior bridge officer from his watch. But Drew Sen had apparently had enough confrontation for one day. His head bobbed once and then jerked microscopically toward the turbo lift. Yes, my lord, Pelian said. Stepping a bit gingerly past the robed figure, he headed to the turbo lift and escaped. He was nearly to his quarters when his comm link signaled. Commander, this is Lieutenant Tibble, duty security officer. The caller identified himself. As per your standing order, I wish to inform you that Lord Odo's pilot has left his quarters and is currently in the bay officer's mess. Thank you, Pelian said, and keyed off. Returning the comm link to its holder, he reset the turbolift's destination. Odo had told him to go about his other activities. He never said those activities couldn't include a meal. The Chimera's various mess rooms always did a brisk business in the first hour after a watch change, but Soro's civilian outfit made him stand out of the crowd. He was sitting alone at a two-person table against the rear bulkhead. Working his way through the crowd, Pelian reached his side. Good day, Master Soro, he said. May I join you? Soro looked up from his tray, and it seemed to Pelian that the lines around his eyes hardened a bit. Commander Pelian, isn't it? He asked, his voice neutral. Yes, Pelian confirmed. May I join you? Soro's eyes flicked to Pelian's empty hands, then back up to his face. If you're looking for information about our mission, you'll have to ask Lord Odo. I'm just the pilot and I'm just the third bridge officer, 
Pelian reminded him. Mission coordination is Captain Druzen's job, not mine. I simply wanted to talk to you for a few moments. Soro shook his head. Sorry. I'm not really in the mood for company. He returned his attention to his food. Pelian stayed where he was, and after a few more bites Soro looked up again. Didn't you hear me? He growled. Go away. My ship, Master Sorrow, not yours, Pelian reminded him. What are you afraid of? I didn't say I was afraid, Soro countered. I said I wasn't interested in company. Then you picked the wrong job, Pelian said. Bringing an Imperial Lord aboard an Imperial Star Destroyer guarantees you lots of company. For another handful of seconds Soro glared up at him. Pelian returned the gaze, not moving or speaking. With a sigh, Soro lowered his eyes. It said that patience is a virtue, Commander, he said, waving at the chair across from him. So is persistence. What did you want to talk about? Nothing mysterious or ominous, I assure you, Pelian said as he sat down. I mostly wanted to inquire as to whether you and Lord Odo were being treated properly. Your quarters, for instance, are they satisfactory? Lord Odo hasn't complained, Soro said. They're certainly no better or worse than one would expect to find aboard a warship. Hardly what you and his lordship are used to, though, I assume? Pelian suggested. Sora looked down at his tray. I've seen worse, he said. I can't speak for his lordship. Ah, Pelian said. My mistake. I was under the impression that you were Lord Odo's permanent pilot. Soro shook his head. Nothing about my life is permanent anymore, he said in a low voice. Nothing permanent. Nothing stable. He opened his right hand and gazed into the palm as if there was some clue or memory there that only he could see. Nothing pleasant. I'm sorry, Pelian said. So then Lord Odo merely brought you in for this particular job? Soro's lip twisted. You could say that. He gazed into his hand for another second, then closed it into a tired-looking fist. Have you ever lost everything, Commander Pelian? No, stupid question. Of course you've never lost everything. Not everything, no, Pelian said. But I've had my share of losses. What promotions? Soro scoffed. The last dessert cube in the mess line? Battles, Pelian said evenly. Subordinates. Comrades. Friends. Sorrow's throat tightened. Yes, I suppose you have, he said, gesturing to Pelian's uniform. But at least you have your priorities straight. He opened his hand and again gazed into it. Not everyone does. No, they don't, Pelian agreed. But it's never too late for a man to recognize his shortcomings and change them. Soro shook his head. I wish that was true. But it isn't. Not always. Yes, it is, Pelian said firmly. Where there's life, there's the hope of change. Soro snorted. Please! Neat, cliched phrases never solved anything. Not if they remain nothing but neat, cliched phrases, Pelian said. They have to spark regret, resolve, and action. Abruptly the mess room chatter around them vanished into a taut silence. Frowning, Pelian looked up. Lord Odo was standing just inside the doorway, his masked face pointed at Pelian and Soro. My lord, Soro said hastily, starting to get to his feet. Odo made a small gesture, and Sorrow broke off the movement, sinking down again into his seat. May I help you, Lord Odo? Pelian asked, standing up. 
My quarters are being changed, Commander Pelian, Odo said. If he was annoyed to find one of the Chimera's officers having a private conversation with his pilot, it wasn't audible in his voice. I wish Soros assistance. Of course, my lord, Soros said, again starting to get up. But since he's in the middle of a meal, Odo continued smoothly, Perhaps you would assist me, Commander. Pelian hesitated. Moving trunks and equipment was hardly something a senior officer should be doing. Odo surely knew that. On the other hand, this might be Pelian's best chance of getting a look at the things Odo had brought aboard the Chimera. Not to mention the chance to speak privately with Odo himself. I would be honored, my lord, he said, stepping away from the table. Excellent, Odo said. His mask turned slightly. When you're finished, Soro, make your way to the bridge. They'll direct you to our new quarters. Pelian waited until he and Odo were walking along the corridor before speaking again. May I ask what the problem is with your quarters? There's no problem. Bodo assured him. Now that we're en route to our final destination and will have no need for quick access to the Saliban's hope, I wish to be closer to the bridge. Captain Drewsen has therefore assigned us new quarters there. Pelian felt his stomach tighten. The only quarters available near the bridge were for visiting dignitaries, sector governors, grand moths, or special imperial agents like Darth Vader. I'm sure you'll find them more convenient, he murmured. Indeed, Odo said. What do you think of him? Who? My pilot, of course, Odo said. You were interrogating him, weren't you? Not at all. Pelian said hastily. Ironically enough, I'd been asking him if your quarters were satisfactory. Indeed, Odo said. You may also have noticed Soro's deep unhappiness. It was a bit hard to miss, Pelian conceded. What exactly happened to him? He didn't tell you. Just vague hints, Pelian said. He asked if I'd ever lost everything. What exactly did he lose? As he said everything, for a few steps Odo was silent. Tell me, Commander. Have you ever heard the saying the choices of one shape the futures of all? Yes, I believe so, Pelian said. Jedi, isn't it? The Jedi may have stolen it, Odo said. But it was originally from the Song of Saliban. The point is that each person's decisions affect everyone around him. Friends, family, business associates, even total strangers. You ask what happened to Sorrow? That's what happened. He made bad decisions, many of them. In the process, he lost everything he held of value. I'm sorry, Pelian murmured. What will he do now? That's entirely up to him. Odo said. I rather hope he decides to fight to get it back. He motioned toward his cabin's door. In here. Odo's original rooms were a set of junior officers' quarters, with two beds, a refresher station, and a few small pieces of furniture. The five travel cases the Chimera's crewers had brought across from the Saliban's Hope were already clustered together on a floating repulsor cart in the center of the room and in the middle of the group of bags were two new items, a pair of meter-long cylinders about 15 centimeters across with long shoulder straps attached. The specialized equipment, apparently, that Odo had brought back from Runa. Stepping to the cart, Odo retrieved the cylinders from among the other bags. You will guide the cart, Commander, he said, gesturing to the cart's control panel. As you wish, my lord. Pelian said as he keyed the cart off standby. You can put those back if you wish, he added, nodding to the cylinders. 
The cart can handle the entire load. I know that, Odo said, looping one strap around each of his shoulders. Follow me. The rest of the trip to the command section was made in silence. Most of the junior officers they passed seemed a bit startled at the sight of a senior bridge officer driving a cart, but none of them said anything. The crewers, in contrast, studiously ignored the odd procession as being none of their business. One lone petty officer was brave enough or conscientious enough to offer his assistance, and though Odo turned him down, Pelian made sure to memorize the man's face and duty sector. The next promotions list would be opening soon for officer recommendations. As Pelian had anticipated, Odo led them to the visiting dignitary suite two corridors aft of the bridge. What Pelian hadn't expected was that Captain Drewsen would be waiting there for them. Lord Odo, the captain said, his eyes flashing oddly at Pelian as he bowed to Odo. Thank you for your willingness to move your quarters. I'm sure you'll find these more than satisfactory. I'm certain I will, Captain, Odo said, looking around the room, his eyes lingering for a moment on the display and repeater board, which the occupant could use to monitor nearly all of the Chimera's systems. Commander Pelian was kind enough to assist with the move. So I see, Drusen said, giving Pelian that same odd look. I would have been happy to assign you a crew instead. I was more than happy to offer my assistance, Pelian said. Yes, Drusan murmured, his gaze dropping from Pelian's face to the cluster of bags on the cart. But I'm sure we can handle things from here. Dismissed. Yes, sir. Pelian inclined his head to Odo. Lord Odo. A minute later he was on the turbolift heading back toward officer's country. Now would normally be the time for a meal, some reading, and then sleep. But today the meal and sleep could wait. Suddenly his brain was churning with possibilities. He still didn't know who or what Lord Odo was. But finally he had a fresh idea of where to look. Here we go, Han muttered, and pushed back the hyperdrive levers. In front of him, the mottled hyperspace sky flashed with starlines and then the stars of the Poland system. For a minute he let the Falcon coast, heading generally inward as he studied the twin planets ahead. Even without their size difference it would have been easy to tell the two worlds apart. Poland Major was all shades of blue and green and white, with scattered clumps of glittering lights on the night side. Poland Minor was mostly browns and grays, with a bare handful of lights. Probably the entrances to the various spaceports, he decided, or else the markers of underground storage and maintenance facilities. And if Rikin was right, the holes where a whole lot of smugglers, pirates, and other fringe types were hiding. Beside him, Chewie rumbled. Yeah, I see it, Han said sourly eyeing the flashing lights of the Golani Space Defense Station in high orbit over Poland Major. Rikin had assured him that the Golan was mostly an empty shell these days, running with maybe 30% of its normal crew and rated firepower. But even 30% of a Golan still left it as a serious obstacle for any Alliance forces trying to move in. On the other hand, if it could be taken intact, that same firepower would then be on the Alliance's side. He made a mental note to suggest that Axlon make the station one of his demands to Governor Fairhouse. There was the sound of footsteps behind him. Are we there? Axlon asked. Yeah, Han confirmed, setting his teeth firmly together. Four days of riding together in a cramped light freighter, four days of the man finding a way to get on every single one of Han's nerves had left him with a powerful urge to open the hatch to clean air again. Or maybe just to find a convenient piece of vacuum and toss his passenger out into it. Axlon was polite, but in a subtly superior way that even her worshipfulness Princess Leia couldn't match. He asked obvious and irritating questions and continually gave the impression that Han should be happier about answering them. He was an avid but unskilled sabak player 
and every time he lost it was clear he thought Han had cheated. Even when he hadn't. But worse, even than all the surface irritants was what was simmering behind the man's eyes. There was a swirl of anger, tenacity, and nervousness back there, in a fluid and ever-changing combination that set Han's teeth on edge. He'd seen that kind of personality before, and it usually got the offender and his pals chased out of a cantina or off a world at a high rate of speed. Or it got them all killed. Chewie had noticed it, too, even though the big Wookiee was too polite to mention it. Still, when something bothered Chewie, Han had long ago learned it was worth keeping an eye on. Chewie rumbled again. What? Han asked, snapping out of his reverie. Chewie repeated the comment, this time pointing to the aft sensor readout. Han frowned. The Wookiee was right. There was a Z-95 back there, about half a minute behind the Falcon and 20 degrees to starboard. There were still plenty of Z-95s running around the galaxy, especially out here at the edges where security services couldn't afford newer fighters, or didn't want to put the more expensive hardware at risk. And the ship was definitely not showing Alliance markings. But it was coming in on more or less the same vector as the Falcon, though that 20-degree spread meant the pilot was trying not to look like he was coming in on that vector. And something about the way the pilot was handling the fighter strongly reminded Han of Luke. Han felt his eyes narrow. Rikin had told him that Luke was going to be handling some of the follow-up fighter stuff. But Rikin didn't exactly have a spotless record as far as lying through his teeth was concerned. And now that Han thought about it, he remembered that when he and Axlan had said goodbye to Luke, the kid had been pretty vague about what he was going to be doing for the next few weeks. Chewie rumbled. Yeah, yeah, I see him, Han said. See vous? Axlan asked, a little too quickly. Chewie was just wondering about the Golan out there, Han said, casually easing the falcon to the right. If that really was Luke out there, he wouldn't want Han getting close enough to get a clear look through the canopy. Sure enough, Han had barely begun to close the gap when the Z-95 started a drift of its own, heading the same direction and at the same speed as the Falcon. Muttering under his breath, Han drifted the Falcon back onto her original vector. This time the Z-95 didn't try to match the maneuver, but simply continued easing to starboard as if that had been the pilot's plan all along. Even Luke wasn't inexperienced enough at this sort of thing to look like he was trying to play follow my wist with the Falcon. Especially when he was obviously trying to keep his presence here a secret. Him, Rikin, and everyone else. Including Axlon? So it's just the three of us, huh? Han commented. Three against a whole Imperial garrison? Oh, please, Axlon scoffed. It's hardly going to come to that. Don't you get it? Governor Pharaohs wants us here. He's not going to do anything to jeopardize this deal. Yeah, Han muttered. Right. The thing that's so funny about this. The cheerful-voiced man commented into the darkness that surrounded Laron. Is how easily you were caught. Laron didn't answer. He hadn't been answering, in fact, for the past three standard hours or so, the full length of time he and the others had been sitting here with binders on their wrists and blindfolds across their eyes. Partly because he didn't want to dignify the other man's ramblings. Mostly because there really was nothing he could say. And because Cheerful was right. Laron had walked right into the trap, his eyes open, his blaster still in its holster. And now, much sooner than he'd anticipated, the Hand of Judgment's run really was all over. Their attackers had taken all five of them, and as far as Laron could tell, they had done it without firing a single shot. He still didn't know who these men were, whether they were mercenaries, imperials, or just some local criminal gang. But it didn't really matter. Laron and the others would either be killed outright or turned over to the Empire 
which amounted to the same thing. Whatever his motivation, whatever his plan, the man gloating at Laron from across the room had every reason to be cheerful. Still, Laron was becoming increasingly puzzled by the fact that they'd been sitting here all this time with no attempts at questioning or torture other than having to listen to the man talk. Did he simply want them in pristine condition when he turned them over to the Imperial Security Bureau? The thought of that made Laron's skin crawl. Somewhere across the room behind Cheerful's voice, a door opened. There you are, Cheerful said, sounding decidedly less cheerful now. About time. Is this them? A cold voice, male, demanded. Most of them, Cheerful confirmed. I admit they're not much to look at. Take those off, cold voice interrupted. I want them to see me while I explain the realities of life to them. Not sure that's a good idea, Cheerful warned. They may not look it, but I'll bet they'll get real talky once they get to the other end of their one-way ride. You may have things to hide, Doss, cold voice said. I don't. I want to look them in the eye. Fine, Cheerful said with a sigh. You're the boss. Kinker, Shippo, you heard the man. There was a brief patter of footsteps, and a dull light blazed suddenly in Laron's eyes as the blindfold was ripped off his face. For a moment he squinted against the light, and then his eyes adjusted. They were in some kind of office, probably the customs building he'd seen from the Sowentech on their way in. The place was typical of this size landing field, small and somewhat decrepit, with a couple of skin tables, two desks, and walls that were lined with shelving and equipment cabinets. At least half of the shelving Laron could see from his position was bare, and he suspected most of the cabinets were empty, as well. Four men faced them from across the room. One, a large, evil-looking man with brown and white striped hair, was sitting casually on one of the skin tables. Standing stiffly beside him was a somewhat older man in a dark business tunic and matching trousers. The other two men, Kinker and Shippo, Laron assumed, stood off to the sides between them and Laron, for blindfolds hanging loosely from their hands. At the far end of the room, a third guard lounged by the building's only visible door. Laron felt himself stiffen as a stray fact belatedly caught his attention. Kinker and Shippo were holding four blindfolds. Trying to seem casual, he looked to either side of him. Marcross sat in the chair to his right, his hands shackled like Laron's behind his back. To Marcross's right was Quiller, to Laron's left was Grave. Brightwater was nowhere to be seen. You're right, Doss, they really don't look like much, the businessman said in the same cold voice as he eyed the stormtroopers. Do they have a leader? Beside Laron, Marcross stirred. That would be me, Laron spoke up. And you? What, you don't even know my name? The other retorted. You came to this sector intent on overthrowing me, and you don't even know my name? Of course we do, Marcross said calmly. Your Bach Yost, recently elected to the post of Chancellor in the Skemp District on Elagasso. Larone suppressed a grimace, embarrassment momentarily eclipsing his quiet dread of the future looming over them all. He should have recognized Yost right off, even if he wasn't wearing the official robes of office the way he'd been in all the holos they'd seen of the man. That's right, Yost said. Recently and legally elected. I said you'd been elected, Marcross corrected mildly. I didn't say it had been legal. I warned you about these jokers, Doss murmured. Self-righteous clear down to the marrow. Yes, aren't they? Yost said, his voice going even colder. And I see that trying to explain the realities of life would be a waste of time. Realities, as in if you bribe someone enough, he'll go away? Laron suggested. Exactly, Yost said with a thin smile. I was going to offer you a substantial sum of money to come over to my side. 
You're clearly highly competent. Doss's list of your accomplishments over the past few months makes that impressively clear. But I see now that such an offer would be a waste of time. I suppose the only question now is what we do with you. Doss? Easiest part of all, Doss said, his voice all cheerful again. All you have to do is whistle up the Picaran garrison and hand them over to them. Did I forget to mention their military deserters? As a matter of fact, you did. Yost rumbled, eyeing Laron with a new gleam in his eye. I was wondering where they'd found stormtrooper gear to steal. Now you know, Doss said. So get on your comm link and call the garrison. Yost snorted. Don't be ridiculous. I'm a government official now. I can't do that. Doss threw the other a confused look. Of course you can, he said. You being an official will add a whole lot more weight to the charges. And being an official, Yost cut in. I can't accept rewards for the return of deserters. Doss's frown cleared. Ah. No, I guess you can't. I suppose you'll want half? I want two-thirds, Yost corrected. You and your men can have the rest. What an entire third for us. Doss said sarcastically. Very generous of you. Don't be ungrateful, Yost admonished. Don't forget that I'm the one who identified the threat and came up with this ridiculous pottery rumor for you to lure them in with. The fact of the matter is that I'm being more than generous. Especially since you'll also keep your very hefty fee. For a moment the two men glared at each other. For whatever it's worth, Laron offered into the stiff silence. Whatever he's paying Doss, we'll double it. Shut up, Doss growled. Fine. A third of the reward plus our fee. And we get to keep their ship. Agreed. Yost looked over at Laron. Well, let's bundle them aboard your ship and go wake up the Imperials. No need, a quiet voice said from somewhere to Laron's right. We're already awake. Laron twisted his head around toward the voice. A young woman was standing in the shadows by a bank of dusty storage lockers twenty meters away. Behind her, one of the locker doors hung open, as if she'd been hiding inside the whole time. She was wearing a peasant's tunic over baggy trousers and low boots, the rustic outfit topped off with a short hooded cloak. The hood was pulled low over her forehead, covering her hair and concealing the upper half of her face. An impressive unison Doss's three guards snatched out their blasters. What's that supposed to mean? Doss demanded as all three weapons swung to target the woman. Who are you? What are you doing here? You're Mikta Doss, aren't you? The woman asked, taking another step toward Doss and Yost before coming to a halt. I've read about you and your mercenaries. She cocked her head. Or are you actually pirates? The reports are a bit vague. Who is this creature? Yost demanded. Doss, if this is some trick. Shut it. Doss cut him off, his eyes on the woman. Whatever rumors you've been listening to, it's all nonsense. We're a fully licensed paramilitary group, cleared by the sector governor himself. Which means nothing, the woman said calmly. Especially in this sector, where the governor's office is long overdue for a cleaning. It's the times, Doss said philosophically. What about you? Haven't you and your associates ever skidded across the line? The woman shook her head. I have no associates. I work alone. Doss clucked his tongue. Wrong answer, he said. Kill her. The three guards raised their blasters and fired. And staggered and fell onto the dusty floor a second later as a brilliant lightsaber blade flashed into existence in front of the woman catching all three blaster bolts 
and caroming them straight back at the shooters. For a single heartbeat Doss goggled in disbelief at the sudden and unexpected carnage. Then, throwing himself backward over the edge of the skin table in a desperate bid for cover, he yanked out his blaster and fired. He was still trying for the relative safety of the table's rear when his shot was ricocheted back at him, blowing off the side of his head. He disappeared over the edge of the table, his blaster dropping onto the table and clattering to the floor at Yost's feet. And as the lightsaber blade settled down in front of the woman and the magenta glow bathed her shadowed face in soft light, Laron felt his breath freeze in his throat. This wasn't just a simple peasant woman, or even some important imperial functionary or bounty hunter. This was the imperial agent who called herself Jade. This was the emperor's hand. For a long moment, the only sound in the room was the hum of Jade's lightsaber. Well? She invited calmly, her eyes on Yost. Yost's breath was coming in quick, shallow puffs. I'm Chancellor Yost, he stammered. Chancellor of... Of Skemp District on Elegasso, Jade finished for him. Yes, I know. I was there when you got the call from Doss. Yost's tongue dabbed nervously at his lips. I'm a duly elected government official, he insisted. The lightsaber blade lifted. Are you? Jade asked pointedly. Yost shot a furtive look at Laron. Aye, there may have been some questions. He trailed off. Let's try a different approach, Jade suggested. Doss captured five men. Four are here. Where's the fifth? Yost looked at Laron again. Aboard their ship, he said. Not Doss's ship, their ship. He said they needed to persuade the pilot to unlock the helm for them. Laron frowned. That one actually made a certain amount of sense. Except that Brightwater wasn't their pilot. Quiller was, and Quiller was right here with the rest of them. So why had they taken Brightwater? Good, Jade said briskly. With a sizzling hiss, the lightsaber blade disappeared. You've just bought yourself your life. Your ship is waiting at the other end of the field. You'll get aboard her, go home, and never mention this incident to anyone. And... Yo stared at her, looked at Laron, back at Jade. And... He asked carefully. Jade cocked her head. If you have to ask, I may have to kill you after all. Yost swallowed visibly. There may have been some irregularities with the election, he conceded. Perhaps it would be best if I called for a new one. A wise idea, Jade said. You'll step down, of course, until the new results are in. Yost's lips drew back in the beginnings of a snarl. But then his gaze dropped to the lightsaber hilt in her hand and the snarl faded away. Of course. Good, Jade said briskly. Then go. That one, at least, Yost didn't have to hear twice. He rounded the end of the table and walked as quickly toward the door as he could without breaking into an actual run. And remember... Jade called after him. We will be watching. The other didn't reply, turn around, or even slow his pace. The door opened at his approach, and he hurried out into the night. Well, Jade said briskly as she strode over to the four stormtroopers. Everyone all right? Yes, I think so, Larone said, eyeing her uncomfortably. Now that the immediate crisis had passed, the question of what she was doing here was raising shivers across his back. Because offhand, he couldn't think of any answer to that question that he was going to like. Good. Jade stepped around behind the row of chairs, and with a snap hiss her lightsaber blade once again sent a glow of magenta light across the room. Let's get you out of here and go get Brightwater, shall we? If Yost wasn't lying about where they had him, 
Quiller warned. He wasn't. There was a slight tug at Laron's wrists as the lightsaber sliced through his binders. One of Doss's men told him all about Brightwater while they were heading over here from Yost's ship. You were close enough to hear them? Grave asked, sounding puzzled. It wasn't very hard, Jade assured him. I came in aboard Yost's ship. Aboard his ship? Quiller echoed, sounding stunned. First rule of following someone, Jade said as she freed the others. The simplest way is always to hitch a ride with him. That's the easy way? Marcross asked. I said it was simple, Jade corrected. I didn't say it was easy. Please don't take this wrong, Laron said, massaging his sore wrists as he stood up. But what are you doing here? All in good time, Jade said as she stepped around in front of them. Exactly, Laron thought like a field commander preparing to lead the troops. First things first. Grab those blasters, and let's go find Brightwater. Doss had left five men on duty in the Suintec, plus two more busy at the task of interrogating Brightwater. All seven were caught by surprise at the sudden appearance of Jade and the four stormtroopers. All seven decided to make a fight of it. All seven died quickly though if Laron had realized up front what they'd done to Brightwater, he might have been tempted to make their deaths last a little longer. About time, Brightwater said as Laron and Quiller unstrapped him from the bed where the mercenaries had tied him. His voice was weak, his eyes were swollen half shut. Who's that? Watch it, there's someone behind you. It's all right, Quiller assured him his voice dark and grim as Grave popped open the medpock. It's Jade. She came by to help. Jade? Brightwater asked, making an effort to open his eyes a little wider. What? He broke off into a coughing fit. What's she doing here? Helping get you out, Larone told him. Hold still, will you? So much for your lucky coin. Grave commented as he loaded a hypo with a painkiller. Hey, I'm alive, aren't I? Brightwater pointed out weakly. Lucky coin? Jade asked as she peered into Brightwater's eyes and delicately touched his forehead. Some forced thing, Laron guessed. A worthless old pre-empire drug it he picked up a couple of months ago, Grave told her. Some grateful farmer was trying to unload them on us. Brightwater's the only one who took one. You see the kind of luck the thing gets you. Like I said, I'm still alive, Brightwater said. So am I, and I don't have to lug around extra stuff, Grave countered as he injected the painkiller. This from a guy who carries around a T-28 sniper rifle for the fun of it, Laron said. How is he? Like he says, he's alive. Jade said. But he's going to need a few days in a back-to-tank. You have one aboard this ship? A sub-miniature, yes, Marcross said grimly. Our back-to-supply's running low, but we should have enough for at least one more treatment. That's all right, Jade said. I've got a tank and plenty of back-to aboard my ship back on Elegasso. Give me the Helmlock code and I'll get us into the air. That's okay, I'll take us up, Quiller said. Where on Alagasso are you? Coscone Field, northern edge of Skemp City, Jade said. She frowned. You're the pilot? Then why were they interrogating him? Because they're mercenaries, Brightwater said. That means they're stupid. And also because this idiot pushed past me into the cockpit when the gas started flooding in, Quiller said, giving Brightwater a final worried lower as he slipped past Jade. They probably found him sitting in the pilot's seat when they got in, he added over his shoulder as he headed forward toward the cockpit. Laron nodded. He should have guessed it would be something like that. 
Quilla would have been just leaving the cockpit when the attack started, which would have been Doss's cue that he was the one to beat the lock code out of. Only Brightwater had made sure he would be the one actually in the cockpit when their captors started looking around. That true, Brightwater? He asked. I was just looking for someplace soft to black out in, Brightwater protested. You know how uncomfortable these decks are to fall on. Sure, Laron said. Joking aside, that was a pretty stupid thing to do, Marcross said. They could have crippled you. Hey, I fly speeder bikes for a living, Brightwater said, wincing as he tried to shrug. Sitting down work. I'm not the one who always has to be running around everywhere. Or they could have killed you, Graves said bluntly. Brightwater tried the shrug again. Better me than Quiller. Marcross shook his head and turned to face Jade. You going to ask, Laron? Or should I? Laron braced himself. I will, he said. I think all in good time has arrived, Jade. So it has, Jade said. Bottom line, I'm on a job that requires me to infiltrate a heavily guarded governor's residence. The governor in question has brought in a lot of his sector stormtroopers to guard him. It occurred to me that a few unknown stormtroopers mixed in among a lot more unknown stormtroopers might be able to do some efficient recon and infiltration. The room had suddenly gone quiet. Even Brightwater's labored breathing seemed subdued. You're asking us to work for you, Laron said. Jade's eyebrows went up fractionally. Did I say anything about asking? The room went even quieter. Laron could feel the other's eyes on him as he gazed into Jade's unreadable expression. Just because they don't know us doesn't mean we can pass without being challenged or identified, he said. And if we're caught, we're dead. Not to worry, Jade assured him. I have all the authority I need to get you out of any trouble you land in. Only if you're there at the right place and time, Marcross said. It doesn't sound like we're going to be running in the same circles you are. What's this governor supposed to have done? Grave asked. If it's not a big secret. We think he's trying to make a deal with the rebellion, Jade said. Really, Laron said, his mind flicking back to Governor Cord on Shelkenwa. Is this your specialty now? Dealing with seditious governors? My specialty is doing things quietly, Jade told him. Any other concerns? Grave cleared his throat. If this is a rebel alliance thing, he asked, are we likely to find Lord Vader coming into play somewhere down the road? I got Lord Vader off your backs once, Jade reminded him. I can do it again if I have to. Beneath Laron's feet, the deck lurched slightly as Quiller got the Suintec into the air. Meanwhile, we need to get Brightwater into Bacta as soon as possible, Jade went on as she stepped back into the doorway. Does Quiller know about the hyperdrive kick setting? I don't know, Laron said. What's a kick setting? It's something ISB ships are sometimes equipped with, Jade said. Engaging it jumps your hyperdrive speed about 20%. No, I don't think he knows about that, Laron said, feeling his eyebrows rising on his forehead. After all these months, there were still secrets to this ship that he and the others hadn't found. That could have been very handy on occasion. Often it's not, since it eats up fuel 40% faster, Jade said. In this case, I think the Empire can afford the extra expense. Her eyes shifted to Brightwater. Take care of him. We're likely to need a good speeder scout on this mission. She stepped into the corridor and headed toward the cockpit. Grave let out a quiet sigh. Terrific, he muttered. Doesn't this just cap off an already lovely day? Laron grimaced. It could be worse. Really? Grave countered. 
May I point out that Jade's wonderful secret credentials only get us out of trouble if the governor and his stormtroopers haven't gone over to the rebels. If they have, she's got nothing. Except a lightsaber, Marcross reminded him. That's great for her, Graves said. Not so great for us. And then there's Vader. Whom Jade can deal with, Laron said. Who drags along the entire 501st everywhere he goes, Grave retorted. You want to try explaining to one of them our current lack of operational IDs? You want to tell Jade thanks, but we're turning down the job? Laron said sourly. Laron? Brightwater said weakly. Laron looked down in surprise. He'd assumed Brightwater was already fast asleep. Yes? He said. We're going out anyway, the injured man said. We know that. He took a careful breath. Let's go out with a bang. I agree, Marcross said quietly. If we can keep a rebel governor from dragging his whole sector into chaos, we'll have done more for order and justice than ten years of these little operations could accomplish. Besides which, Grave added, it didn't sound like Jade was giving us a choice. Laron grimaced. But they were right. I know, he said. Okay. If this is going to be the Hand of Judgment's final mission, let's make it one for the legends. If there's anyone left to remember, Grave murmured. There will be. Laron looked down at Brightwater again. In the meantime... It's three hours to El Agasso. Let's get Brightwater to the medical bay and see what we can do for him until then. According to the information Han had been able to dig up, Whitestone City, the capital of Pol Major and Kandora's sector, was a vibrant, cosmopolitan sprawl with a dynamic business and light manufacturing community, exciting nightlife, and a robust citizenry of humans and dozens of alien species. Maybe the rest of the city was like that. But as far as he could tell, the spaceport district looked more like Mose Isley than any genteel, cosmopolitan sprawl. Han had some decidedly mixed feelings about Mose Isley. He'd been robbed more than once there, and even beaten up a couple of times. It was also one of Jabba the Hutt's main terminals for contraband which meant there were always plenty of unpleasant and dangerous people wandering around. He'd had to shoot his share of troublemakers there, Greedo being only the latest of that crowd. Mose Eisley was also where he'd fallen in with Luke and the late crazy Jedi Kenobi, which was how he met Leia and gotten tied in with the whole Rebel Alliance. Some days that fell on the good side of the ledger. Some days it didn't. This was rapidly turning out to be one of the days when it didn't. I'll tell you one last time, Axlon said, leaning hard on the word last. I don't need you out there holding my hand. I can navigate the city perfectly well on my own. Yeah, you're going to do great out here, Hun said, eyeing the scruffy, furtive, and otherwise low-grade humans and aliens filling the streets outside their docking bay. You going to walk all the way to the governor's palace, or what? There's an airspeeder rental stand less than a kilometer away, Axlon said patiently. Fine, Han said. We'll walk you over there. That's what you diplomatic people are big on, right? Compromise? Solo. And on the way, Han said, we can stop by Luke's docking bay and bring him along. Axlon drew back a little. What are you talking about? He asked cautiously. Han sighed. Just because he and Chewie were smugglers, did people like Axlon always have to assume they were stupid? We saw his Z-95 on the way in. He told Axlon as patiently as he could. Not sure where he put down, but from the vector he was on I'd say he was somewhere between bays 52 and 58. Axlon sighed. It's 56, he said reluctantly. Blast it, Solo. You weren't supposed to know he was alone. 
Yeah, I already figured out that part, Han growled. And he'd already decided he was going to have a very long talk with General Rikin when they got back. You want to stand here all day? Or do you want to go get him? Every spaceport Han had ever visited had its own unique set of sounds and smells, and Whitestones was no exception. Unlike some places, though, a lot of the sounds seemed to be oddly residential, including the cries and noises of playing children, and most of the aromas seemed to be coming from cooking. The reason for that was quickly evident. At their side of the port, at least, only about half the landing bays were actually in service. The rest had been taken over by locals and turned into slum quarters. Or refugee camps. Two of the bays they passed seemed to have become home to beings of species that Han had never seen before. Various styles of booze had been set up around the entrances to each of those bays, and were being run by aliens offering everything from exotic foods to jewelry to brightly colored cloth and clothing. And this was on Pone Major, Han thought glumly as he and the others maneuvered their way through the crowds. He could hardly wait to see what things were like on Pone Minor, the less reputable half of the double planet. Luke was waiting outside his docking bay, looking around at the masses with the same expression Han had seen on the kid inside the Moe's Isley Cantina. He spotted them as they came around the corner, or more likely he spotted Chewie towering over the crowd, and Han saw his expression change. Not much, but enough to know that the kid was surprised to see the two of them with Axlon. Which meant it wasn't just Rikin and Axlon who were playing this stupid game. Luke was in on it too. Hey Han, Luke greeted him hesitantly as the three of them came up to him. Hey Chewie. I thought. He looked uncertainly at Axlon. That you? No, he wasn't supposed to know, Axlon said pointedly. You were supposed to keep him from spotting you. Luke winced. Sorry. So we'll just have to make do, Axlon went on. He nodded to the bay entrance. Any trouble? Luke shook his head. Like you said, there are a lot of Z95s around, and the special pass ID you gave me worked just fine. He looked at Han. You had one too, right? No, we were challenged and shot down an hour ago, Han growled. So where's this airspeeder rental place? Axlon looked around them. It should be right over. He broke off, his eyes widening at something behind Han. Watch out! He snapped. Han spun around, his hand dropping to the grip of his blaster. Walking toward them were three aliens, their eyes small and white-rimmed beneath heavy brow ridges, their skin a mix of dark green scales and similarly colored patches of fur. They were wearing cheap-looking sack clothing, mismatched, probably bought from one of the booths in the area. And each of them was holding a long, exquisitely detailed, hook-tipped knife. Behind him, Han heard the snap hiss as Luke ignited his lightsaber. Han? Luke muttered tensely. Easy, kid, Han said, leaving his blaster right where it was in its holster. Just relax. The aliens weren't holding the knives and stabbing or throwing positions. The weapons were simply resting across their palms. They weren't a gang looking for an easy score. They were a group of merchants hoping to sell their wares. And judging by their suddenly widened eyes, they were just as startled by Luke and his lightsaber as Axlon had been by them and their knives. Your pardon, noble friendlies, the lead alien said in heavily accented basic as he and the other two came to an abrupt halt. Such finely clothed and equipment, he stumbled over the word. And equipped beings as yourselves must surely have a high interest in uniquely hand-forged carving tools. Not today, Han told him, eyeing the knife in the alien's outstretched hand. It was a pretty nifty-looking weapon, he had to admit. In close quarters, if you knew what you were doing, it would probably do as well as a blaster. Close quarters like, say, 
a crowded cantina with one of Jabba's trigger-happy bounty hunters sitting across the table. But handy though the knife might be, Han knew better than to buy one. At least not here and now. The instant the other merchants and vendors in the area spotted credits changing hands, they would be on him like carrion flies, shoving cloth and furs and melons and everything else in his face, blathering their sales pitches in his ears as they tried to get him to buy something from them, too. Not exactly the way to start a supposedly Loki mission. And speaking of Loki. Luke, shut that thing off, will you? He growled. There was a sizzling hiss, and the lightsaber hum cut off. Sorry, Luke said. I thought. Yeah, yeah, I know. The three aliens were still standing there, their hands outstretched hopefully. With one last look at the knives, Han turned away. So once we get the airspeeder, where are we going? He asked, putting one hand on Luke's shoulder and the other on Axlon's and pushing both of them in the direction of the airspeeder rental sign he could now see hovering over the street a couple of blocks away. Luke and I have a rendezvous with our new friend, Axlon said. What you and Chewbacca do is entirely up to you. Great, Han said. We'll come with you. Except that. Axlon said firmly. I don't know, Governor. Luke spoke up hesitantly. As long as they know anyway. We don't need them. Axlon cut him off. They were only to provide transport. More than that, we don't want them. Luke threw a furtive look at Han. But... It's okay. Han told him, feeling a twinge of guilt at his earlier unkind thoughts. Luke might have been dragged into this thing, but he wouldn't have been the one who decided to lock Han out of it. I know when I'm not wanted. Just watch yourselves. We will, Axlon promised. Come on, Skywalker. Tapping Luke's arm, he headed off through the milling crowd. Luke gave Han and Chewie one final look, then turned and followed. Beside Han, Chewie rumbled a suggestion. Forget it, Han growled. You don't exactly blend into a crowd, you know. He'd spot us before we got within three blocks of wherever this meeting is. He looked up. Beyond the wispy clouds, Pole Minor was a small, pale half-circle floating against the blue sky. So let him go play deal-maker, he went on. You and me are going to go see what kind of stuff our supposed new best friend has to offer. He turned and headed back toward their docking bay, waving away the knife merchants as they started hopefully toward him again. Or, he added, whether this whole thing is nothing but a trap. The Poln system was reportedly one of the closest inhabited double planetary systems in the Empire, with the two worlds separated by only 50,000 kilometers. There were a fair number of ships traveling between them, though from the size of the corridors that had been zoned Han guessed that the traffic had once been more than twice what it was at the moment. Still, Axlon had at least been right about the Poln system being able to handle rebel traffic along with its own. Axlon had been pretty closed-mouthed during the trip from the rebel base, refusing to give Han so much as a hint as to what Governor Pharaohs might have already discussed with him, or Mon Mothma. But Axlon liked his sleep as much as anyone, and the encryption he'd put on his data pad had turned out to be one of the ones Han had been given for use with his own alliance reports. According to the notes tucked away on one of Axlon's data cards, the mines Pharaohs was offering were in Poln Miner's seventh octant. The safest and easiest access to that region was a series of tunnels leading out from the Yellow Strike spaceport, the octant's largest landing site which, to Han's way of thinking, automatically put Yellow Strike at the bottom of the list. The safe and easy routes he'd learned a long time ago were traveled mostly by the lazy, the unimaginative, and people who wore badges and carried stacks of wanted posts on their data pads. Instead, he turned the Falcon toward one of the octant's smaller and less conspicuous ports. Like everything else on Pone Minor, Quartz Edge Port was built mostly underground. 
Its organization was also decidedly on the casual side, to the point where Han was simply instructed by the control center to choose any of the unoccupied landing bays he wanted. Picking one of the eight open pits at random, he maneuvered the Falcon into it. By the time he'd finished powering the engines down to standby, the dome had closed above him, and the bay had been brought up from Pone Miner's marginal surface air pressure to the more comfortable standard level. Lowering the ramp, he headed outside with Chewy. The bay, he noted on the way down, had a single exit door, probably leading into an airlock for the times when someone needed to get in while the dome was open. Lounging by the door were three men, all armed, all with the look of Moe's Isley troublemakers about them. Making sure his blaster was riding loose in its holster, Han headed over. Afternoon, one of them called genially his greasy-looking hair and impressively scraggly mustache glinting in the light. His eyes flicked to Chewie, then back to Han. Need your name and cargo. Name's Darth Vader, Han told him. Got a flat load of broken Imperial promises. None of the three men so much as smiled. Cute, mustache grunted. You want to try again? Actually, my cargo bay's empty, Han told him. We're here to try our luck at a little prospecting. Given that every mine in this part of Poln Miner had been drained dry decades ago, that one should have gotten at least a cynical smile from them. But again, none of their expressions even cracked. Yeah? Mustache asked, his voice as expressionless as his face. Heading anywhere in particular? Han shrugged. The most heavily marked part of Axlan's encrypted map had been something called the Enyaten Mining Complex. I thought we'd try the old Enyaten area, he said, trying to watch all three of them at once. And that one finally got him a reaction. It was small, just a twitch of cheek muscles from one of Mustache's buddies, a balding, unshaven man with dark eyes. But it was definitely there. These weren't just random fringe cutthroats or smugglers. And they'd definitely heard of Enya Ten. Mustache played it cool. Enya Ten, huh? He asked casually. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. What's there that's still worth digging up? Don't know yet, Han said, playing it just as cool. But the place used to be all platinum, and platinum prices are up. I had some time on my hands and figured it'd be worth a look. Could be, Mustache agreed. Tell you what. Just because I like your face, we're going to let you go without paying the usual docking fee. But if you find anything, we'll take half on your way out. Fair enough? Han shrugged. Make it a tenth and you've got a deal. Baldi made a contemptuous sound in the back of his throat, but Mustache merely smiled. We got three blasters. You've got one. Make it half. One blaster, plus one Wookiee, Han reminded him. A tenth. Mustache eyed Chewy. A quarter. Fine, Han said. It was, he knew. A little ridiculous to be bargaining over profits, he was never going to make. But there was still a chance Mustache and his pals thought he and Chewie were just innocent treasure hunters, and it would be out of character for him not to bargain. Good, Mustache said briskly. Best of luck to you. There's a row of land speeders just past the airlock, help yourself. Fact, we'll make it even easier. I think there are some shovels and pickaxes in one of the lockers across from them. Probably a little rusty, but they ought to do, especially seeing as you don't have any of your own. That's because we were just going to scope out the place this time around, Han improvised. But as long as you're offering, sure, why not? You're welcome, Mustache said drilly. You need a map? No, thanks, Han said. It's supposed to be about 150 kilometers straight down corridor CC4087, right? If you say so, 
Mustache said. Have fun. And come back rich. Baldi added as Han and Chewie walked past them through the door. The land speeders and tools were right where Mustache had said. The shovels were indeed rusty and half broken, and the land speeders weren't in much better shape. Han gave each of the vehicles a test rev, picked the one that sounded least like it was going to fall apart in the next two hours, and they headed out. The tunnel Han had headed down was probably typical of the abandoned mine system. Most of the overhead glow panels were gone, though the emergency permlights set into the upper and lower walls every hundred meters or so were still running. Fortunately, the land speeder had good headlights, which let Han avoid the various heaps of stone chips that littered the tunnel floor, residue from years of small rockfalls from the ceiling and walls. The air smelled thin and stale, and aside from the labored hum of their own land speeder the whole place was eerily quiet. Chewie rumbled a question into the hum. Of course we're not going straight there, Han confirmed. You saw how Mustache and his buddies reacted when I told them where we were going. They either know something, or think they do. Chewie growled again. Sure, but just because someone knows we're coming doesn't mean they know where we're coming from. Han reminded him as he pulled out his data pad and the copy he'd made of Axlon's maps. Here, see if you can find a back way into the caverns. Maybe we can at least surprise them a little. The cantina where Axlon and Governor Pharaohs had arranged to meet was large, elaborately decorated, and, from what Luke could see of the menu, very expensive. But they didn't have enough time to properly enjoy either the decor or the aromas wafting through the main room. A hard-faced thug type with eyes that seemed to be trying to cut straight through to the back of Luke's skull intercepted them at the door and led them through the main dining area to a private room more subtly decorated than the rest of the restaurant. Sitting alone at the head of a long table, a steaming platter of small, off-white spheres in front of him and three more hard-faced men standing against the wall behind him, was Governor Pharaohs. He rose to his feet as Luke and Axlon were ushered into the room. Governor Axlon, Pharaohs said gravely, It's an honor to meet you in person. The honor is mine, Governor Pharaohs, Axlon assured him. May I present my associate, Master Luke Skywalker? Master Skywalker, Pharaohs said, a frown creasing his face as he nodded in greeting. I believe I've heard your name before. He was at Yavin, Axlon said. One of those who helped avenge the destruction of Alderan. Pharaoh's cheek twitched. Of course, he murmured. Please sit down. I took the liberty of ordering some stuffed sharam mushrooms for us. Thank you, Axlon said, walking to the table and taking the seat at Pharaoh's right. Have you ever had stuffed sharas, Luke? No, Luke said feeling distinctly uncomfortable as he sat down beside Axlon, trying not to look at the three expressionless bodyguards behind Pharaohs. We didn't have them where I grew up. Well, you'll like them, Axlon said placidly, selecting one of the small spheres and taking a careful bite from one side. Ah, uh, seafood stuffing, is it? Yes, Pharaohs said. Local shell crake from Burnish Bay. Shall we get to business? By all means, Axlon said. He popped the remainder of the mushroom into his mouth and selected another one. What I'd like first is a confirmation of the exact location you have in mind for our use, including which spaceports and other facilities will be available. I also wish to know what equipment and support you intend to supply, and who will be acting as liaison between us. Pharaohs frowned, shooting a glance at Luke. If you'll forgive me, Master Axlon, we could have done all that via comm link. I said that was for a start, Axlon reminded him. At any rate, face-to-face -face meetings are always so much more rewarding. Wouldn't you agree, Luke? Luke suppressed a grimace. Here he was, doing his level best to vanish into the background 
and meanwhile Axlon seemed to be doing his level best to drag him into the forefront of everyone's attention. Could that be the real reason Axlon had brought him along? Did he simply want Luke to draw the attention of Pharaohs and his bodyguards away from Axlon so that? With an effort, Luke forced himself to relax. So that Axlon could do what? Nothing, that was what? There was literally nothing the man could do with four pairs of suspicious eyes watching his every move. No, Luke was surely here for the reason Axlon had first approached him to see what his Jedi senses could get from Pharaohs. Taking a careful breath, listening with half an ear as the two men began throwing around names and numbers, he stretched out with the force and felt his chest tighten. Normally, he could barely sense the emotions moving along beneath the surface of the people he was with. But Pharaohs wasn't like Leia or Han. His whole sense was practically screaming with emotion. All sorts of emotions, fear and anger, hopelessness and defiance, sadness and determination. And betrayal. Especially betrayal. But whose betrayal? Axlon's? Pharaoh's? Someone else's? Luke stretched out harder, focusing on the force, trying to sift through the turbulence. Look! The sound of his name abruptly snapped him out of his concentration. He opened his mouth to acknowledge. May want to come along as well, Axlon continued, and Luke realized that he was addressing Pharaohs, not talking to Luke himself. I trust that will be acceptable. If he wishes to accompany you, Pharaohs said, looking at Luke. Luke held the other's gaze, trying to reach out again with the force. But the moment had passed. The turbulence was still there, but Luke was too weak and inexperienced to get the connection back. Excellent, Axelon said. At the palace, then, whenever we're able to get our team here to assess the Enyaten facilities. Say, a week or so? You have you're ready. You have the pass I gave you? Right here, Axelon said, tapping his tunic. Thank you for your time, Governor. He lifted a finger. One more thing, he went on. I'd appreciate it if you could make sure all your people are out of the Enyaten area, including the Yellow Strike and Quartz Edge spaceports. That's already been done, Pharaoh said. I had my people out of the area two days ago. Including customs officials? Axelon asked. Including everyone, Pharaoh said tartly. I just said that. So you did, Axelon said, ducking his head in apology. Tapping Luke on the arm, he stood up. Thank you again, Governor. I'll be in touch. They were outside the cantina, wending their way through the crowds toward their rented airspeeder before Axlon spoke again. What do you think? About what? Luke asked. The deal, of course, Axlon said, throwing an odd look at him. The Enyatin complex for our base and storage. The Sarasev enclosed landing area for transport, loading, and unloading. All the rest of it. Weren't you paying attention? Luke shook his head. I was trying to read Governor Pharaohs. Trying to read him? Through the force, Luke said, frowning. Isn't that what you brought me along for? Well, yes, Axelon said, stumbling a little on the words. Yes, of course. I just didn't think you could, never mind. What did you find out? Not much, Luke had to admit. There's a lot of turmoil in him. Axelon grunted. Not surprising, under the circumstances. There was one thing, though, that I got very clearly. Luke continued. It was a sense of betrayal. Axelon stopped short. Betrayal? Yes, 
Luke said. He stopped too and turned to face the other and felt his muscles stiffen. The look on Axlon's face. But it may not mean he's going to betray us, he hastened to add. It could be he's feeling betrayed by the Empire. Or he's worried that some of his people might betray him. Yes, Axelon said, some of the sudden dark tension fading from his face. Yes, that could certainly be it. The Imperial Security Bureau might very well have planted an agent or two within the palace to watch him. We'll need to be careful when we go there. Glancing around, as if suddenly concerned about eavesdroppers, he started walking again. What was that about, there at the end? Luke asked, falling into step again beside him. We're going to the palace? I am, Axelon said. Whether you go with me is up to you. Weren't you listening to any of it? No, I already told you, Luke said. I was. You were using the force. Axelon finished for him, an edge of exasperation in his voice. Sometimes I wonder how the Jedi lasted as long as they did. Or how the Republic lasted with Jedi running the show. Luke felt his face flush. How dare Axlon talk about the Jedi that way? He took a deep breath, stretching out to the Force for calm the way Ben Kenobi had taught him. There is no emotion, there is peace. Anger was as much a trap as fear, Ben had warned. Besides, Axlon was speaking out of ignorance, not animosity. It was up to Luke to show him what Jedi were, what they could be, and what they could do. Once Luke figured all of that out himself, of course. If he ever did. He sighed. In the all too short time he and Ben had had together, the old Jedi had taught him a great deal about the Force. But there was so much more he still had to learn. Vader had taken Ben away from him, just as Vader's stormtroopers had taken his uncle and aunt. Like Alderaan, more scores that would someday need to be settled. Let's get back to the ship, Axlon said into his musings. See if Solo's calmed down yet, he paused. By the way, do you think Pharaohs was telling the truth about having pulled all his people out of the Enyaten area? Luke frowned. I don't know, he said. I'm not. I can't read thoughts that way. That's not how it works. Why do you ask? No reason, Axlon murmured. No reason at all. Captain Druzen looked up from the data pad. And Arcanian, he said flatly. I believe so, yes, Pelian said, trying to read the other's expression. But the mottled hyperspace sky flowing across the bridge viewport at the captain's back was throwing just enough shadow over his face to make that impossible. His height and mass are well within the species' range. The mask would cover the distinctive white eyes, and it would be child's play for an Arcanian to gather all those biomarkers. Why Arcanian? Drusen interrupted. Why not someone from any of a dozen other species? Because he quoted me a line from something called the Song of Salaban, Pelian said. It's an ancient Arcanian legend about a man whose family and village were captured by an enemy force, who then forced him to go on a quest of sacrifice to win their release. So Lord Odo studies ancient legends, Drusan said with a shrug. Grand Admiral Zarin has a passion for music. Senior Captain Thrawn is insane over art. I knew a colonel once who collected different versions of Sabak cards. There are eccentrics all across the galaxy. Perhaps, sir, Pelian said. But there's more. On the assumption that Oda was, in fact, Arcanian, I checked the ISB's at-large criminal registry for that species. It turns out that there are five major Arcanian criminals currently unaccounted for. All five are wanted for medical atrocities, and any one of them would have both the ability and the arrogance to fake an order with an eye toward getting aboard the Chimera. 
Drew San shot a look over Pelian's shoulder, possibly checking to see whether any of the bridge crew was close enough to overhear them, but more likely making sure Lord Odo was still at the computer console in the aft bridge where he'd been when Pelian arrived a few minutes ago. Are you suggesting that we have a monster aboard? That is indeed my fear, sir, Pelian said. Under the circumstances, I respectfully recommend that you exercise your rights under the captain's authority directives and find out exactly who and what Odo is. At the very least, we should take another look at his authorization to be aboard this ship. Again, Drew Sen looked over Pelian's shoulder. Very well, Commander, he said, lowering his voice. I wasn't supposed to share this with you or anyone else aboard the Chimera. But under the circumstances, Lord Odo's orders didn't come from Imperial Center. Pelian nodded. Yes, sir, I know. Drew Sen seemed taken aback. You know? I backtracked the routing, Pelian explained, wondering uneasily if he shouldn't have said that. I thought it prudent, given the unusual circumstances. I see, Drew Sen murmured. And where exactly did that backtrack take you? The order came from somewhere in the outer rim, Pelian said. I wasn't able to locate it any more precisely. He hesitated. My original thought was that perhaps Odo had been sent by Grand Admiral Zarin, since he's reported to be somewhere in that general region. But I'm wondering now if Odo simply used an outer rim origination to make it look like the orders came from Zarin. Drew San hissed out a breath, and some of the stiffness seemed to leave his spine. I'm impressed, Commander, he said. I truly am. Not many officers, even senior officers, would have taken it upon themselves to follow this course in the first place. Even fewer would have stayed with it long enough to reach a conclusion. He paused, and this time, despite the flowing hyperspace sky, Pelian could see the tight smile on the other's face. Even more impressive, most of your conclusions were accurate, Drew Sand continued. Lord Odo is Arcanian, and his orders did come from the predominant. Are you certain of that, sir? Pelian asked carefully. He was treading on dangerous ground, he knew, pressing the same point over and over to a superior officer. Orders have been faked before. Codes and encryptions have been stolen. True enough, Drusan agreed. But the one communication no one can fake is a personal transmission from the Emperor himself. Pelian felt his eyes widen. The Emperor? Drusan chuckled. Yes, that was my reaction too, he said. It seems that the Emperor has joined Zarin in his quiet tour of the Outer Rim. And he contacted you? Directly? Very directly, Drew San said, his smile turning into a grimace. Pelian winced in sympathy. Conversations between the Emperor and his subordinates tended to be not very pleasant. No, Commander, the captain continued quietly. Whatever mysteries still hover around Lord Odo, rest assured that he and his mission have been sanctioned at the absolute highest level. Yes, sir, Pelian said, feeling a flush of embarrassment. He should have known that Drusen would have made sure Odo didn't pose any danger to the Chimera. Especially since a threat to Drusen's ship would also be a threat to his career. May I ask what his mission is? Drusen snorted. Really, Commander? One confidential security breach isn't enough for you? You want me to commit a second? As well? Pelian winced again. My apologies, sir. That's all right, Drusan said drilly. How can I complain about your persistence when I've just finished praising you for it? He pursed his lips. I'll tell you this much. Lord Odo has evidence of an agreement in progress between the Rebel Alliance and an alien warlord named Nuso Esva from the Unknown Regions. There's also a strong possibility that the agreement is being brokered by the Kandora sector's Governor Faraus himself. 
The emperor has asked Lord Odo to look into it and assign the chimera to provide him transport and any support he may need. I see, Pelian said, feeling his stomach tighten. An imperial governor, dabbling in treason? That was unheard of. And he chose an Arcanian because rebel spies wouldn't be as quick to track the movements of an outsider as they would someone from the fleet or imperial court? Yes, Drusan said, eyeing him closely. Yes, exactly. Once again, Commander, your insights do you proud. None of this is to be repeated, of course. To anyone. Understood, sir, Pelian said. Again, my apologies for pressing a matter that was none of my business. The safety of this ship, the fleet, and the Empire is the business of all Imperial officers, Drew Sand countered solemnly. So our persistence and initiative. Well done, Commander. The fleet needs more officers like you. Thank you, sir. Drew Sand gave a curt nod. Dismissed. Lord Odo was no longer at the computer console when Pelian retraced his path down the command walkway to the aft bridge. He signaled for the turbo lift, wondering where the other had gotten to. It was as Pelian was stepping into the turbo lift car that an odd question suddenly struck him. Arcanians had a reputation for arrogance, along with an attitude of racial superiority that even the huts would be hard pressed to match. Most Arcanians that Pelian had met firmly believed that they could do anything any other species could do, and that they could do it better. So why would one of them lower himself so far as to employ a human pilot to fly his ship for him? For a brief moment, Pelian was tempted to go back to Drusan and ask. But then the door slid shut, and the car started toward Pelian's quarters and the soft bed he'd spent far too few hours in lately and he'd push security protocol enough for one day. Besides, there were still four days to the Poln system. There would be plenty of time for him to find an opportunity to put that question to the captain. You really should stop that, Thrawn commented from his seat at the computer console. Cardas frowned. Stop what? You should stop pacing, Thrawn said. It doesn't gain you anything. Cardas grimaced. Lost in thought, he hadn't been aware that he was pacing. It helps me think, he said. I always pace when I'm trying to solve a problem. You never did before. Well, I do now, Cardas growled. Is it a problem for you? Not at all, Thrawn said, his glowing red eyes seeming to burn into Cardas's pale face. Is this problem something I can help with? No, Cardas told him shortly. He turned his back and started pacing again. And abruptly stopped. With four days to poem major and whatever unknowns were waiting for them there, it was time he finally brought this into the open. Yes, actually there is, he said, turning around again. You can tell me why we're here. Thrawn tilted his head slightly. Why we're here? He asked. Fine, Cardas ground out. Why I'm here? It makes no sense. I don't have access to information you might want. I'm rotten company, and you're at least as good a pilot as I am. Why didn't you just leave me where I was? Thrawn's blue-black eyebrows rose. You mean on the run? He asked pointedly. Cardas took a careful breath, his lungs and chest aching with the expansion. I'm dying, Thrawn, he said quietly. I know I don't look it right now, but I am. I'm living on stems and patchworks, and that's not going to last much longer. He gestured vaguely toward the vast universe lying beyond the ship. There's only one place in the galaxy where I was told I might be able to find a cure. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Maybe all I'll find is some answers. You blame me for trying to get there? Of course not, Thrawn said. What questions are you looking for answers to? Cardas sighed. 
I don't even know that. For a moment silence returned to the room. Yet when I called you came, Thrawn said. If you were so eager to leave, why didn't you tell me all this before? I don't know that either, Cardas admitted. Maybe I figured I owed you. He shook his head. Maybe because this is my last chance to do something useful for the rest of the galaxy. You've done any number of useful things, Thrawn reminded him. Including the saving of my life. Ancient history, Cardas said, his stomach tightening with shame and guilt. For years I've done absolutely nothing except build up my smuggling organization. Not to help anyone, the way I used to send information to Imperial Center to help the government root out criminals and traitors. It was all just for my own aggrandizement and power. He shook his head. I've wasted my life, Thrawn. These last years, I've wasted them all. Perhaps, Thrawn said, his voice quiet. Yet the need to create is a drive that lies deep within each of us. We all strive to build empires, whether of stone or people or words. Empires we hope will survive us. In the end, though, each of us must necessarily leave our creations behind. All we can hope for is to also leave behind a worthy successor to continue our work. Or who can at least maintain it for a season. Perhaps, Cardas said. Thrawn was right, of course. He usually was. And Cardas had indeed left behind such a worthy successor, a trusted lieutenant named Talon Card. The crucial question was whether Card would survive the seeds of chaos Cardas had also left behind. But it was too late to worry about that now. The future of his organization was already in motion, and even if Cardas went back right now there would be no way for him to restore order. But then, the future was always changing. All futures were. I noticed, though, that you haven't answered my question, Cardas said. You're here to protect the Empire from Warlord Nuso Esva. But why am I here? Because my forces are busy in the unknown regions, tied down with the defense of my allies, Thrawn said. Because I'm alone, and it's always useful to have an extra set of eyes or hands. But why me? Cardas persisted. You have the Emperor's ear. Why not a royal guard, or some brilliant junior fleet officer? He snorted. Why not Vader himself? If you could stand his company. Thrawn smiled, and to Cardas's amazement, there was sadness in the other's normally calm expression. Because, he said quietly, you're the only one I trust. Cardas stared at him, some of his own self pity fading away into a fresh pool of shame. Thrawn had left everything his home, his people, his prestige, his life. He dedicated himself to protecting the civilized parts of the galaxy against pirates, warlords, and distant, nameless nightmares that Cardas could barely even imagine. And yet, in the end, all that work and sacrifice had come down to this. The greatest military mind of the age, with only a single, solitary, worthless man whom he could trust. I'm sorry, he said quietly. No apology needed. Thrawn assured him. I'm the one who should apologize. With luck, this should be over in two or three weeks, and then you can continue your journey. He tilted his head. Or we could return to the executor, and I could release you now. Cardas made a face. Thanks, but I have no intention of turning you over to Vader's tender mercies. Aside from everything else, he has a reputation for capriciousness even the huts can match. What if he suddenly decides to renege on your deal? He won't, Thrawn assured him. Impulsive or not, Lord Vader has a strong personal agenda, plus as much enlightened self-interest as anyone. I have no doubt he'll play the role I've assigned him. Cardas shivered. 
A fleet captain talking openly about Darth Vader playing an assigned role was normally how first officers got sudden promotions. All the more reason not to leave the two of them together any longer than absolutely necessary. I'm sure he will, he said. I'm hungry. You want anything? No, thank you, Thrawn said, his voice distant, his attention already back on the computer monitor. Mentally, Cardas shook his head as he levered himself out of his seat. Blunt conversations like this were probably why Thrawn didn't have anyone else in the Empire he could trust. The fleet, like the Imperial Court, thrived on evasion, politics, and smiling masks. Anything approaching openness was looked upon with suspicion. Still, he had to admit as he headed down the corridor, maybe Thrawn's straightforward honesty wasn't such a bad thing. Certainly Cardas himself felt better than he had in weeks. Maybe even in months. He thought this trip was his last chance to do something fine and noble. Now he was sure of it. He could only hope he would live long enough to see it through to the end. The Seventh Octant's tunnel system was about as convoluted a noodle bake as Han had ever seen. But Axlon's maps were good ones, and after a couple of hours of weaving back and forth, Han finally had them on course for the Enyaten mining area again. Only now, instead of coming in from the direction of the Quartz Edge port like a reasonable man might expect, he and Chewie were coming up on the complex from the direction of one of the other abandoned mining caverns. A direction no one would ever expect company to come from. He hoped. Five kilometers from the edge of the complex he shut down the landspeeder's headlights and slowed to a speed where they could navigate more or less safely by the faint illumination of the widely spaced perm lights. A kilometer from the edge he let the landspeeder coast to a stop. For a minute they just sat quietly, letting their ears adjust to the absence of the repulsor lift's hum. Then, in the distance, Han heard the faint murmur of voices. A lot of voices. He looked at Chewie. The Wookiee gave a low rumble of agreement. Right, Han said, drawing his blaster as he climbed out of the land speeder. Let's see what kind of trouble we're looking at. According to Axlon's data, the Enyaten complex consisted of eight irregularly shaped caverns that had been hollowed out of the rock as the veins and clumps of ore had been removed. Han and Chewie headed down the tunnel, passing a few small side caves along the way that had probably been designated as equipment or fuel storage. They walked carefully, watching their footing, trying not to make too much noise on the rock chips that littered the ground. They were within 50 meters of the nearest of the big caverns, and Han could see the flickering light of glow rods against the tunnel wall, when there was a sudden crunch of gravel directly behind them. That's far enough, a quiet voice warned. Han stopped, swallowing a curse. He checked the first few side caves as he and Chui had passed, but since all of them had been empty he'd stopped bothering. Instead, focusing all his attention on the voices and lights ahead. Now that carelessness was going to cost him. Or rather, it was going to cost the man behind them. From the sound of his voice, he was probably within Chui's reach, and Han doubted anyone on Pole Minor had ever seen how fast a Wookiee could move. Take it easy, he said soothingly, raising his blaster high above his head. If the guard was foolish enough to watch the weapon or, even better, step closer to take it from Han's hand. Chewbacca? The guard asked. That you? Blinking, Han turned to look behind him. It wasn't a smuggler, or a pirate, or one of Governor Farrow's men. It was, in fact. Colonel Kraken? Wedge Antilles called. Colonel? Got a surprise for you. The murmur of voices ahead abruptly stopped. A moment later the reflected light from all the glow rods grew brighter as a whole crowd headed toward the cavern entrance. Grimacing, Han dropped his blaster into its holster. 
Wedge here. Colonel Iron Kraken here. The only thing that could possibly make it worse would be. Han! Leia said, her voice and expression halfway between astonished and furious, in a way that only she could pull off. What are you doing here? Yes, I know we aren't supposed to move in until Axlon formally makes the deal. Leia said, keeping her voice low as she and Han walked into the cavern she and the others had just started examining. And we haven't. We just thought it would be a good idea to have an advanced team come in and look things over. Yeah, Han grunted. Nice. Leia took a deep breath, trying very hard not to be irritated. Han had been ordered to stay with Axlan on Pol Major. He shouldn't be here at all, let alone poking around and demanding explanations. Or acting like she and Kraken were doing anything wrong. Especially since this unofficial sortie had been Axlon's idea in the first place. If their chief negotiator thought it was legitimate, Han of all people shouldn't be second-guessing him. At least now we know who those guys were at Quartz Edge, Han said sourly. They could have said something when we first came in. Leia frowned. Quartz Edge? Who had Kraken put at Quartz Edge? She opened her mouth to ask. Hey! Someone called from across the cavern, his glow rod playing over a section of broken wall. Colonel? Princess? You're going to want to see this. Leia started across the chamber, wondering briefly if she should order Han to stay here. But it was too late. With his longer stride, he was already ahead of her. Scowling, Leia hurried to catch up. Han was nearly to the man with the glow rod. It was one of the techs Leia saw now, a short, earnest type named Anselm. When Kraken caught up to Han, deftly slipped a shoulder in front of him and got to the opening first. Even in the faint light reflecting off the dark rock, Leia saw Kraken's eyes widen. Well, well, he murmured. What have we here? Han and Chewie were already at his side, peering in along the glow rod beam. Putting on a burst of fast walk speed, Leia moved up beside them. The hole, as she'd expected, opened into another dome ceiling cavern, its floor about a meter and a half higher than the one they were currently standing in. But unlike all the rest of the abandoned mines they'd explored, this one wasn't empty. It was, in fact, stocked with orderly rows of equipment. And not just any equipment. Military equipment. She could see a rack of e-web repeating blasters another rack holding grenades plus a pair of Mersan grenade mortars, and, at the very edge of the light, what looked like a pair of outpost-style sensor beacons. Anselm? Kraken prompted. Analysis, please. Ah, uh, Anselm floundered, and Leia felt a flicker of sympathy for the man. He was mainly a ship tech who spent most of his time up to his elbows in partially disassembled starfighter engines. Kraken had brought him along to check on the suitability of their new caverns for ship repair bays, as well as to ride herd on the old, battered freighter Rican had picked to slip them into the Poln system. Now, with a single stroke, Anselm's whole job description for this trip had abruptly been expanded. Ah, uh, he tried again. I'll take a look, Han said, starting to step past Kraken. I'll take a look, Leia countered, grabbing his arm and yanking him to a halt. For starters, you'll never get through that opening. No problem, Han said, drawing his blaster. I'll just make it bigger. As you were solo, Kraken said coolly. All right, princess, you're on. Ten minutes, no more and don't touch anything. Toxie, give her a boost. Leia stepped to the hole and set her foot gingerly onto the cupped hands of one of Kraken's bulliest men. Up close, she could see that the hole was smaller than it had looked from farther away, and was jagged-edged besides. 
But there was no way she wasn't going to get through it. Not with Kraken and the rest of them watching. Especially not with Han watching. Wincing as the edges scraped across her jumpsuit and dug into the skin beneath, she eased her way up and threw into the other chamber. Pulling out her glow rod, she switched it on. The cavern wasn't very big, only about twenty meters across. But its limited floor space was astonishingly well stocked. Along with the equipment she'd already seen were more racks of weapons, Tibana gas canisters, and enough gear to set up a small encampment or listening post. There was another cavern opening off the far end, with the glint of metal showing faintly in the light of her glow rod. Giving the encampment gear a quick look as she passed, she headed across to the other cavern. This one was also loaded, having been turned into a fully equipped armorer's machine shop, complete with two portable fusion generators to run all the gear. And in the next room. She made it back to the broken wall five minutes after Kraken's ten-minute time limit was up, arriving to find one of the smaller rebellion men, small, but not small enough struggling mightily to slip through the opening to come look for her. She helped him back down, then followed him through. Well? Kraken said, lowering his data pad as Toxie helped her to the floor. It's the Sabak pot, Leia told him. We've got blasters, Tabana gas, and an armorer's workshop. And beyond that, there's a whole cavern full of combat-modified T-47 airspeeders. You're kidding, Kraken said, his eyes widening. How many? Twelve, Leia said. There's also a tunnel off one side wide enough to get them out, and one of the big conveyance tunnels down the way is big enough for one of our transports. And that's not the last of the caverns either. You're right on that one, Kraken agreed, offering her his data pad. Near as I can figure from these maps of Axlons, that's the Lysith mining system through there. Leia grimaced as she studied the tangled cavern layout. Unfortunately, Lysith isn't part of our agreement with Pharaohs. Not yet, Kraken said. But maybe we can change that. I want you to take one of the speeders back to Yellowstrike where you can get a clear comm signal and see if Axlon can throw an addendum onto the deal to get us those extra caverns. Leia frowned. You don't really think he'd give all this up, do you? Depends on whether this stuff is actually his, he said. Solo thinks it isn't, and I tend to agree with him. Leia looked around. That was what she'd been missing, she realized suddenly, since her return from the other caverns, Han's loud voice and smirking face. Where is he? He and Chewbacca headed back to Quartz Edge. Kraken told her, nodding back over his shoulder. He said three men were hanging around the port on his way in. If they aren't Pharaoh's men, they may be sentries for whoever owns this equipment. Either way, we should probably have a good talk with them. Yes, Leia said mechanically, still looking around. Chewie had gone with him, of course. But that still left the odds three against two. Don't worry, I sent Eric and Flind with them, Kraken added. They'll be okay. Of course they will, Leia said, feeling a small flush of embarrassment. Han was a big boy, and he could take care of himself. Not that she really cared that much one way or the other. We need to find another way into those caverns, she said, taking Kraken's data pad from him. Let's see what else our future benefactor may have left us. They checked the Falcon's landing bay, all the other bays they could get into, and the deserted customs office. In the end, they found no one and nothing. You sure you didn't just dream up these guys, Solo? Flynn asked as they headed back into the Falcon's bay. Funny, Han said, scowling across the open space at his ship. She looked all right. Unfortunately, that didn't mean a whole lot. I guess you two might as well start on the outside. Start what? Flynn asked suspiciously. 
checking for trackers, Han said. Me and Chui'll take the inside. Solo. Hang on and I'll get you a scanner. Han cut him off, keying the ramp. Forget it, Eric growled. We've got work to do. Hey, no problem, Han said calmly. I'll just give Kraken a call and tell him you don't want to be bothered sweeping Axlon's ambassadorial ship. Eric snorted. Ambassadorial ship? You can't call him anyway, Flynn said as Han headed up the ramp. There's no baseline comm service between here and there, and the comm link relay isn't working. That's okay, Han said, opening the equipment locker beside the hatch and pulling out two enhanced skin portable scanners. I can call Rikin instead. Or Mon Mothma. Here, catch. He tossed the sensors down the ramp to the two glowering men. Might as well start at the bow and stern, he told them as Chewie walked up the ramp and joined him. Call me if you find anything. I'll want to see it before you take it off. The two men looked at each other. Then, without a word, they stomped off in their assigned directions. Here, Han said, pulling out the last enhanced scan and handing it to Chewie. Start with the engines. I'd better see if Axlon's missed us yet. Sure enough, the comm was signaling no fewer than six waiting messages. All were from Axlon, with steadily increasing levels of irritation and anger. Han listened to all six, mostly for amusement, then keyed for Axlon's comm link. About time, the other growled after Han had identified himself. Where have you been? Working, Han said. How about you? We've got the preliminary agreement, Axlon said. We'll be meeting again in a few days to hammer out any last-minute details. Skywalker says you left the spaceport? I had some errands, Han said, eyeing the comms speaker thoughtfully. So Luke had had to tell Axlon that the Falcon was missing? Axlon hadn't spotted that himself? Where's Luke now? I don't know, Axlon said. Back at his ship, I assume. I've taken a room at a hotel near the palace. No point in making a cross-down trip every time I want to talk to our friend. Makes sense, Han said. Especially when the Alliance was paying the bills. You get one for Luke, too? No, Axlon said, sounding puzzled. I assumed he'd be making his own arrangements. Han made a face. Or, more likely, now that Luke's cover was blown, Axlon was expecting him to bunk aboard the Falcon with Han and Chewie. You talked to Kraken yet? He asked. There was a short pause. Kraken? Axlon said cautiously. Colonel Iron Kraken, Han said, striving for patience. He was getting really tired of these games. Him and her worshipfulness. You know, your former. Yes, yes, I know who you mean, Axlon said stiffly. The question is, why do you know? Probably because I'm smarter than you think, Han told him. Like I was saying, you need to talk to Kraken. There's another cave system you'll want to put on the bargaining list. Another O, oh, Axlon interrupted himself. Fine. I'll talk to him as soon as I can. Anyway, I need to tell him he can bring in the official survey team. Where are you now? Busy, Han said. You need something, let me know. Otherwise, don't. Solo. With a flick of his finger, Han cut off the calm. For a few minutes he stared out the cockpit canopy at the dull rock of the landing bay, listening to the indistinct voices of Flynn and Eric wafting faintly up the boarding ramp and into the cockpit. And tried to think. Because something about this whole thing didn't make sense. He was still trying to figure it out when the calm beeped again. Scowling, he punched the activation key. If this was Axlon again. Solo, he growled. 
It's Leia. Are you all right? Sure, Han said. Why? Because you told us there were mysterious men hanging around the Falcon, she said, sounding a little miffed. Remember? Oh, right, Han said. Well, they are now. They were gone by the time we got here. Really, Leia said. That's strange. Yeah, I was thinking that too, Han said. If they were watching to see who's snooping around, why leave now? Especially since we said we were going to the Anyaten Mines, which was right next to that handy little weapon stash. Unless they didn't realize the cave wall had been broken through, Leia said, sounding doubtful. We were still going to that area, Han pointed out. They should at least have waited for us to come back to see if we'd seen anything. They probably weren't expecting you back so soon, Leia pointed out. Maybe they figured they had time to leave and come back later, she paused. Or maybe they just wanted to get a look at your ship while you weren't there. Or maybe more than a look, Han said. I've got Chewie and the other two looking for trackers. Good idea, Leia said. Some of the techs might be better at that, though. You want me to send you a couple of them? No, we can handle it, Han assured her. Could also be that they were Pharaoh's people, and he pulled them off once he and Axlan had their deal. Not according to Axlan, Leia said. I asked him that and he told me Pharaoh said all his people were already out of the area. Unless he was lying, Han said sourly. Speaking of Axlan, he said something about calling in a survey team. I thought you were the survey team. He means the real, official team waiting outside the system, Leia said. Our job was just to take a quick look around. They're supposed to do a full examination and analysis of the caverns and figure out what we can do with them. Under the circumstances, though, we're going to need a slightly bigger party. To look over the stuff we found. The stuff we found, yes, Leia corrected pointedly. General Reekin's putting together a full quartermaster's squad, along with a logistics support group to triage the equipment, plus a few transports for when we're ready to start taking stuff out. Hold it, Han said, frowning. We're taking stuff out already? We don't even know who it belongs to yet. Hence the triage, Leia said. We'll want to grab the most vital equipment before whoever owns it notices. Yeah, well, that probably won't take too long, Han warned. And if it's Pharaoh's stash, he's going to be unhappy in a really loud way. Which is why Axlan will be broaching the subject of the Lysith Remines with him as soon as he can, Leia said. If there's no reaction, we can assume the equipment belongs to smugglers or pirates instead. I don't think there's any moral issue with stealing stolen property. I was thinking more about pirate gangs that pack almost as big a punch as the Imperials, Han growled. I've run into some of them, and if that stuff is theirs they're definitely going to have some issues. Don't worry, Rekin will be sending a full escort with the team, Leia assured him. A fighter wing at the very least. Possibly a couple of light cruisers along with them. Han grimaced. That should make Pharaohs happy. I'm sure he'll be delighted, Leia said. Doesn't sound like you are, though. Not really, no. Han said. But since when does that matter to anyone? There was a short pause. It matters, Leia said, her voice carefully neutral. Watch yourself, okay? I always do, sweetheart, Han assured her. You want me to stick around here for a while? Thanks, but I think we can manage, Leia said, sounding suddenly frosty. Probably the sweetheart thing. Han guessed. Go back to Poln Major. If something goes wrong, you're Axlan's only way out of there. Sure, Han said. You need me, just call. 
There was a click, and the comm cut off. For a moment Han gazed down at the control board. Then, shaking his head, he keyed for a full diagnostic of the Falcon's systems. Mustache and his pals might have just have been scouting for easy targets. Or they may have wanted to keep tabs on where the Falcon went by installing a tracking device or two. Or they may have decided they didn't want the Falcon going anywhere. Ever. Chewie and Kraken's men were already looking for trackers. Han had better get busy and look for sabotage. There had been some sort of meltdown with the Poln Major Space Traffic System, and the Suintec had been stuck in a holding pattern for two hours waiting for a landing slot. But everything had now been sorted out, and Quiller was finally bringing the freighter down toward the Whitestone City spaceport. Any particular approach you'd like me to use? He asked Jade as they came in low over the city. There's enough slack in their lanes for me to wander a little to one side or the other if you want. Just hold to the center, she said, gazing out at the mosaic of buildings and streets below from Lorone's usual position in the co-pilot's seat. We're too far from the palace to see anything useful, and there's no point in drawing attention to ourselves. Hold it, Lorone said, leaning over Jade's shoulder as something caught his eye. Is that a stormtrooper station over there? Where? There, Laron said. He pointed, his arm brushing Jade's hair as he did so. Fortunately, she didn't seem to notice. That white octagon tucked in between bays 35 and 36. Does look like one, doesn't it? Jade agreed. It's not on the maps I was given. Interesting. Must be a recent add-on, Quiller said. Maybe Pharaohs figured the spaceport wasn't secure enough and wanted to put more firepower at the scene. Or else it's not the spaceport itself but the environs he's concerned about, Marcross suggested from beside Laron. If that's not a slum down there, it's working very hard to become one. Either way, the station's worth checking out, Laron said. Watching how they handle shifts and patrol patterns should give us some idea of how they're organized which should give us a better chance of slipping ourselves into the rotation. In case that's what you decide you want us to do, Marcross added. Sounds reasonable, Jade agreed. No armor, we want to keep this low profile. Understood, Laron said. Will you be coming with us? Jade shook her head. I'll take one of the land speeders and head over to the nicer part of town. See if Pharaohs has added any extra stormtrooper stations near the palace. Fifteen minutes later they were down. Customs procedures consisted of a few questions, a perfunctory glance at each of their false IDs, and an equally perfunctory warning about not causing trouble. Plus a docking fee, of course, with enough extra padding around the usual rate that Laron was pretty sure the inspector was using it to supplement his salary. Under other circumstances, that kind of blatant graft would probably have caused him and the others to take a closer look at the customs system, with an eye towards seeing how far the corruption had spread. But with possible treason lurking in the governor's palace, customs fraud was pretty low on the priority list. Jade already had her bag packed, and as soon as the customs man left she headed off in the nicer of the Sowentek's two land speeders weaving her way expertly through the crowds of pedestrians and the booths and ramshackle homes that lined most of the streets. Laron and the others left the bay on foot and headed toward the stormtrooper station. The streets were noisy, echoing with a dozen different languages as well as basic, the latter ranging from almost cultured to badly mangled. There were many species represented, including at least two Laron wasn't familiar with. Sales booths of all sorts lined the streets, adding cooking aromas and the additional noise of hawkers to the scene. And all this guy can think about is making deals with traitors. Grave muttered from Laron's side as they passed a particularly squalid-looking homestead that seemed to have been built entirely from packing crates. Can't really blame the rebellion for this, Brightwater murmured back. 
At least not all of it. I've seen slums this bad on Coruscant. I wasn't blaming anyone but Pharaohs, Graves said. If you accept the position of governor, part of your job is to make sure all your people have a decent shot at making something good out of their lives. Quiller cleared his throat. Speaking of the rebellion, he said, Did anyone else notice the YT-1300 transport sitting in Bay 40 on our way in? Loron eyed him, the back of his neck tingling. There were plenty of old whiteys still kicking around the Empire. But the way Quiller had said that. Solo's ship? Solo? Brightwater echoed. Here? Not sure, Quiller said. We were too far away for a positive visual, and I didn't want to key in a cone scan, not with Jade sitting right there watching. Why not? Marcross asked. Solo's a rebel. If he's here, that pretty well confirms that Pharaoh's a traitor. Hey, I don't even know that it was Solo, Quiller protested. Even if it was, there could be all sorts of reasons why he's here that have nothing to do with Pharaoh's. He's right, Laurent said firmly, jumping in before the argument could pick up any more momentum. They'd ended up working with Solo a few months back along with his Wookiee co-pilot and the young would-be Jedi Luke Skywalker. Things had worked out well enough, but it wasn't an experience that Laron was eager to repeat. And it probably wouldn't have been even if the three of them weren't rebels. Besides, passing judgment, of any sort, isn't our job. That's Jade's end of the deal. What if we actually spot Solo here? Marcross asked. Do we tell her about it? I think we have to, Graves said. Our job is support, and intel is part of that. I agree, Laron said reluctantly. Just because he wouldn't want to work with Solo again didn't mean he wanted him handed over to the tender mercies of Imperial security, either. Though before we do, we should try to get his side of whatever's going on. Assuming he'll even talk to us. Brightwater pointed out. Considering that we are Imperials again. Very unofficially, Laron reminded him, frowning. Half a block ahead, the normal traffic flow had been interrupted by a knot of people standing and looking at something happening on the right-hand side of the street. Even as the five stormtroopers moved toward it, other passers-by were stopping to join the onlookers. Marcross had spotted it, too. Some kind of street performance? He suggested. Too quiet, Graves said. I'm guessing we'll find a dead body or two over there. Or someone about to get that way, Laron said, grimacing. Blasters weren't exactly uncommon out here, but in keeping with her low-profile plan, Jade had ordered them to stick with holdout blasters which were much easier to conceal than their standard Blastec DH-17 sidearms. Unfortunately, holdout blasters were also a lot less powerful than the DH-17s, both in rate of fire and in total number of shots per Tibana charge. If there was trouble up there, they could quickly find themselves at a dangerous firepower disadvantage. There was nothing to do but give it a try. Line spread penetration, Laron ordered, making sure his holdout blaster was within easy reach. Let's see what's going on. They reached the edge of the crowd. Laron picked a likely spot and started easing his way through the press, the other stormtroopers continuing on to make their own insertions at other places down the line where they would all be within covering positions of one another. Laron reached the last line of onlookers, pried open a small gap between a Radian and a Deveronian and stepped to the inside of the circle. Three meters in front of him were four aliens, burgundy-feathered beings of a species Laron didn't recognize. Their faces, and the blasters gripped in their hands, were pointed toward three aliens sporting green scales and fur tufts, who were themselves standing behind three more of the feathered aliens, the whole crowd of them under the canopy of a rough, open-fronted store made of shipping crates and scrap metal. 
Laron's first thought was that the greenies were hiding behind the feathers. But then he spotted the knife in one of the greenies' hands. Each of them had a knife. He saw now, wicked, hook-tipped weapons that they were holding firmly against the feathers' throats. The greenies weren't hiding behind the feathers. They were using them as living shields. I will pay back the price, one of the greenies was saying as Laron arrived. But not at the point of a weapon. You will pay back and double, snarled one of the armed feathers facing him. On the last word he took a quick step to his left, probably hoping to shift position far enough to get a clear shot over his compatriot's shoulder. The greenies turned in response, rotating their captive feathers the necessary few degrees to keep them in the armed feathers' lines of fire. The other armed feathers tried stretching their line, but quickly retreated into their original clump as two more knife-wielding greenies at the edges of the crowd silently warned them back. You will pay triple, the feather spokesman bid out. And a life each for any harmed by you. I will pay the price only, the greenie said firmly. And you will not harm our defenseless. Laron grimaced as he belatedly spotted the small group of greenies crouched together in a close huddle in the shadow of the store behind the knife holders. Several of them appeared to be adults, though of a slightly smaller build and with fewer patches of green fur among the green scales. The rest were much smaller versions, clearly children. A motion to Laron's left caught his eye, and he looked over to see Marcross slip into view at the front of the far end of the crowd. The other three stormtroopers, he noted, were also standing by. Laron took a deep breath. What seems to be the problem here? he asked, taking a step toward the confrontation. One of the armed feathers turned to face him, his blaster swiveling to point at Laron's chest. Be gone, human, he ground out. This concerns not you. Justice concerns everyone, Laron said, keeping his hands motionless at his sides. There was a risk, he knew, that the alien would just shoot him and be done with it. But while the feathers were clearly angry, they didn't seem crazy enough to open fire on perfect strangers in front of a hundred witnesses. Did these people rob you? He sold me a knife. The feather spokesman growled over his shoulder, his eyes still on the greeny spokesman. The knife broke. I demand a proper return of the cost. Sounds reasonable enough, Laron agreed, looking at the greenies. Do you refuse? Our knives do not break under proper usage, the greeny spokesman insisted. If I am to return his cost, I must have the broken knife in return so that I may examine it and discover its flaws. Yet the knife did break, the feather insisted. His statement insults my honor and my word. He thus demands twice his cost, the greeny added. Such a burden we cannot afford to pay. I see. Laron gestured to the greenies' living shield arrangement. Tell me how this happened. They came in with weapons and loud demands, the greenie said. We feared for our defenseless. They demanded we leave without return of the cost, the feather said. I asked that they sheathe their weapons while we spoke of the matter, the greenie countered. They attacked us with their cursed knives. They threatened our defenseless. Yes, all right, Laron said, raising his voice to be heard. He'd had to deal with this sort of thing any number of times back in his official days as a stormtrooper. With aliens, especially unknown aliens, it really could be as simple and straightforward as competing, horn-locked honors. Enough. Show me the broken knife. There was just the slightest pause. I do not have it, the feather said stiffly. Laron grimaced. Or, it could be that one of the two sides was trying to cheat the other. Why not? He asked. Where is it? It is not here, the feather said, his anger level starting to ratchet up again. When I have received twice the cost, I will return it. 
but not until the money is in my hand. Sorry, but it doesn't work that way, Laron told him. You give me the broken knife, and I'll have the merchant return the money you paid for it. Double the cost. Laron shook his head. It doesn't work that way either. The feather snarled something in a clickety-sounding language. The one holding the blaster on Laron took a step toward him, raising the weapon to point at Laron's face. There was the short, sharp crack of a blaster. With a warbling screech, the feather lurched forward, his right leg collapsing beneath him as Graves' shot expertly grazed the outside of his knee joint. Laron was ready, taking another quick step forward and twisting the blaster from the alien's suddenly slack grip. Turning it around into firing position, he leveled it at the other three armed feathers. Weapons down, he ordered. The three feathers started to turn, stopping abruptly as Graves sent a warning shot into the ground between them and Laron. For a moment they froze, their blasters hanging halfway between Laron and their original greeny targets. Then the feather spokesman clicked again and all three slowly returned their blasters to their cross-chest holsters. Thank you, Laron said. He turned his borrowed blaster onto the greenies and their living shields. Your turn. Weapons down. The spokesman murmured something, and the greenies released their grips on the feathers. As the former hostages stepped hastily away, the knives similarly vanished into sheaths. Thank you. Laron said, turning back to the feathers. Now. The broken knife, if you please. It is not here, the feather growled. I said that already. Yes, I forgot, Laron said. Fine. We can all go back to your place and get it. He lifted the blaster slightly. You'll go under guard, of course, with your hands and binders. Just as a precaution. Even without knowing the species and their facial expressions, Laron had no doubt the glare the feather sent him was one of pure hatred. But Laron also had no doubt that someone who'd played the honor card as proudly as this one had would do anything to avoid being marched through crowded streets looking like a criminal. It is here, he growled reluctantly, reaching into a side pocket in his tunic and pulling out a duplicate of the knives the greenies had just sheathed. Or rather, pulling it halfway out of the pocket. There he stopped, with only the hilt and half the blade showing. Mentally, Laron shook his head. Just as he'd suspected. Thank you, he said, stepping forward past the feather still squirming on the ground. He got a grip on the knife hilt, and as the feather released it he pulled it the rest of the way out of the other's pocket. As he did so, he took a casual step to his left, interposing his sleeve between the knife and the watching crowd. Yes, I see, he said, nodding sagely at the perfectly intact blade as he lowered his arm to his side, concealing the knife between his sleeve and his thigh. He turned to the greenies. I have the knife, he confirmed. You will now return to him the cost. For a moment the greenie spokesman eyed him in silence. Then, also in silence, he stepped forward. Drawing some coins from a pouch at his waist, he handed them to the feather. And now honor and justice are both satisfied, Laron said. All may go about their business. He turned to look at the ring of onlookers. All may go, he said firmly. Slowly, as if disappointed that the show was over, the crowd began to break up. Laron glanced over at the feather whom Grave had shot, who had been helped to his feet and was leaning on one of his compatriots, then turned to the head feather. Don't come back, he warned quietly. The Empire takes a very dim view of cheats and would-be thieves. The feather glared at him, his cheek feathers ruffling. What is the Empire? He spat. The Empire is the ground on which you're standing. Laron told him. More important, if you come back, the knife merchants will probably tell everyone else that you tried to cheat them. The feather's glare slipped, just a bit. 
They may say so regardless. I'll encourage them not to, Laron said. The ruffled feathers smoothed out. I stand in your debt, he muttered, almost too softly for Laron to hear. You're welcome, Laron told him. You can repay the debt by leaving the merchant and his people alone. The feather drew himself up. Our weapon? He demanded, holding out his hand. Laron considered. Then, reversing his borrowed blaster, he handed it over. Remember what I said. I am not likely to forget. The feather made a sharp gesture to his companions and gave some more clickety orders. With baleful looks at Laron, the whole group turned their backs on him in unison and stalked away. Graves stepped to Laron's side. Well, that went well, he said drilly. You probably shouldn't have given him back his blaster. If they want trouble, one weapon's difference isn't likely to slow them down, Laron said. Besides, it's better to leave them completely in our debt. Yes, they strike me as a little like Yuzum, Brightwater commented as he joined them. Quick-tempered, but with a strict code of honor. That was my impression, too, Laron agreed. I tried to trade his debt to me for a promise to leave our knife makers alone. We'll see if it works. What debt? Marcross asked as he and Quiller came up. This, Laron said, showing them the unbroken knife. Come on, let's return it to its proper owners. The Greenies were still standing in a row in front of their defenseless, their hands ready on their sheathed knives as they watched the feathers disappear into the pedestrian traffic. Behind them, though, the females and children had gotten to their feet and were starting hesitantly to return to their activities. Thank you, the head greenie said as the stormtroopers came up to them. We are in your debt. No problem, Laron assured him. I'm glad we could help. He reversed the knife and extended the hilt toward him. Here's your property. The greenie gave a wet-sounding snort as he saw the unbroken blade. As I suspected, he said contemptuously. You should have exposed his fraud for all to see. It's always a good idea to leave people with something more to lose, Laron said as the other took the weapon. And his claims certainly aren't likely to damage your business, Brightwater added. I've seen many blades in my travels, and yours is exceptionally well crafted. Your kindness is most welcome, the greenie said. I am Vantar, leader of this small group of Trukri. I stand in your debt. No problem, Laron said. I'm Laron. These are Brightwater, Grave, Marcross, and Quiller. I don't think I've ever seen people of your sort before, Marcross said. Where are you from? There, Vanta said, gesturing toward the sky. From the stars you call the unknown regions. We fled here in hope from the ravages of a terrible enemy. His small, white-rimmed eyes narrowed. An enemy we fear may soon assail us here, as well. Laron frowned. Jade hadn't said anything about alien threats being part of this operation. Who is this enemy? He asked. They are a group of beings, some allies, some slaves, Vantar said. They attack and destroy under the orders of an evil creature named Warlord Nuso Esva. What sort of being is he? Marcross asked. Is he one of the feathered people who were just here? The Pinneth? Vantar's eyes flashed with contempt. No, Nuso Esva is not Pinneth. Though perhaps the Pinneth have now joined him. They are the sort of foul-minded creatures he would use to his advantage. Especially here, in the mud and fear that is this world. Do you know anything else about him? Laron asked. His species, or what he looks like. Vantar gave a furtive glance over his shoulder at the females and children. I have seen only the dark challenge he sends before each of his attacks, 
he said in a low voice. He is constructed similarly to you, but with his covering surface smooth and soft and shimmering like a rainbow. His covering? Grave asked, tapping the back of his hand. You mean his skin? His skin, yes, Vantar said. His head covering is arranged similarly to yours, but the tendrils are much longer and are pure black. His eyes are, I do not know the word. They are bright yellow and give off many small reflections. Multifaceted, like an insect's? Bright water suggested. He pulled out his data pad and punched up a picture of a noan. Like this? Like but unlike, Vanter said, nodding at the picture. Nuso Esva's eyes are smaller, and lie nestled within the head like yours or mine, instead of being on the outside as this creature's are. Laron looked at the others. Any of this sounding familiar? Not to me, Brightwater said, putting the data pad back into his pocket. Me either, Graves said. I would have said near human until he mentioned the eyes. Now I'm not so sure. Of course, if he's from the unknown regions, it's not unreasonable that we've never run into his species before, Brightwater pointed out. True, Laron said. I was hoping he was someone from the Empire playing conquest games. Nusso Esva plays no games, Vantar said darkly. He conquers and he destroys. You said you were afraid he would be coming here, Quiller said. Why here? Is there something in the Pwn system of particular value? Vantar gave a whistling sigh. What does any warlord find of value in new territory? He wishes only to conquer, to hold, and to exploit. That is all that matters to such beings. He lowered his eyes. He was preparing to conquer or destroy our own world when we fled, he said quietly. To this day, we do not know which was its fate. Well, if he tries to show his face here, he's going to be in for a surprise. Quiller assured him. I doubt he's got anything that could take on an Imperial Star Destroyer. I pray that you are correct, Vantar said. I have seen his legacy of destruction. I do not wish to see more of it. Nor do any of the rest of us, Laron told him. Try not to worry, he gestured to the others. In the meantime, we need to move along. Again, we are in your debt, Vantar said. He hesitated, balancing the knife Laron had given him across the dog-like pads on parts of his palm and finger joints. Then, as if suddenly coming to a decision, he flipped the weapon around and held the hilt out toward Laron. In gratitude for your aid, he said. I'm honored, Laron said. But there's no need. Our honor and pleasure is in the helping of others. As our honor and pleasure is in paying our debts, Vantar said, still holding out the knife. Laron looked at Brightwater. The other was gazing unblinkingly at the knife. Practically salivating over it, in fact. Then we accept with thanks, Laron said, taking the weapon. Silently. One of the other trukri stepped forward and handed Laron a matching sheath of some sort of tooled leather. Thank you again, Laron said, sliding the knife into the sheath. It fits snugly, yet at the same time was surprisingly easy to draw. Farewell and take care. He gestured, and the stormtroopers resumed their journey toward the stormtrooper station. Here, Laron said, handing the sheath knife to Brightwater. Early Transland Day present. Enjoy. Oh, I couldn't, Brightwater protested. Yes, he could, Quiller said drilly. Come on, buddy. Take it before your eyes fall out of their sockets. Well, if you insist, Brightwater said, taking it almost reverently and sliding it out of its sheath for another look. First an antique drug it, and now this, Graves said. How come Brightwater gets all the good stuff? 
It's my kind face and generous personality, Brightwater said, tucking the knife into his belt at the small of his back and pulling the edge of his tunic down over it. Yes, that must be it, Marcross agreed. Any of you ever hear Jade mention this Nusso as the character? Or any other threat in this area besides the rebellion? She didn't say anything to me, Graves said. Brightwater? You were with her the longest. If you can call floating in her back to tank being with her, Brightwater said. And no, I didn't hear anything. But we'll hear plenty if we don't get some data on the Stormtrooper station by tonight, Larone warned. Playtime over, gentlemen. Let's get back to work. One of the first discoveries of PLN Major's original settlers had been a long line of large mounds one to two hundred meters tall, which when sliced open yielded rich loads of a hard, white, crystalline stone that was both highly decorative and strong enough to build with. Decades later, when the double planet first joined the Old Republic, that bit of their early history had been honored by constructing the governor's palace out of that same white stone and setting it in front of and slightly beneath the last, partially mined mound, which at that time had marked the edge of Whitestone City. The effect, visitors to the city all agreed, was striking. Some saw the gouged-out mound as an oddly shaped breaking wave of pure white water that had frozen in midair, its crest towering over the palace. Others, focusing on the view from straight on, saw it as a scaled-up version of the falling star domes that were a prominent style of souvenir sold at virtually every tourist spot in the empire. Standing at the window of her sixth-floor room in the Huntry Hotel, two blocks from the glittering white mound and palace, Mara wondered if Pole Major gift shops had such falling star domes of the scene for sale. Almost certainly they did. Taking one last trinberry from the room's fruit bowl and popping it into her mouth, she went back to the chair she'd placed two meters back from the window and sat down. She'd had a falling star dome once, she remembered. Most of her childhood was vague and shadowy, but she distinctly remembered the trouble she'd gotten into when she broke and opened the dome to find out what made the falling star streaks when it was shaken. Breaking into cheap plastic souvenir domes was easy. Breaking into Governor Farrell's palace was going to be considerably more difficult. She switched on her special electro binoculars and focused again on the palace. The wall that encircled most of the Empire's palaces had here been truncated into an arc, running from one edge of the mound cut out to the other. The mound itself took the place of the rest of the wall. The grounds enclosed by the mound and wall were more oval than circular, with the main open areas to the right and left of the palace. Mara couldn't see much of either area from her current vantage point but from the Emperor's data she knew there were formal gardens on one side and an outdoor theater and small fragrance jungle on the other. The mound itself rose a good fifty meters above the palace, and in fact the tip of the crest overhung the rear third of the building. Normally, that would suggest the possibility of a rappelling incursion. In this case, though, it was such an obvious approach that Pharaohs or his predecessors had taken special care to close it off. At least half of the unobtrusive wall-mounted lasers were aimed up and inward, their swivels blocked to keep them from firing down into the compound itself but more than capable of picking off someone dropping spider-like from a rappelling line. Not that a potential infiltrator would find it easy to get into rappelling position in the first place. The mound's base was patrolled by scout troopers on speeder bikes, who flew regular patrols that covered all approaches to the rear and sides of the mound. Most of the time the speeder bike stopped where the compound's wall met the mound and turned back to circle the other way, but occasionally a trooper would continue on, cutting close alongside the wall and swooping past the gate, then continuing around to the mound's other side. The sheer randomness of those extra circuits made it impossible to predict when an opening in the pattern would take place, which made getting to the mound, let alone climbing it, problematic at best. The wall itself was just as bad. It was a good five meters tall, with six watchtowers spaced out along it, each of which was occupied by at least three guards at all times. 
The wall was set back about 50 meters from the major street that ran past the front of the palace and compound, sitting across a wide paved road spur that led from the street to the gate. Two pairs of guards stood at the gate, which was opened only when vehicles were entering or leaving. The outer part of the wall was patrolled by four pairs of stormtroopers, and Mara had no doubt there were more walking the inside perimeter as well. She hadn't yet seen the nighttime routine, but the security would undoubtedly be tightened as darkness fell across the city. More stormtroopers and armed patrollers moved among the shops and residence areas of the city sector nearest the palace, undoubtedly trained to spot signs of brewing trouble. Mara had breached high security walls before, either climbing them or using her lightsaber to cut through them. But such tricks usually required a guard corps that had been lulled by routine into negligence. The fact that Pharaohs was using stormtroopers to supplement the palace guard corps strongly implied that Mara would find no such negligence, which left only the gate itself. She focused her electro binoculars on it. The structure was as tall as the rest of the wall, decorated with intricate bar reliefs highlighting some of Poln Major's historical events. To one side was a narrow personnel door, barely big enough for a fully armored stormtrooper to pass through and thus impossible for a gang or mob to effectively rush. From what little she could see as the outside guard was being changed, it looked like the door also included a weapon and energy source scanner. The four guards currently posted at the gate were dressed in an elaborate blue and red livery, probably, like the bar reliefs, something from Poln Major's distant past. They weren't wearing any armor, but when the wind blew just right Mara could briefly see the slight bulges of blasters concealed beneath their capelets. There were no outside controls for the gate. One of the guards had to call inside via comlink whenever a speeder truck or other vehicle came up requesting entrance. The oval shape of the compound meant that the gate was also the closest part of the wall to the palace, probably no more than 50 meters away from the main entrance. Vehicles with proper authorization were allowed inside without any fuss, but Mara could see as the gate closed that each was then stopped between the wall and the palace for a search. With her electro-binoculars audio capabilities, she'd also eavesdropped on the guards' orders to the inside gatekeepers, and it was clear that a system of rolling passwords was in use. Clearly, no one was getting in without a battalion of armored troops or invitation from someone already inside. And a governor presumably engaged in treason was unlikely to throw his gate wide to visiting officials, media personalities, art dealers, or dignitaries from minor worlds. But he might open the gate to a criminal. Or at least his guards might. Returning her electro binoculars to their case, Mara left her room and headed downstairs. There was an open air tap calf, she noted, across the main street from the wall and a little way down from the gate itself. Time for a little experiment. The tap calf was doing brisk business but Mara was able to find a small table to herself out on the patio facing the palace grounds. She ordered a half-flute of one of the local brandies and for a few minutes sipped it as she watched the flow of humans and aliens along the walkway between her and the street. She would have preferred to try this with another palace-authorized vehicle in place, but for the first fifteen minutes no such vehicle came along. She had just concluded that she was going to have to make do without that added embellishment when a speeder truck with a baker's logo turned onto the spur and headed in toward the gate. Mara sat up straighter in her chair, her eyes flicking back and forth as she looked for a likely target. Approaching from her right, in the lane closest to the spur, was an open-top land speeder with a teenage girl driving, the wind whipping through her hair. The vehicle flashed past Mara and started to pass the spur. Stretching out to the force, Mara twisted the land speeder's control wheel hard over to the right. The land speeder spun onto the spur, weaving and bobbing with interrupted inertia as it made the turn. Even at her distance Mara could see the girl's panic as she wrestled with her suddenly rogue vehicle, trying to turn it off its new path. Mara kept a tight force grip on the wheel, 
noting out of the corner of her eye that the gate was just starting to open to admit the speeder truck. The teen, apparently only now spotting the truck directly in her path, abandoned her attempts to steer and stomped with all her weight on the brakes. She just made it. The land speeder bobbed to a stop bare centimeters away from the speeder truck's rear crash plate. And as the gate hastily closed again in front of the truck, all four of the liveried guards arrowed in on the land speeder, their concealed blasters drawn and pointed at the hapless girl. The near accident and resulting drama had already caused traffic on the street to grind almost to a halt as drivers slowed down, craning their necks to see what was happening. Some of the Tapcaf's patrons abandoned their drinks and stood up, the better to see over the creeping vehicles. Mara didn't bother. She already knew how standard guard procedure worked, the normal routine of checking vehicle registration and personal ID. All she cared about was what the guards would do once the first her protocols had been completed. She didn't have long to wait. Barely a minute after the guards arrived at the land speeder, the team was ordered out of the vehicle and marched over to the gate. The small side door had opened and a middle-aged man in a gray uniform was waiting there for her. They held a brief conversation, then the middle-aged man had another conversation on his comm link. A few minutes later two more gray uniformed men emerged from the side door and headed over to the land speeder. The liveried guard stayed with the team, moving her a few meters away from the gate and door and standing her out of the way beside the wall. Peering over the still sluggish traffic, Mara saw the two gray-suited guards move the land speeder off the road and then pop open the engine compartment. A minute later, the gate finally opened again and the speeder truck was allowed through. Mara nodded to herself. So a minor infraction, even a mysterious one, would only earn the perpetrator a talking to outside the wall. It would presumably take a more serious threat to get hauled inside for more thorough questioning. Fortunately, serious threats were one of Mara's specialties. She finished her drink, left a pile of credits that included a generous tip, and headed off into the market section that extended several blocks away from the palace compound. In the center of the market section, tucked away between the cantinas and legal offices, was a small electronic store. The sales clerk was a male verpine, two meters of bipedal insectoid sheer and technological enthusiasm who would probably have described everything in the store in minute detail had Mara given him half a chance. Fortunately, she knew what she wanted, and ten minutes later she left with a child's model airspeeder and the toy's remote controller unit, plus a few other inexpensive electronic components. She returned to the hotel, spent a few minutes flying the airspeeder around the room to check it out, then set it aside and pulled out her comm link. Report. She ordered when Larone answered. We've done a preliminary check, the stormtrooper told her. Assuming this station runs on the same protocols and procedures as the palace contingent, I think we've got a pretty good handle on how to deal with them. Good, Mara said. Get back to the ship, load your gear into the speeder truck, and get over here. I'll meet you at the ICU Tapcaf across from the palace in two hours. I also want you to pull a record of all ships that have entered or left the system in the past three days. Acknowledged, Laron said. Any equipment in particular you want us to bring? Everything you'll need for an incursion, Mara told him. I'll give you the plan tonight after we eat. Tomorrow morning, we're going in. The double planet drifting across the starfield ahead did not, in Pelian's opinion, have anything particularly noteworthy about it. Aside, of course, from the relative novelty of it being a double planet in the first place. But apart from that there was nothing. The number of spaceships moving in and out was nothing like the traffic around Imperial Center or Corellia, either in quantity nor in the size and sheer opulence of the vehicles involved. The power grid map showed large areas of Pole Major still relatively undeveloped, and much of Pole Minor to be virtually uninhabited. The Golan defense platform orbiting Pole Major was more than half deserted, 
with barely 30% of its weapons still powered. A single dreadnought, the Sarisa, circled Pole Minor, and was even less functional than the Golan. All in all, the place was practically the definition of a galactic back planet, which made it a perfect place for rebels and alien warlords to meet in secret and seduce an imperial governor from his sworn duty. There was a footstep behind him, and Pelian turned to see Captain Drews and striding down the command walkway. So that's the place. The captain rumbled as he came to a halt beside Pelian. Not much to look at, is it? No, sir, it isn't. Pelian agreed. I wonder how long it's been since they've had a Star Destroyer pay a visit. If they've ever had one here at all, Drusan said. A shame we can't give them more of a show. See those eight ships over there, the ones cutting across the Sarissa's bow on their way into Pone Minor? What do you make of them? Pelian peered out the viewport, resisting the temptation to look at the tactical display or call for a Comscan readout. Drusan obviously wanted to see what he could see by himself. The three big ones are Gallifrey Yard's GR-75 transports, he said. The other five are probably Corellian light freighters of some sort. I can't tell which model from this distance. Anything unusual about their formation? Pelian gave the rest of the traffic pattern a quick look for comparison. Not really, he said. There's still enough mining on Pole Miner for transports that size to make stops, both to bring in new equipment and supplies and to take out finished product. Reasonable enough, Drusan said. What if I also told you that Comskin reports all the ships are heavily armed? Heavily enough to be skirting the law, in fact. That would raise my suspicions enough to take a closer look, Pelian said. But there are also a large number of smuggler and pirate gangs operating from this system. Even a legitimate operation would need to arm both its transports and its escort ships or risk attack and capture. He pointed. And the fact that they're moving past the Sarisa instead of avoiding it implies that they are, in fact, legitimate. Yes, that's the crowning subtlety, isn't it? Drew San agreed grimly. But in this case, appearances are deceiving. Lord Odo has informed me that those are, in fact, Rebel Alliance ships. Pelian felt his throat tighten. If the rebels had brought in that much carrying capacity, they must be expecting to obtain a great deal of material from their coming deal with Nuso Esva. Material, or soldiers. And the fact that the Sarisa was letting them skim right past its turbolasers was a strong indication that Odo was also right about Governor Pharaoh's being involved. Do we take them now, sir? He asked Drusan. Or do we wait to see if they bring in more? Neither, Drusan said. Lord Odo has something else in mind. We'll take a leisurely pass by Pone Minor as if we just dropped out of hyperspace to recalibrate our course, and then head out. He paused. Into the unknown regions. Pelian felt his mouth drop open. The unknown regions? Don't worry, we won't be going very deep, Drusan assured him. Only a few hours. And we have full NAV data for the route we'll be taking. Perfectly safe. Pelian grimaced. Perfectly safe, except for all the possible dangers out there, from pirates, mercenaries, and aliens like Nuso Esva. May I ask the nature of our mission? Lord Odo was a bit vague on that point, Drew Sand conceded. I gather we're going to be delivering a bit of a surprise to one of Nuso Esva's attack squadrons. Ah, Pelian murmured. By ourselves? We're an Imperial Star Destroyer, Commander Pelian, Drusen said, his voice darkening. We don't need anyone's help to bring the Empire's strength and order to bear. On anyone. Yes, sir, Pelian said, ducking his head. My apologies. Yes, Drusen said. And we'll hardly be alone. Senior Captain Thrawn and the Admonitor are also out there 
and Lord Odo assures me we'll be joining with them somewhere along the way. And Senior Captain Thrawn is no doubt aware of our imminent arrival? Someone's certainly aware, Drusan said. If not Thrawn, then who? Pelian nodded. He'd also seen the reports from security about Odo's use of the Chimera's holonet transmitter to send messages to someone in either wild space or the unknown regions. Who indeed? He agreed. Which still left them traveling into an unknown situation, going up against an unknown enemy with unknown resources. Only now they would have the dubious assistance of another star destroyer and a small flotilla of smaller warships, under the command of an alien officer who was apparently so poor at the fleet's political games that he kept getting kicked off Imperial Center and booted out into the unknown regions. All of it on the orders of someone whose full plans they still didn't know. Still, it was the Emperor himself who had given Odo his orders. Presumably, he knew what he was doing. Helm? Drusen called, interrupting Pelian's thoughts. Sir? The Helm officer answered briskly. Complete our observation arc past Pole Minor, then take us out, Drusen ordered. Course as per Lord Odo's data card. Yes, sir. Drew San smiled tightly at Pelian. Cheer up, Commander, he said. We're going hunting. Cardas looked up from the sensor display. They're rebel transports, all right, he confirmed. And those armed Corellian freighters are their escort. Thrawn nodded. How well armed are they? Cardas snorted. I'm sure they're doing their best. Knowing rebels, they'll probably put up a decent fight. Yes, Thrawn said. Let's hope they don't simply compute the odds and slink away. Cardas shrugged noncommittally. Thrawn didn't think much of the rebels he knew. More than that, his study of the Republic had given him a dim view of any governing body that relied on the consensus of dozens of species each of which had its own way of thinking about the universe and one another. In Thrawn's view, a strong, unified government was the only way the galaxy would survive against the shadowy alien threat moving across the galaxy. A threat that had already touched his space and would someday reach the Empire. Cardas understood Thrawn's thinking on the subject, and on one level he could certainly agree. While Thrawn had been pushing against governmental inertia in the Chiss Ascendancy, Cardas had lived through the chaotic middle of the Separatist movement and the Clone Wars. He'd seen the damage a hundred species with a hundred private agendas could do. On the other hand, only a fool could believe that the Empire under Palpatine was doing a better job in the Unity Department than the Republic had. So what's next? He asked, mostly to change the subject. I need to contact my agent on Pole Major, Thrawn said. Once I've had his report, we'll be ready to leave. To the unknown regions, Cardas said, grimacing. For him, the unknown regions didn't exactly hold fond memories. Yes, Thrawn said. Nuso Esva will certainly be there. We need to be, too. To make sure his game fails? On the contrary, Thrawn said softly. To make sure it succeeds. The Pole Miner atmosphere was thin, dank, and, especially at night, cold. Very cold. Leia had never really liked cold all that much, and as she stood on the rocky ground of Pole Miner's surface she could practically feel ice forming on her eyebrows. But at the moment, the cold was the farthest thing from her mind. The Star Destroyer was leaving. You sure? Kraken asked from beside her. Very sure, Leia said, pressing her electro-binoculars to her eyes and trying not to accidentally nudge her breath mask. It's pulling away. There it goes. She lowered the electro-binoculars. It just made the jump to hyperspace. Kraken heaved a sigh. That, he said 
was way too close. Leia nodded soberly. Any agreements Axlon had made with Governor Pharaohs would hardly be honored by other Imperials. And the unexpected arrival of a Star Destroyer, even for a brief time, was definitely a cause for concern. I wonder if someone suspects something. I'm sure somebody does, Kraken said, still gazing out at the stars. Pharaohs can't possibly have hidden this deal from everyone. The real question is whether that someone has managed to get Imperial Center's attention. With a corrupt governor at the center of it, I'd say that's likely, Leia said. I wonder if we should take what we've got and get out while we can. Kraken scratched his cheek. I don't know, he said. We haven't even gotten all the cold weather gear together, let alone all those nice T-47s. I'd hate to leave all that behind for no reason. If it is for no reason, Leia warned. Still, if Imperial Center had any serious suspicions, that Star Destroyer should at least have stayed long enough to do some spot checks. Maybe it really had just been passing through. Axelon's supposed to meet Pharaohs tomorrow morning. Maybe he can find out what that was all about. I'll call and have him put that on the agenda, Kraken said. Meanwhile, it might be a good idea to bring in more firepower. At least enough to hold off any attack while we get the transports out. Leia winced. The idea of putting even more of the Alliance's precious ships at risk here than they already had sent warning shivers through her. But Kraken was right. Losing the gallo-free transports let alone the goods that were being loaded aboard them, would be a devastating blow to the Alliance's ability to move people and equipment around the Empire. All right, but nothing too obvious, she said. No cruisers or frigates. I'll keep it down to X-Wings and maybe a couple of gunships, Kraken promised. I just wish I knew how well armed the Dreadnought and Golan are. The way Imperial Center prioritizes things, I'm guessing both are being held together by hopes and curses. But there's no way to know for sure unless one of them actually opens fire on us. Which we really don't want happening, Leia agreed. An odd idea flicked across her mind. Do you know where Han is? Solo? I assume he's back on Pole Major. Kraken raised his eyebrows where you sent him three days ago. With Han, getting an order isn't necessarily a guarantee of compliance, Leia pointed out. I was just thinking that some of the smugglers who hang out here must have gone head-to-head -head with either the Sarisa or the Golan over the years. Maybe we should bring Han back and see if he can sound out the locals for us. You want him here when Axlon's about to go into the palace? Kraken asked frowning at her over his breath mask. I thought you wanted him nearby in case Axlon needed a quick extraction. If Pharaohs hasn't pulled a double cross by now, I doubt he's going to, Leia said. Besides, it's not like Han is exactly in position for a quick rescue anyway. He's out at the spaceport, while Axlon's all the way across town in one of the hotels near the palace. I'll bet Solo's thrilled to death with that arrangement, Kraken said drilly. I've seen him happier, Leia conceded. Not sure I ever have, Kraken said with a grunt. But no, talking to the locals makes sense. You want me to give him his new orders? No, that's all right, Leia said reluctantly. Han had been a master at punching her switches almost since their first meeting aboard the Death Star, and he'd only gotten better at it over the past few months. But irritating though that might personally be for her, she'd also noted that he took orders from her better than he did from Rikin or anyone else. Not well, but better. I'll tell him. Hmm. She looked over. What? She demanded. Solo certainly got the capability, he said. He's proved that time and again. The question is whether he's got the will. 
Leia shook her head. That's entirely up to him. Is it? Crack encountered. I've noticed that you have an unusual level of influence over him. Even more than Skywalker does. If you pressed him, it might be enough to tip the balance. Leia grimaced behind her breath mask. You really want that to be his reason for becoming a full part of the Alliance? My pressure on him? This is war, princess, Kraken said bluntly. I've taken in deserters, fringe criminals, scoundrels, general all-around scum, he grimaced. Even former politicians. I mean to win this thing, by whatever means and with whatever levers I have to use to do it. He gestured to her. If you're not, he left the sentence unfinished. We'll win, Colonel, Leia said. But not by manipulating people. Certainly not the good ones. I admire your idealism, he said. I hope it doesn't backfire on you. Leia turned away, her eyes filling with sudden tears. Idealism was what had gotten her involved with the Rebel Alliance in the first place. It had cost her her reputation, her status, and her seat in the Senate. It had also cost her her home, her father, and nearly everything else she'd ever held dear. We'd better get back, she said over her shoulder. You need to call Axlon. And I need to call Han. There wasn't much floor space in the Falcon where a person could get a proper angry stomp going. But Han did his best with the result that both Luke and Chewie were already looking up as he came around the corner from the cockpit tunnel. What's happened? Luke asked anxiously. What else? Han growled, stomping a little more as he crossed over to where the two of them were sitting at the game board. Or maybe I should say who else? Luke winced. Leia? Like I said, who else? Han said, dropping onto the wraparound couch beside Chewie. Doesn't the Alliance know any other smugglers beside me? Chewie rumbled a suggestion. Come on, the rest of them can't be that untrustworthy, Han argued. Rekin wouldn't keep them around if they were. I think her worshipfulness just likes throwing things like this in our lap. What things? Luke asked. They want me to go back to Pwn Minor and mingle with the other riffraff, Han told him. See what I can find out about the weapon's readiness of the Golan and that dreadnought out there. I thought Pharaohs was on our side, Luke said, frowning. Why do we care about that? Chewie warbled a question. No, there's no sign of Nuso Esva's fleet, Han told him. If the guy even has one. At least nothing Leia told me about. So why do we care about the Golan and Sarisa? Luke persisted. How should I know? Han growled. There wasn't any point in worrying the kid about the Star Destroyer that had just passed through the Poland system. Especially not since it had already left. You know Kraken. He's not happy if he doesn't see at least three threats coming at him from different directions. I guess, Luke said, not sounding all that convinced. Mentally, Han shook his head. His lying technique must be slipping. But you know the military, he said, standing up. Even rebel militaries. Show up and do what you're told. I suppose, Luke said, standing up too. That's okay, go ahead and finish your game, Han said, waving him back. I'll take us out. Actually, I can't go, Luke said, looking pained. Axlon called me while you were talking to Leia. He's going into the palace tomorrow sometime to talk to Pharaohs and wants me standing by in case of trouble. Han frowned, the Star Destroyer visit again flashing to mind. He's more paranoid even than Kraken, he said. Tell him you've got better things to do than sit around and play nurse droid for him. Sorry, Luke said. I can't. Han grimaced. 
Yeah, I know. Show up and do what you're told. So where are you going to spend the night? In your Z-95? Luckily, no, Luke said. There's a hotel about a block from where Axlon's staying. He said he'd booked me a room there. A cheaper place than his? Probably, Luke said. I was going to finish the game first, but if you need to leave, I'll just grab my things and get going. Yeah, Han said. Well, watch yourself, okay? A brief frown creased Luke's forehead. But he just nodded. You too, he said, and headed over to the bunk where his small bag was stowed. Han looked back at Chewie. The big Wookiee was gazing knowingly at him. Han shook his head microscopically. They would discuss it after the kid left. Chewie nodded and busied himself with closing down the game. Then, heaving himself off the couch, he warbled a farewell to Luke and headed for the cockpit. Ten minutes later, with the falcon prepped and cleared, they headed out. And finally, Chewie asked what was going on. I don't know, Han told him. But strange stuff's starting to happen. I don't think this is going to work out as neatly as Axlon thought it would. Chewie muttered something under his breath. Nope, Han agreed. It never does, does it? With a sigh, Mara set her data pad on the desk. So that was it. A grand total of 30 rebel ships had landed on Pulm Major and Pulm Minor over the past three days, including 12 today alone, everything from Z-95 headhunters and thinly disguised T-65 X-wings all the way up to good-sized GR-75 transports. None of them had even been challenged, let alone stopped or boarded. And the orders to let them pass unexamined had come directly from the governor's palace. The emperor's information had been correct. Governor Farrows was a traitor. Mara stepped over to the window, a haze of sadness settling across her mood. Bider Farrows had been one of the best career politicians to come out of Imperial Center in the past ten years, the sort of person Mara always thought about when she heard whisperings from the galaxy's citizens about the oppressions visited on them by the Empire. With men like Farrows in power, she always argued to herself, whatever evils might have found their way into Palpatine's grand vision of unity and peace would sooner or later be rooted out. How could a man like Pharaohs fall so far and so quickly? It was incredible. And yet, somehow, it had happened. Or had it? Mara raised her eyes from the palace to the dome of white rock behind it, glittering faintly in the lights of the city. She hadn't proved Pharaoh's guilt. Not yet. All she'd proved was that someone high up in the palace was cooperating with the rebels. The most likely candidate was Pharaoh's, but it could also be General Yularno, the Defense Department's Captain Gretarine, or conceivably even one of Pharaoh's three senior staffers. No, Mara couldn't be absolutely sure Pharaoh's was the traitor until she'd gotten into the palace's own records and she couldn't do that until she was inside. Which would happen tomorrow. She gave the palace one final look, then opaqued the window and started to undress. She would go to bed now and get a good night's sleep. She would pretend that Pharaoh's was still loyal, and this was some serious misreading of the evidence on her part. Tomorrow, once she proved his treason beyond a glimmer of doubt, she would do her job and the Empire would be a better place for it. It was one of the truisms of the spacefaring life that spaceports seldom slept, and the farther they were from the local sun the less sleep they got. In general, Han had pretty much found that to be the case. He'd also added one more observational rule. When the spaceport was a long way from law and order and respectable people, it got even less sleep. Or none at all all of which meant that Pulm Miner's Dankamp village, half a kilometer underground and peopled almost entirely by smugglers, mercenaries, wanted criminals, and the people who served them, would probably be up all night. 
Certainly it hadn't shown any signs of slowing down during the three hours since he and Chewie had arrived in town, or during the half hour since they parked themselves at a table in this particular cantina and ordered yet another round of drinks. From one of the cantina's three entrances across the room came a burst of boisterous laughter. Han looked over as a group of men with identically cut beards, plus a Radian with an obviously fake one, strode into the room, all of them laughing over some joke. That joke possibly being the Rodian's beard. A distinct possibility. But Han's brief flicker of hope faded as they came all the way into the room and he got a good look at their sidearms. Most of them were carrying simple sporting blasters, with a couple of old Clone Wars, era DC 15s thrown in. Smugglers, or maybe a skimper or swoop gang. Scowling, he turned back to his drink. Chewie rumbled a question. Because they're smugglers, not mercs, Han told him patiently. And because asking questions gets you noticed. We don't want to be noticed until we're ready to get the answers we want, and then throw a burn it out of here. That means we have to wait until we find some mercs, who will know what happens if you run a big armed ship past the Golan and the Sarisa. Chewie growled again. How should I know? Han growled back. Okay, okay. If we don't spot someone in ten more minutes, we'll try that place we saw down the tunnel. If there's nothing there, we'll go find some other town. The big Wookiee muttered under his breath. Hey, don't blame me, Han protested. This was you-know-who's idea. What sort of someone are you looking for? A voice from Han's right asked in Duris. Han looked up. Aduros was standing there, a military-grade Blast Tech DH-17 belted at his side. Finally. The sword who knows how things work around here, Han told him. You a local, or just passing through? The Duros smiled, his small mouth curling just slightly upward at the corners. You don't remember me, do you? The skin on the back of Han's neck began to tingle. His Duris was pretty good, but he was only fair at reading Duros' facial expressions. This one was either amused or really really angry. Should I? He asked cautiously. I worked for Jabba the Hutt a long season ago, the Duros said. You are solo, are you not? Chewie rumbled warningly. Be of calm mind, the Duros said hastily, holding both hands up to the Wookiee. I have no longer a connection to the Hutt cartels, and have no interest in seeking the bounty I hear rests on your shoulders. Han grimaced. Even way out here, Jabba had managed to get the word out. Terrific. But others may not be so picky, he suggested. The Duro's eyes glittered. Be of calm mind, he said again. Many here have barely even heard of the huts, let alone have thoughts or compassion for them, he cocked his head. I, for one, find inspiration in finding others who have successfully slipped from Jabba's grasp. Glad to hear it, Han said. In that case, maybe you can help me. You're flying with mercs now, right? The Duros shook his head. A mercenary's life is not for you, Solo, he said firmly. Not unless you've learned better how to take orders. Not a lot, Han conceded what I was looking for. But there is easier money to be made this night, the Duros continued. Do you know how to mount and calibrate Kaldorf 7 interceptor missiles? Han felt his back stiffen. Kaldorf VIIs were medium-range heavy missiles, usually mounted on capital ships. The Alliance had a bunch of them, mostly on escort frigates and a few of their gunships. Sure, he said. I can mount them up anyway, he amended. I've got a buddy who knows how to calibrate them. What's up? I can point him out if he comes in if you choose. He cocked his head again. For, say, two hundred? 
Han leaned back in his seat. Seems kind of steep, he said. The price would of course include my personal recommendation of your skills and discretion. Your recommendation carries that kind of weight? Han asked. Several of my group have been already hired, the Duros said. But we leave tonight, and our experts depart with us. I assure you, the payment for the work will far exceed your payment to me. So you'll be taking off right past the Dreadnought and Golan, huh? Han asked. That's not a problem for you? The Duros waved a hand. May there is a threat he said. Do you wish me to point out the employer if he arrives? Han looked across the crowded cantina. Tell you what, he said. For five hundred, how about you go find him and bring him here? The Duros eyed him. Five hundred? Here's the upfront. Bring him here, and you'll get the rest. Very well. The Duros started to turn away. Han caught his arm. Of course, he added. If you try pulling some scam like bringing in one of your buddies to con me with a dip line, you'll answer to Chewie. Chewie rumbled, his voice even deeper than usual. There will be no game, the Duros promised. I already have Jabba watching the skies for me. I have no interest in you doing so as well. Good, Han said. Hurry back. The Duros nodded and headed briskly across the room toward the door. As he walked out into the large cavern that contained the bulk of the village, Han saw him pull out a calm link. Chewie gave a contemptuous snort. Of course he's just going to call around to his buddies until they find the guy for me, Han said, pulling out his own comm link. No one works any harder for their money than they have to. But it still buys us some time. At this hour, he expected Leia to be sound asleep. But if she was, it didn't show in her voice. You have something? She asked. Yeah, but not exactly what you're looking for, Han said. Do we have anyone here who can calibrate Kaldorf 7 interceptors? There was a short pause. Kaldorf VIs? Yes or no? Han growled. I've been offered a job mounting them, but I need someone who can calibrate the things, too. Yes, we have someone, Leia said. Who's this job for? No idea, Han said. But I figure you could probably undersling a Kaldorf 7 on an airspeeder without too much refitting. You mean like the T-47s we found in the cavern? Leia said doubtfully. I don't know. They're not really designed for that sort of thing. Well, somebody's trying to load them on something, Han said. If it's those T-47s, this might be our chance to find out who owns them. I suppose, Leia agreed. Where are you? Capperling's Cantina in Dankamp Village, Han told her. You need directions? We can find it, Leia said. How soon do you need someone? Five minutes ago, Han said. No way to know how long it'll take for my friend to find his contact and get back here. You have a friend here? You going to talk or are you going to get your tech over here? Han growled. We don't have time for this. Experts on the way, Leia assured him. I'm more interested in this so-called friend you conveniently found. He's more like a passing acquaintance, Han said. He's a Duros who used to work for Jabba's cartel, same as me. Really, Leia said suspiciously. 
Small universe. Big cartel, Han said. And if I were hiding out from Jabba, this is the kind of place where I'd do it, too. What if he's planning to turn you in for the bounty? Then he wouldn't have bothered offering me a job, Han said. No, I think his plan is to help me make a big enough stack of money that I can keep running. The more I'm out there drawing Jabba's attention, the less Jabba will be looking for him. Maybe, Leia said, still sounding suspicious. All right, wait there. Han clicked off the comm link, rolling his eyes. Wait here. Like he had anything else to do. Chewie, go check out that other room back there, will you? He said, nodding toward an archway that led off the side of the main bar. If the Duros is thinking about pulling an ambush, that's where they'll get everyone organized. Chewie warbled a question. Sure, if you're still thirsty, Han told him, experimentally swishing his own half-full cup. Picking up another bottle will give you a better excuse to go over to the bar anyway. Just get whatever you want for yourself. I'm still okay here. Nodding acknowledgement, Chewie got up and started weaving his way through the tables toward the archway side of the bar. Han watched him for a minute, then looked over at the door where the Duros had disappeared. Coming up with the 400 he still owed would be a little tricky. Maybe the Duros would accept a little less, or maybe Han could get an advance from this mysterious employer. There was a brush of air as someone stepped over to his table. And to Han's stunned disbelief, Leia dropped into the chair beside him. That fast enough? She asked. It took Han two tries to get his mouth working. What are you doing here? We were checking out the conveyance tunnel that runs along the southern edge of town, she explained. The ones designed to accommodate or freighters. We wanted to confirm that they're big enough for our transports to use. That could be handy when it comes time to. What are you doing here? Han interrupted as patiently as he could. In this cantina? In that seat? You wanted someone who can calibrate missiles, Leia said. Here I am. Uh, Han said firmly. No. It's me or no one, Leia said just as firmly. I'm the only one within half an hour of here who can do it. Her eyes flicked over Han's shoulder. And if that's your duros, it looks like I'm just in time. Swallowing a curse, Han turned around in his chair. It was the Duros, all right, along with a human and a robed and hooded alien. The alien was humanoid, with black hair and yellow insectoid eyes peeking out from the hood. Even with most of the alien's face in shadow, Han could see that his skin shimmered with color as he moved, like the rainbow haze from a spray of water. Han shifted his eyes to the human, and felt his heart seize up. Because it wasn't just any human. It was Baldi, one of the two men who'd been with Mustache at the Quartz Edge port when Han and Chewie first landed on Pole Miner. Han still didn't know who those men were, or who they were working for. But given that he told them he was going to the Enyaten Mines, it was a good bet they knew he and Chewie were with the Alliance. It was an even better bet that whoever they were working for wouldn't want the Alliance knowing about that private stash of weaponry and T-47 airspeeders. And depending on how badly they didn't want the Alliance knowing that, they might open fire right here and now. Baldi's eyes swept the room and came to a sudden halt, aimed like turbo lasers at the bar. At the big, shaggy, crowd-towering form of Chewie. Get ready to duck! Han ordered Leia quietly, slipping his hand casually under the table and getting a grip on his blaster. The minute the Wookiee started back to their table, Baldi would track his vector and spot Han. Briefly, 
Han wondered if there might be time to get Chewie on the comm link, or otherwise wave him off. But there wasn't, and either activity would probably just draw Baldi's attention to him that much faster. He looked sideways at the bar, wishing fleetingly that Chewie had some of that force stuff Luke had. But to Han's surprise, he found that Chewie wasn't looking back at him. Instead, he was looking at Baldi and his friends. For a couple of seconds, he and Baldi seemed to lock eyes. Then, as the bartender set a bottle on the bar in front of him, Chewie turned his back on the three by the door. He gestured, and the bartender pulled two mugs from beneath the bar and set them beside the bottle. Chewie gave Baldi one final look over his shoulder, then picked up the bottle and mugs. Only he didn't head back to Han's table. Instead, he lumbered through the archway and disappeared into the back room. What's he doing? Leia murmured. Saving our skins? Han murmured back, watching Baldi out of the corner of his eye. Baldi was murmuring urgently to the yellow-eyed alien, his hand on his holstered blaster, his eyes on the archway where Chewie had disappeared. The alien said something in return. Baldi nodded and headed after the Wookiee, his hand still on his blaster. The alien turned and murmured something to the Duros, who nodded and gestured toward Han. None of the byplay had been lost on Leia. Han? She asked tensely. Just play it casual, Han told her as the Duros and alien headed toward them. What about Chewie? He can take care of himself, Han said shortly. Sit there and be quiet. I'll do the talking. Normally, he knew she would have found something snide to say to an order like that. But she remained silent. Han watched the two aliens coming toward them, also keeping an eye on Baldi as he disappeared through the archway. Three seconds later the Duros and Alien sat down at their table. I greet you, the Duros said, gesturing to Han. This is my friend. Call me Shrike, Han interrupted. This is pain. I hear you need some weapons work done. Which of you is the expert he spoke of? The Alien said. His voice was as shimmery as his skin with clipped edges to each of his words. We work together, Han said. I load, she calibrates. If the pay is good enough, Leia added. I pay for speed and expertise, the alien said, focusing on her. You can calibrate Kaldorf 7 and Regini's mole interceptor missiles? Han felt his throat tighten. It was a trap a trick question a real weapons programmer would spot in an instant. He should have expected something like this, and warned Leia about it. Fortunately, she was already on top of it. Kaldorf's yes, she said. Good luck finding anyone who can do Regini's moles. Why? The alien asked. Because they stopped making those twenty years ago. Leia said. That was a Clone Wars era weapon. Not a very good one either. The alien relaxed, just slightly. My mistake, he said. I paid 200 per missile mounted and calibrated. Do you wish the job? Yes, Han said. Where and when? And what do we call you? Call me Rankwiv, the alien said. We leave at once. Beside him, Han felt Leia stir. I'll need to stop at my room and get a few things first, she said. I have all you'll need, Rankwiv said. We leave at once. Or you don't leave at all. Han looked at Leia. Her mouth was tight, but she nodded. Fine, he said, looking back at Rankwiv. You've got yourself a deal. 
There is also the matter of my fee, the Duros reminded him. Right. Han jerked a thumb at him. He gets another four hundred, he told Leia. Pay him, will you? Without waiting for a reply, he stood up. Ready when you are. My transport awaits, Rankwiv said. It will be a six-hour trip. Come. Han felt his eyes narrow. Six hours? You have agreed, Rankwiv said his shimmering voice going suddenly dark. You may not refuse now. And would do so at your own risk, the Duros added warningly. Other armed beings would come quickly at Rankwiv's order. Han grimaced. And the first one who would answer that call would probably be Baldi, charging in from the other room. The minute he recognized Han. Fine, he growled. This just better be worth it. Han had assumed that Rankwiv's transport would be a space-going vehicle, at which point six hours from Dankamp Village could be on the far side of Pole Minor or nearly anywhere on Pole Major. But the vehicle instead turned out to be a 30-seat speeder bus, in as bad a shape as all the rest of the machinery seemed to be down here. The bus was nearly full but Han and Leia managed to find a pair of seats together. They'd barely settled into them when the bus took off, maneuvering through the dim lights of the half-dozen caverns that made up the city and heading out into one of the wide, main tunnels. It was quickly clear that it wasn't going to be a particularly pleasant journey. The bus was old, the paint was peeling off the walls, and it smelled. There was also some malfunction in the left repulsor lift's regulator circuit, and every few seconds the vehicle gave a little lurching dip to the side. But with the rumble of the repulsor lifts filling the bus, he and Leia finally had a chance to confer in private. Han, what have you gotten us into? Leia demanded, her eyes flashing ominously. We're not heading for the Enyatin region, even in this thing, that's less than two hours from here. Yeah, I know, Han conceded. But this whole business still seems pretty shady. If you want to investigate shady businesses, go join CORCC, Leia said tartly. We should have backed out. Oh yeah, that would have worked, Han growled. You know that guy Chewie decoyed away? He was one of the ones who hit us up at the Quartz Edgeport three days ago. The ones who weren't there when we went back. The ones who know we're Alliance. Oh, Leia said in a slightly more civil tone. Right, oh, Han mimicked. If he'd spotted us pretending to be guns for hire, Rankwiv would probably have called in all those guns the Duros promised he had waiting to jump. That could still happen if his friend gets away from Chewie, Leia pointed out. He won't. Han promised. Not a chance. Not from Chewie. I hope you're right, Leia said. Let me see if I've got this straight. You and I are headed for an unknown location, up to a thousand kilometers away, to load missiles for an unknown alien with an unknown purpose, with no one in the Alliance knowing where we are. That about cover it? Han thought it over. Put that way, he admitted, it sounded worse than it probably was. Yeah, I suppose, he agreed. Why, is that a problem? She gave him a single glare and then turned to gaze out the window at the utterly uninteresting rock wall flowing past outside. Casually, Han looked around. The other passengers seemed about evenly split between hard and fringe types and young, earnest hungry-looking kids who probably figured they could do anything with computers and were desperate to earn some money. Grimacing, he settled back into his seat. He could try to watch their route in the hope that he could find his way back if he needed to. But unless this was a real straight route, six hours of zigzagging was going to be nearly impossible to memorize or even track on his datapad. 
Besides, Leia was probably planning to try that anyway. She was the senior command staff here, after all. That kind of planning was her job. Han's job, as low-level order follower, was merely to keep up his strength and stamina for whenever senior command staff decided to issue him some orders. Leaning back in his seat, he drew his blaster and slipped it inside his vest, folding his arms across it so that no one could accidentally walk off with it. It would be all right. He would make sure of that. If only because Her Highness would never let him hear the end of it otherwise. Closing his eyes, he settled down to try to get some sleep. Slow down, Chewie, Luke said as the rumbles and roars poured from his calm link. I can hardly understand you. There was a short pause as Chewie took a deep breath. Then the rumbles resumed, only marginally slower. But it was slow enough, this time, for Luke to get all of it. Okay, calm down, he told the Wookiee trying to think. Han and Leia gone, no idea where they disappeared to, no idea even whether Chewie had gotten to the mysterious fake smuggler before he could clue in the Duros and the unknown alien as to who Han really was. First things first. What did you do with the guy you clobbered? Okay, Luke said. You'd better call Leia, sorry, better call Kraken, and have him send someone to get him out of the dumpster. They might be able to question him, and find out where they took Han and Leia after he comes to. Chewie growled an acknowledgement, then another question. Yes, absolutely I'll come up and help, Luke promised. Though what he could do to find Han and Leia that Kraken's people couldn't do on their own, he couldn't imagine. You call Kraken, and I'll let Axlon know I'm heading up. He keyed off and punched in Axlon's code. The ambassador had made it clear that he wanted Luke near the palace today, but under the circumstances he would surely be willing to modify his plans. To Luke's surprise, he wasn't. But it's an emergency. Luke protested. Han and Leia have disappeared, and we don't know what kind of danger they might be in. They need me there. And I need you here, Axlon said flatly. More than Kraken does. Luke felt a tingling run through him. There was something in the man's voice. Is something about to happen? He asked carefully. Axlon hesitated. I don't know all the details, he said. But I think the governor's life is in danger. Serious, immediate danger. Does he know? Luke asked. I mean, shouldn't you be telling him instead of me? I've tried, Axlon said. But he's determined to go ahead with our agreement, and says he won't hide from shadows. Luke grimaced. Leia was like that, too. A prime target for Imperial agents, yet she always refused to stay behind and keep a low profile when there was work to be done. Do we know anything about who it is he's not hiding from? Nothing solid, Axlon said. But it's rumored that the agent's weapon of choice is a lightsaber. In fact, I can tell you now that that's the main reason I wanted you to come here with me. The only weapon that can block a lightsaber, after all, is another lightsaber. Luke felt his mouth drop open. Was Axlon seriously suggesting what Luke thought he was suggesting? You do realize I'm not a Jedi, right? He said carefully. Ben barely got me started on lightsaber combat. I'm not ready to take on anyone who knows what they're doing. It won't come to that, Axlon assured him. You have to understand the psychology of the situation. In general, no one carries a weapon like that unless they know how to use it. Therefore, 
Just having you and your lightsaber in sight near the palace gate will force the agent to assume you do know how to fight with it, and to wonder what kind of obstacle you might be. That will force her to rethink her plan. Her plan? Luke asked. The agent is a woman? So I hear, Axelon said. As I was saying, she'll have to rethink her plan, and anything that buys time is to our advantage. Unless the agent decided to test Luke's skill before she went to the bother of changing those plans, Luke thought, grimacing. Still, the force was with Luke. Wasn't it? I'll call Kraken and tell him that we're sticking with the original plan, Axelon went on. You just settle down and get some sleep. I want you outside, in the vicinity of the palace gate, at ten o'clock sharp tomorrow morning. Understood? Understood, Luke said with a sigh. He'd already told Chewie he didn't think he could do anything to help. Chewie hadn't listened. There didn't seem much point in telling Axelon the same thing. Good lad, Axelon said. Now go get some sleep. He paused, and Luke could almost see the other's tight smile. Tomorrow, Master Skywalker, you will see the rebellion start on the path to victory. I guarantee it. The early morning traffic rush had faded into the steady but not road-jamming level that Laron had seen the previous day when he and the others had first arrived in the palace area. Now, three blocks away from the palace gate, he and Marcross waited for Jade to make her move. Laron didn't know how Marcross felt. But personally, he felt like an idiot. An idiot standing at the center of an optical sight's cross lines. The full-length hooded robes he and Marcross were wearing weren't going to work. They just weren't. Never mind that robes like these were worn by lower-class workers, farmers, and traders all across the galaxy and that he'd seen at least five other people wearing similar outfits in the past half hour. Never mind that the robes reached to the ground and the sleeves draped past his fingertips, completely covering the stormtrooper armor he and Marcross were wearing underneath them. The problem was that their armor was way too bulky to pass as human physique. Even worse, every time Marcross moved, Laron could see the brief but obvious impressions of the various armor sections pressing against the cloth. Laron knew he was undoubtedly showing off the same impressions himself. Jade, naturally, hadn't had the slightest qualm about throwing them to the battle dogs this way. She'd assured them that the general population never noticed things like that, especially not in a neighborhood they were already intimately familiar with. They would travel blindly on their respective errands without seeing anything beyond where their feet were striking the ground. She had a point, Laron supposed. But the common people weren't the population segment he was worried about. Whitestone City citizens might ignore their environment, but he doubted the patrollers and roving stormtrooper teams would be so inattentive. Particularly, say, those two stormtroopers who were even now coming toward them down the quiet side street where Jade had ordered them to wait. Beside him, Marcross murmured something under his breath. Just stay cool, Laron advised quietly, feeling the sweat breaking out on his skin as he tried not to stare at the approaching Imperials. And don't move, he added. Moving accentuates your outline. Like that's going to help. Marcross muttered. Where is she anyway? She'll be here, Laron assured him. Unless, of course, Jade's real plan was simply to set up him and Marcross to be captured. A pair of stormtrooper deserters might easily make enough of a diversionary fuss to let her slip into the palace undetected. Twenty meters in front of the approaching stormtroopers, a hooded figure emerged from a narrow alley, moving with the careful fragility of extreme old age. The person started to turn to the right, caught sight of the stormtroopers, and abruptly turned and fled back into the alley, 
at a considerably enhanced rate of speed. The stormtroopers, Laron reflected, were only human. The very sight of fugitive behavior was like throwing raw meat to a ranker. Halt! One of them called in his mechanically filtered vocoder voice as both of them took off after the figure. They disappeared into the alley, their Blastechi 11s lowered into hip firing position. Larone turned to Mark Ross. Should we give her a minute? He asked. Mark Ross wrinkled his nose. She'll probably be mad if we show up late, he pointed out. Right, Laron said, nodding. Let's go. They found the two stormtroopers sprawled on the ground near the middle of the alley, more or less out of sight from either end. Jade had pushed back her hood and was crouched over one of them, her hands spread on either side of his faceplate as she gazed intently into his eyepieces. Dead? Laron asked as he and Marcross came up to her. Sonic, she said, her voice sounding distant as she focused on the task at hand. Delivered up under the helmet rim. They'll be all right in a couple of hours. Laron nodded. Jade was ruthless enough with the traitors she was sent to deal with but he'd seen her go out of her way to keep the innocent and the loyal out of her line of fire. Get busy on the other one's ID, she added. Mark Ross was already kneeling beside the second unconscious stormtrooper. His removal tool slipped under the man's left shoulder piece. The white-on-white -white trooper ID marks were nearly undetectable to normal eyesight, even at close range but were easily visible to another stormtrooper's vision enhancements. Along with its other covert equipment, the Suwantech had included several false shoulder IDs. Up to now, though, Laron had always opted for the team to use unmarked shoulder pieces instead. It had seemed preferable to risk the awkwardness of having to explain how their IDs had worn off to facing the instant suspicion of showing up with the markings of a unit that happened to be in an entirely different part of the galaxy. Here, given Jade's plan, they had no choice but to wear IDs. Luckily, they also knew which IDs to use. Marcross had just finished detaching the shoulder piece when Jade gave a sharp nod. Got it she said. Shifting her hands to the sides of the stormtrooper's helmet, she started to ease it off over his head. Marcross? Clear, Marcross said, lifting up the detached shoulder piece as he moved over to the stormtrooper Jade had just unhelmeted. Handing the shoulder piece to Laron, he knelt down and started working on the other trooper's shoulder. As he worked, Larone pulled Marcross's robe open and started fastening the new ID in place, watching Jade out of the corner of his eye as she moved to the trooper Marcross had just finished with. Along with the shoulder IDs, the other half of a successful masquerade was getting onto the palace comm link grid. And that was far and away the trickier half. Stormtrooper helmets included a tongue switch, which had to be tripped before removing the helmet. Otherwise, the comm link would instantly scramble both the frequency rotation sequence and the encryption suite, leaving it all but useless. For most would-be infiltrators, that was an insurmountable hurdle. But not for Jade. She had the force, and she knew exactly where the tongue switch was located. A bit of telekinesis, a delicate tweaking of the switch, and the helmet could be removed with its comm system intact. Two minutes later, with both helmets removed and both shoulder pieces in place, Larone and Marcross were ready to go. Double-check the helmets, Jade ordered as she handed them over. Make sure I got it right. Marcross nodded and slid the helmet over his head. A few seconds of listening to the palace security chatter was all it took. Yes, we're in, he confirmed, locking the helmet securely to his collar. But it doesn't sound like we're on the same system as the gate guards. Shouldn't be a problem, you'll be talking to them in person anyway, 
Jade reminded him, giving each of their shoulder pieces a final check. Put these two in that storeroom over there to sleep off the Sonic. I've already sliced the lock for you. Then plug in your private frequency and make sure Brightwater and the others are in position in case we need a fast breakout. Which of you has it? It was slightly but noticeably longer than the standard Stormtrooper version, which in Laron's opinion made it as much a potential threat to them as their robe-covered armor had been earlier. As usual, Jade had waved away his fears, contending that the same familiarity that kept citizens from noting anything subtly different on familiar streets would likewise keep Stormtroopers from noticing subtle differences on their even more familiar armor. She'd been right about the robe. Laron hoped she was right about the thermal detonator pack, too. Good, Jade said, handing a small, flat disc to Laron. Here's the Sonic. If you need to use it, remember that you need to slip it up beneath the helmet rim, double circle side inward, and squeeze the edge. Right, Laron said. She'd gone through this twice with them all the previous night, but it never hurt to double and triple-check with unfamiliar weapons. When will we know when to move? Marcross asked. Just keep listening, Jade said, opening her brown robe the rest of the way to reveal a loose blue and silver ankle-length dress underneath. Trust me, you'll know. And don't be late. She went over to the side of the alley, dropping the robe and picking up a small bag lying among the bits of garbage there. With the bag tucked under her arm, she strode briskly away. What do you think? Marcross asked quietly. Larone grimaced behind his faceplate. So far she's been right about everything, he said. Marcross grunted. Let's just hope we're in a position to collect the pieces if she starts not being right. Come on, let's get these guys out of sight. Landspeeder theft was a serious business in the Empire, particularly out here on the edges where vehicles, especially decent ones, were scarcer than on the older and more populous worlds. One of the results was that theft protection systems, while less sophisticated than those on Imperial Center, were employed much more consistently. Not that security systems of any sort made much of a difference to Mara Jade. She had already walked through the neighborhood earlier that morning and found what she needed, an open-topped landspeeder like the one the teenager had been driving yesterday, conveniently parked along a quiet side street. Mara had it unlocked and started in 30 seconds, and drove off to her chosen insertion point a kilometer from the palace gate. Setting the landspeeder on idle, she pulled a wide-brimmed hat from her bag, unfolded it, and put it on stuffing most of her red-gold hair inside. The bag's other item, the controller to the toy airspeeder, went onto the passenger seat, with the empty bag laid casually over it. The next phase of the plan, unfortunately, wasn't under her direct control. She had to wait for another open-topped vehicle to come by, traveling in the proper direction, with the driver and no other passengers who might slant the witness reports. But the force was with her. Five minutes after settling down, she spotted the perfect vehicle approaching from behind, a low-back speeder truck with an open cab. She waited until it passed, then pulled smoothly into the traffic flow directly behind it. Ahead, the spur leading to the palace gate was coming up fast. Stretching out in the force, Mara got a grip on the speeder truck's wheel. As the truck reached the spur, she wrenched the wheel hard over, sending the truck careening onto the short road heading for the gate. A second later, as she also reached the spur, she spun her own wheel and headed in after him. The truck driver managed to overcome his stunned surprise at his vehicle's erratic behavior and brake before he hit the gate. He had barely enough time to heave a sigh of relief when Mara slammed full tilt into his rear crash plate the impact lurching the truck another three meters forward. 
Yesterday's land speeder incident had been a perplexing but isolated event. Today's, though, made it part of a pattern, and Marin knew how security forces were trained to react to patterns. She'd barely shut down her engine when she and the trucker were both swarmed by guards, both the livery-wearing group and a dozen stormtroopers who streamed briskly out through the personnel door by the main gate. One of the livery guards got to Mara first. Hands in the air, he ordered, his blaster steady on her chest as he jogged up to the side of her stolen speeder. I didn't do this, Mara protested as she raised her hands. My will just turned. All by itself. Sure it did, the guard growled, gesturing with his free hand. Come on, out. A minute later Mara was standing beside the landspeeder, her hands still raised, watching yet more stormtroopers emerge from the palace compound. The speeder truck driver was also standing beside his vehicle. A similar crowd of security personnel gathered around him as he stuttered the same story Mara had already given her group. I tell you, this wasn't my fault, Mara went on, watching the livery guard's face as his helmet calm link murmured into his ear. There was a slight hardening of his expression. Look, I'm late for a very important meeting, she added, starting to edge along the side of the vehicle. You can keep my speeder and check it for yourself. I'll come back for it later. Stay where you are. The guard snapped, taking a long step to cut off her escape. You're not the registered owner of this vehicle. Yes, thank you, I know that, Mara said in a tone of exaggerated patience. It belongs to my friend Carol. Go ahead and call her. She'll tell you she let me borrow it. There she is. A flat stormtrooper vocoder voice came from the right. Mara turned. Larone and Marcross were marching toward her clump of guards, their gait and posture stiff and determined. Hold that woman. We saw her shoplifting from an electronics store. An electronics store? The guard echoed, frowning as he shifted his gaze from Mara to the land speeder itself. That's ridiculous. Mara insisted, mentally crossing her fingers as she watched the guard's eyes move methodically around the passenger compartment. If necessary, Larone or Marcross could perform the next step, but it would be better if an official palace security man figured it out on his own. He's lying. I've never stolen a thing in my life. Quiet, the guard ordered as his eyes fell on the crumpled bag lying casually on the front passenger seat. Watch her, he ordered the stormtroopers, and walked around the rear of the landspeeder to the passenger side. Carefully, he lifted the bag, revealing the controller for the toy airspeeder Mara had bought yesterday. What's this? He asked. How should I know? Mara countered. I told you, I borrowed it from my friend. Uh-huh. The guard picked up the controller and turned it over in his hand, studying the controls and peering suspiciously at the extra electronic components Mara had attached randomly to the top and sides. He set his fingers on the controls, glancing quickly at Mara to see her reaction. Mara kept her face expressionless, stretching out with the force. Tentatively, the guard moved one of the controls. And in perfect sync, Mara twitched the speeder truck's control wheel. The guard's head jerked hard toward the truck. So did the truck drivers and several of the troopers guarding him. I didn't do that, the driver protested frantically. I did, Mara's guard called to them, holding up the controller and pointing to Mara. Binders. Now. One of the stormtroopers stepped forward pulling a set of binders from one of his utility pouches. And hobble her, the guard added. This one's something special. A moment later Mara's hands were shackled in front of her, and her ankles were fastened together by twenty centimeters of chain. You too, take her to interrogation, the guard said, pointing at two of the palace stormtroopers. And take this to the lab, he added 
handing the controller to one of the other stormtroopers. We'll take her, Laron offered, taking a step forward. They'll do it, the guard said. You're on patrol. Our arrest, Laron said firmly. We'll take her in. The guard glared at him. But he probably had enough experience with stormtroopers to know that they were just as ambitious as any other military professionals. Denying them the chance to add a glowing entry to their service record would make him a couple of enemies, and no one wanted that. Fine, you can go along, he growled. But I won't be answerable to your commander if you get in trouble for being off your patrol. They set off toward the gate, the palace stormtroopers walking in front of Mara, Laron and Marcross walking behind her. It was a slightly awkward processional, given the hobble's limitation on Mara's usually longer stride. But by the time they reached the gate and shifted to single file to get through the door, she'd accustomed herself to the new rhythm. She hadn't been able to see into the grounds yesterday but she'd assumed at the time that Pharaohs would have doubled or tripled the standard palace guard. Now, as she and her escort headed down the walkway, she discovered that, if anything, she'd underestimated the governor's level of caution. There were at least 30 stormtroopers patrolling the area, including several pairs of the speeder scouts that she'd also seen guarding the approaches to the white stone mound towering over the palace. It was just as well, Mara reflected, that she hadn't tried to get in by simply breaching the wall. The main palace doors were large and elaborate, with the same decorative pattern that she'd seen on the entry gate. But suspected spies and saboteurs apparently weren't given such elegant treatment. Her stormtrooper escort instead angled off toward a smaller side door, half hidden among a stand of sculpted bushes. As they approached, the door opened and three men stepped outside to meet them all three wearing the gray uniforms Mara had seen yesterday. The oldest of the three, who Mara could now see was wearing a major's insignia, was the middle-aged man who'd come out of the courtyard during yesterday's incident to interrogate the teenager. As you were, the major said as Mara and her escort came up to him. We'll take it from here. We have to make a report, Laron said firmly. Then go make it the major said, his eyes narrowing as he studied Mara. I remember you. You were at the tapcaf across the street yesterday when that other landspeeder tried to crash the gate. I have no idea what you're talking about, Mara said stiffly. Of course not, the major said, looking back at the stormtroopers. I said you were dismissed. Return to your assigned duties. Sir? Laron began. Take her, the major ordered, gesturing to his two men as he turned his back on the stormtroopers. Mara half turned toward Laron, inclined her head microscopically toward the bushes clustered around them. Then, as the two gray suited guards took her upper arms, she let them guide her to the open door. The major stepped aside to let them pass and then followed, sealing the door behind them with a data card. Sized Paskey. The palace floor plans that the Emperor had sent Mara hadn't included any listing of interrogation rooms or holding cells, hardly surprising, given that such facilities weren't supposed to exist in high level governmental residences. It was usually up to each individual local ruler to make whatever quiet and strictly unofficial arrangements he chose in that area. Mara had seen many such facilities over the years ranging from deep, terrifying dungeons to light, airy containment rooms designed to lull prisoners into a relaxed sense of false hope. But such minor details apart, the one thing all interrogation specialists had in common was the desire to keep their activities as secret and unobserved as possible. This one was no exception. The hallway Mara found herself in was short, unoccupied, and without any doors at all lining the sides. Besides the door they'd entered by, there was only a single turbolift door twenty meters away at the hallway's far end. It was the perfect place for a prisoner to disappear, possibly never to be heard from again. 
It was also the perfect place for that same prisoner to make her escape. Mara let them walk her halfway down the hall, giving the palace stormtroopers outside plenty of time to start back to their posts and hopefully be out of earshot of anything that happened in here. Then, looking down at the binders on her wrists, she used the force to pop them free. As they clattered to the floor, she reached over to the blaster of the guard to her left and fired the weapon, still in its holster, along his right leg. And as he bellowed in surprise and pain, she yanked the blaster from its holster and swung it hard against the throat of the man to her right. She continued her turn as he collapsed to the floor, bringing the weapon to bear on the major only now beginning to react behind her. Don't, she warned. The major froze, his hand on his still-holstered blaster, his face tight. You can't escape, he warned, his voice under rigid control. Maybe I don't want to, Mara said. The guard whose leg she'd shot started to stagger toward her, and she shifted her aim away from the major just long enough to slam the side of her blaster across the guard's throat, sending him sprawling to the floor the way she had the other one. Maybe I like living here, she added, bringing the weapon back to the major. How about you? The but he was smart enough to know when further resistance would be a waste of his life. Still glaring, he lifted his hands and put them on his head. Thank you. Mara said. Dropping her aim, she blasted through the hobble chain linking her ankles. Blaster and calm link on the floor. Gingerly, the major drew his blaster with two fingers and lowered it to the floor beside him, following it up with his calm link. Now your passkey, Mara continued. It won't do you any good, the major growled as he dropped the passkey beside the other items. Governor Pharaohs doesn't rely on locks and droid sentinels. You'll never get to him, never. And you certainly won't get out of the palace alive. I appreciate the warning, Mara said. Two steps back and lie down on your stomach, face to the wall. Glowering, he obeyed. Mara picked up the passkey and retraced her steps to the door they'd entered through. Slipping the passkey into the slot, she keyed the release. The door slid open. Laron? She called softly, her eyes still on the major. There was a breath of air, and the two stormtroopers slipped through the doorway into the corridor. You all right? Laron asked. We heard a shot. I'm fine, Mara assured him. Give me the sonic. This blaster doesn't have a stun setting. Laron handed it over, and Mara headed back to the Major. A minute later all three gray graysuited men were asleep. Well, this looks nicely ominous, Marcross commented as Mara returned to them. One exit, no doors, no monitors. Typical interrogation center entrance, Mara said, gesturing for him to turn around. Consider yourself lucky you haven't seen one before. What happens now? Laron asked. I hope you're not thinking of trying that turbo lift. Hardly, Mara said, unfastening the end cap of Marcross's oversized thermal detonator casing and pulling out the lightsaber she'd concealed inside the empty shell. Interrogation turbo lifts typically only have two stops, and we're already at the less unpleasant of them. Is there anywhere out there you can hang around for a while without being challenged? There's a guard station just north of the main gate, Laron said. Or we could just pretend we're one of the patrol teams. I doubt anyone will challenge us. At least not right away, Marcross added. Eventually, someone's bound to notice that their stormtrooper count is off. If and when that happens, tell them Major Pakri said he wanted you on courtyard patrol, Mara said, squinting at the name on her borrowed passkey. No one will be able to prove you wrong for the next couple of hours. 
Assuming no one else wanders in here and finds him, Marcross said. Don't worry, Mara said, resealing Marcross's detonator casing. I'll signal you if and when I need you. Any idea what that signal will be? Laron asked. Not yet, Mara said. You'll know it when it happens. Along with half the city? I'll try to keep it a little less visible than that, Mara said with a touch of dry humor. Go on, get going. A minute later they were outside, and the door was once again sealed. Mara took a quick look around, then ignited her lightsaber. As she'd already noted, her plans hadn't included the palace's unofficial interrogation section. But they had shown what had been here before Pharaohs or his predecessors had retrofitted the area. This part of the palace had originally been a hospitality wing, with guest suites, private contemplation and entertainment rooms, and even a separate kitchen with human and droid chefs on call to attend to off-hour appetites. This particular corridor had once led from the kitchen and servant droid stations to a three-car turbolift cluster, continuing on into the rest of the palace. Mara also knew that even with a completely sealed interrogation section like this one, most governors instinctively tried to keep prying eyes and ears at a distance. This implied that the kitchen and droid stations on either side of her were probably closed down and abandoned, which furthermore suggested that a quick exit from the corridor was only a couple of lightsaber cuts away. The problem, as Mark Ross had pointed out, was that there was no guarantee someone wouldn't come looking for Major Pakri and his men, either from the courtyard or from the underground interrogation room itself. A hole in the wall would be something not even the dimmest security recruit would miss. But fewer people bothered to look up, especially when their eyes and hands were busy with something else, something such as lining up a passkey with a door's security slot. The hallway was a bit above average height, but the ceiling was still easily reachable without Mara having to jump. Standing directly in front of the door, she swung her lightsaber blade in a conical pattern cutting a beveled circle through the slab of duocrete above her. Closing down the weapon, she stretched out with the force and lifted the plug she'd just cut, moving it away from the opening and setting it down off to the side. She leapt upward, catching the edge of the hole, and pulled herself cautiously through. She was in the relaxation room of a nicely appointed guest suite. From the drawn shades and the faintly musty smell, it was clear the room had been unoccupied for some time. That probably also meant that the room's computer wasn't active. But there would be other rooms nearby where she could tap into the palace system. She dropped back to the corridor below and, using the force, lifted the unconscious security men one by one up through the opening. The last of the three was a bit wobbly. For some reason... Lifting bodies always seemed to take more out of her than moving the equivalent amount of inert matter. But she made it without dropping him. Then, jumping back up to join them, she lowered the duocrete plug back into place. It was far from perfect. But the beveling would keep the slab firmly in place, and her cut was neat enough that even if someone spotted it, they might wonder if it was something that had always been there that they simply had never noticed before. By the time uncertainty and hesitation ran its course, the job should be finished. And someone in the palace would have received imperial justice. In the dim light seeping around the closed curtain she discarded her hat and stripped off the blue and silver dress, readjusting the long, dark green tunic and leggings she had on underneath. It was a neutral but professional outfit, a style currently in vogue all across the empire and one she'd seen a handful of the palace's female employees wearing as they left for home the previous evening. She tore out the collapsed courier's shoulder pouch that had been concealed in the blue dress's inner lining, folded it back into its proper shape, and secured her lightsaber inside. And with that, she was ready to roam the palace hallways. The door had been double-locked, probably when it was first closed down which normally prevented it from being opened from either side. 
But Major Pickery's passkey had been coded even for off-limits areas and popped the lock without trouble. A moment later Mara was moving silently down the hallway toward the murmurings of life and activity. Time to find herself a computer. It was a quarter after ten, and Luke had just settled himself by one of the shops across the street from the governor's palace when he saw Axlon emerge from the crowd and head toward the small pedestrian door at the side of the main gate. An unpleasant tingle ran through him. Axlon had his fancy pass from Governor Pharaoh's, and so far either the roaming stormtroopers nor the handful of men in bright blue and red uniforms had seemed inclined to do more than watch the older man's approach. But that didn't mean that the crowd milling around the area wasn't going to have its curiosity aroused if they saw a plainly dressed stranger just walk into the most secure place on Pole Major. More important, how would the Imperial agent react if she, too, was wandering around here in the crowd? Luke frowned, a second tingle shivering across his skin. For that matter, why was there a crowd outside the palace at all? Maybe it was just the two landspeeders that had apparently crashed into each other in front of the gate. Luke hadn't been here when that happened, but it must have been fairly recent, given that grey-uniformed men were still working on the vehicles under the watchful gaze of a dozen stormtroopers. But the crowd didn't seem like the usual collection of gawking onlookers that gathered at any disaster or near disaster. There was a restlessness to this crowd a sense of anticipation that Luke could feel even without drawing on the force. And as he stood there trying to look casual, it seemed to him that more and more people were sending lingering looks in his direction. Something was about to happen. Maybe it was something the locals didn't want strangers to witness. Luke grimaced. Common sense said to get out of there, to slip away and find some place a little less conspicuous from which to watch. But Axlon was giving the orders, and Axlon had told him to be here. To wait for an Imperial agent to show her face. Luke swallowed hard. It made no sense. If the agent had even a modicum of lightsaber training, she would be able to cut Luke into pieces without breaking a sweat. Unless Axlon knew something Luke didn't. Maybe the agent carried a lightsaber purely as a bluff and had no more ability to actually fight with it than Luke did. Alternatively, maybe Axlon was right about the very existence of Luke's lightsaber slowing her down and buying Axlon the time he needed for whatever it was he and Governor Pharaohs needed time for. Unfortunately, despite what Hans seemed to think, Luke wasn't always let in on all the subtleties of the orders he was given. But he had been given an order. And so he would wait here until he received orders to do otherwise. 10.20 Axlon reached the door and offered his pass to the guard. The guard plugged it into a data pad, then handed it back and said something on a comm link. The door opened, and Axlon went through. There was still no sign of the mysterious Imperial agent who was supposedly here to stop him. So where in blazes was she? With a final jerk that Jared Han out of his fitful sleep, the speeder bus came to a halt. He blinked as the repulsor lifts gave a final throaty growl and lowered the vehicle to the ground. They'd arrived just outside a large mine-out cavern, bigger even than the ones Dankamp Village was built into. Squatting in neat lines as far across the cavern as Han could see were ships. Decent-sized ones, too. They were about 38 meters long, a bit bigger than the Falcon, with smooth curves and long, deep grooves running fore to aft along each of the sloping wings. He nudged Leia. Wake up, sweetheart, he murmured. We're here. I'm not asleep, she murmured back, with a slightly slurred voice that told him that she had, in fact, been asleep until his nudge. Where's here? I don't know. Hans said grimly. But whoever these guys are, they came loaded for Tagorian. Those things out there are warships. Leia sat up a bit straighter. How do you know? She asked, peering out the window. 
I've never seen anything like them before. Add it up, he told her. Those grooves along the wings? That's the passive, low-tech version of enhanced slipstream stabilizers. Those weapon struts at the wing interfaces are ribbed like original equipment, not add-ons. That tall fin poking up from the top probably holds a set of vertically racked laser cannons, and that bulb all the way at the top is a dedicated targeting sensor. You can't see much of the sublights from this angle, but you can see enough of the nozzle flare to know they're big and have wide separation. He pointed toward the nearest ship's bow. And the only reason for a crosshatch wraparound cockpit canopy is to give a pilot maximum protection while still giving him a 270 viewing angle. No, they're warships, all right. At the front of the bus, Rankwiv got to his feet. All persons out, he called, his yellow insect's eyes glittering strangely in the bus's dim overhead light. Your work now begins. There was a general shuffle as the passengers stood up and began filing down the aisle to the door. I don't know what's going on, Leia said quietly to Han. But I can tell you we're nowhere near a thousand kilometers away from Dankamp village. I'm guessing we're no more than fifty or a hundred from any ten. Han stared out at the ships, the back of his neck tingling unpleasantly. How do you know? I was tracking the turns for the first couple of hours, she said. We were doing a lot of weaving in and out, but we didn't seem to be getting much real distance. She nodded out the window. I think they just don't want us knowing where we are. Yeah, well, if I had all these things stashed away down here, I wouldn't want anyone knowing that either, Han agreed grimly. So what do we do? Leia asked. Try to get out of here and hope we can find our way back? Han leaned closer to her, trying to get a better look out the window. There were at least a dozen more of the black-haired, yellow-eyed aliens gathering in a loose circle near the front of their speeder bus, plus probably twenty other humans moving around among the warships. Naturally, the whole bunch of them were armed. Han, Leia began crossly, trying to lean away from him. We're going to have to stay for a while, Han said, pulling away from her and standing up. Let's try to figure out what's going on, and look for an opening. An opening to do what? Han grimaced. Don't worry, he assured her. I'll figure something out. With a sigh, Mara closed down the last of the files and shut down her borrowed computer. She'd hoped, she really had, that Pharaohs would prove innocent of the charges the Emperor had leveled against him. She'd wanted to believe that such a rising political figure had simply been duped that the resources of the palace had been manipulated by someone else for their own advantage. But the records were clear. Pharaohs had sent the first contact messages to the Rebel Alliance. He'd handled all the subsequent long-range negotiations as to sites and resources, discussing with Mon Mothma and General Carlos Rican all the quid pro quos of a full-stage political and economic agreement. And to top it all off, the governor had personally gone to a local cantina only four days earlier to meet with the man the Alliance had sent in to finalize the plans. She grimaced. First Cord, now Pharaohs. Was this a sign of things to come, a warning that the Emperor's new order was starting to crack at the seams? Or was it simply a coincidence that two ambitious governors had decided to make individual bids for power at roughly the same time? Mara didn't know. But one thing that was certain, treason could not be permitted to fester. It had to be dealt with, quickly and cleanly. A governor's office and inner sanctum were always guarded, usually by a hand-picked cadre of the governor's most competent and trusted people. But there were always ways to get through those final defenses. Some offices had dropped ceilings, with enough space between the decorative and the real that a properly equipped agent could slip in that way. Nearly every governor also had a secret door and emergency exit, 
which could often be accessed for purposes of infiltration. And sometimes, you could simply walk in the front door. The computer had flagged the arrival of one master Vestan Axlon at the gate, just as Mara finished reading the last of the calm transcripts. Axlon's pass, she noted, was a suspiciously vague one, offering universal access and carrying the governor's personal authorization. Possibly he was Pharaoh's rebel contact. Certainly he was someone no one would question once he was inside the building. He would do nicely. Axlon and the two palace security men escorting him had reached the turbo lift leading to Pharaoh's fourth floor office complex when Mara arrived. I'll take it from here, she said briskly as she came up to them. Excuse me? The senior guard, a lieutenant, asked. I said I'll take it from here, Mara repeated. I'm to escort Master Axlon the rest of the way to Governor Pharaoh's. Major Pickery's orders. The lieutenant made a little sniffing sound. Apparently, Pickery's name didn't carry much weight among his troops. We'll need to see your authorization. It was verbal, Mara said, pulling out her comm link. In front of them the turbolift door slid open, and she strode toward it. The governor's waiting, we'll sort it out on the way. As she passed Axlon, she caught his arm and pulled him away from the guards and into the car with her. It was instantly clear that neither guard was expecting anything so casually audacious, and for half a second both of them simply stood there gaping. Then they abruptly broke their paralysis and hurriedly clambered in with Mara and Axlon. Hold on there, the lieutenant said sternly as he grabbed Axlon's other arm clearly prepared to use force if necessary to get the man away from her. For the second time in as many seconds a flash of bewilderment crossed his face as Mara simply let go of Axlon without struggle or argument. She keyed her calm link, lifting her hand for silence. Give me a minute, she said. The major will straighten this out. The lieutenant squared his shoulders. I have to insist. He trailed off as Mara flashed him a hard-eyed look. Major Pickery, not surprisingly, hadn't answered the call by the time the turbolift car stopped. Where is he? Mara ground out to the universe at large as she jammed the calm link back into her belt and increased the level of simmering fury she was working hard to radiate. The key to keeping people from asking questions she'd long ago learned was to make any such questioning look more dangerous than it was likely to be worth. As long as she then kept her actions below the suspicion trigger level, the same people who'd already decided not to ask would usually decide not to get in her way, either. Fine, she growled as the car door opened, revealing another door ten meters away flanked by two guards and a clerk at an appointment desk. We'll deliver him together. Yes, ma'am the lieutenant said, relief in his voice at having found a compromise that would permit him to carry out his orders without simultaneously annoying an unknown but clearly connected person. Beckoning to Axlon, he and his partner stepped out of the car and headed toward the guarded door. Axlon strode out after them, with Mara taking her place behind him. But then her whole stance, expression, and demeanor suddenly changed. Instead of the arrogant imperial official she'd played for the first set of guards, she was now the lowly personal assistant, trailing after her employer with the quiet efficiency and quieter resignation of someone who knows she will never be anything more than a servant and helper to others. And as she stretched out to the force, she could see that the guards flanking Pharaoh's door had completely bought her act. Axlon, whom they would have been alerted to expect, had apparently brought an assistant whom no one had thought worth mentioning to them. Master Axlon to see Governor Pharaohs, the lieutenant said briskly as they approached. Yes, the receptionist said, her voice carefully neutral as she reached beneath her desk and triggered the door release. From the tension in her tone, Mara guessed that she either knew or strongly suspected who the visitor was, and didn't much care for the company her employer was keeping. He's expecting you. 
The lieutenant nodded and gestured to his partner. They stopped, stepping to either side out of the way as Axlon walked between them and the door guards and through the open door. Mara, still half a step back, went right in after him. The lieutenant's expression, Mara reflected, would have been interesting to see. But she didn't give him the chance to show it to her. Glancing to the side as she cleared the door, she stretched out to the force and hit the inside control, sliding the door shut again behind her. Another telekinetic twitch, and the door was locked. The room she and Axlan had come into turned out to be a small waiting room equipped with couches, low tables, and a large transparent steel cylinder in the center inhabited by brilliantly colored butterflies. Five meters past the column, the door to Pharaoh's office itself was already open. Come in, Master Axlan, a voice called. Axlan continued forward. Mara stayed at his heels, still wearing her assistant's persona. A moment later, she got her first look at the man she'd been sent here to kill. Holos and Vids, in Mara's experience, seldom captured the full essence of a person. Such was again the case here. On the surface, Governor Pharaoh certainly looked like his Holos, with his lined but still boyish face and thick brown hair that always seemed slightly must. But now, in person, Mara could see an overlay of tension to his face, a deep sadness the Holos hadn't shown. His eyes were on Axlan as he and Mara came through his door, shifting almost unwillingly to Mara. Good to see you again, he continued, rising slowly to his feet. Who's your associate? Axlan turned, his jaw dropping as he saw that Mara had come in with him. What are you? This is a private meeting. Go back into the waiting room, Master Axlan, Mara ordered. I have business with the governor. Axlan shot a hooded look at Pharaohs, then turned back to Mara, clamping his mouth firmly shut again. What's this about? The waiting room, Mara said, nodding her head back to the open door. I won't tell you again. Go ahead, Master Axlan, Pharaoh said, his voice under rigid control. Close the door behind you. Axlan's throat worked. As you wish, Your Excellency, he said. With a final look at Mara, he turned and retreated to the waiting room. Mara didn't give him the chance to obey Pharaoh's order about closing the door. Stretching out to the force, she did that herself. She turned back to Pharaoh's, half expecting to find a blaster in his hand. But he was just standing quietly, his hands empty. Are you who I think you are? He asked quietly. I'm the Emperor's Justice, Mara said, striding across the soft carpet toward him. As she did so, she opened the pouch at her side and withdrew her lightsaber. Is there some reason you're expecting justice to come calling? I hardly think you need to ask that question, Pharaoh said. The tension was gone from his voice, a melancholy resignation in its place. No, I don't, Mara said. She pressed the lightsaber's activation stud, and with a snap hiss the magenta blade appeared. You're accused of treason, Governor Bider Pharaohs. Of conspiring to hand over land and equipment belonging to the Galactic Empire to the Rebel Alliance. Do you deny these charges? No, Pharaoh said. Am I permitted to plead extenuating circumstances? Not for treason, Mara said flatly. The Emperor recognizes no excuses. Neither do I. Pharaohs let out a quiet sigh. No, I suppose not. Mara stepped up to the front of the desk, putting herself within range of Pharaohs. Judgment has been passed, Governor Bider Pharaohs, she said formally, lifting her humming lightsaber high. Have you any final words to say in your defense? I have no defense, Pharaohs said. 
but I do have a request. Mara frowned. Please, excuses, and curses were all familiar parts of a condemned criminal's final moments. Requests weren't. What sort of request? Pharaohs took a deep breath. That once you've dispensed justice, he said, you'll find my wife and daughter and free them. Mara felt her eyes narrow. There had been several notes in the records she remembered now, where Pharaohs had asked his security staff to track his wife's calm link usage. At the time, it hadn't seemed important to her mission. Explain. Three weeks ago my wife and daughter disappeared after returning from a shopping trip, Pharaoh said, his voice shaking with emotion. The kidnappers sent me a hollow of them in binders, along with a list of instructions. He swallowed hard. This deal with the rebellion was one of them. Are you saying the rebels kidnapped your family? Actually, I don't think it was them, Pharaoh said. His eyes flicked to the humming lightsaber, then back to Mara's face. I think they're being manipulated the same way I am. By whom? I don't know, Pharaoh said. The note was sent by someone calling himself Warlord Nuso Esva. But who he is, or whether he exists at all, I haven't been able to discover. For a long moment, Mara gazed hard at him stretching out to the force to try to read the emotions behind those tortured eyes. Treason was still treason, but if Pharaoh's was really being coerced, it was worth holding off on his death sentence until she looked into it. Do you still have the note? She asked. Yes, Pharaoh said, reaching to his desktop and picking up a data card. He hesitated, then placed it in Mara's outstretched hand. Please be careful with it, he said. It's, it may be the last picture I ever have of them. I'll be careful, Mara promised as she slipped the data card inside her tunic. Is there a time limit on his demands? Just a general schedule, Pharaoh said. Nuso Esva seems more concerned in getting everything done right than in getting it done quickly. Really? Mara said thoughtfully. Interesting. Why interesting? Pharaohs asked. Does that mean something? It might, Mara said. In fact, it meant or at least implied something rather important. But she was hardly going to share that thought with an admitted traitor. All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave the palace and start looking into this. You're going to stay here and continue to play Nisso Esva's game. She reached across the desk and picked up his data pad. You'll also let me know immediately if he or any representative contacts you. She continued balancing it in the crook of her arm punching in her comm link. Needless to say, you won't mention this to anyone. I understand, Pharaoh said, a bit hesitantly. What about the guards and my receptionist outside? They saw you come in. There are also the three guards I had to take out, Mara told him. One of them is a major Pakri, who by the way has no business holding that rank if he doesn't know proper prisoner escort procedure. He's somewhat new to the job, Pharaohs murmured. It shows, Mara said. You can tell Pakri and all the rest of them that I'm an investigator checking on reports of rebel activity in your sector, and that I decided to check out palace security while I was here. If they don't buy it, let me know and I'll throw together a preliminary report you can show them. They'll buy it, Pharaoh said firmly. May I ask where the Major and his men are? Sleeping off a sonic in the guest suite above the interrogation room entrance, Mara said. You can send someone to collect them after I leave. I'll do that, Pharaohs hesitated. Agent I'm, thank you. Don't thank me yet, Governor, Mara warned. Understand that if your story doesn't check out, I will be back. Of course, Pharaohs said. 
Understand in turn that all that matters to me is my family's safety. If you can bring them back, I'll accept whatever punishment you feel is necessary. Yes, you will, Mara said. I'll check in with you if and when I find anything. Pharaohs nodded, pulling another data card from a rack and handing it to her. Here's my comm link information and my personal encryption. Both of which Mara already had, of course. But it seemed impolite not to take the card anyway. Right, she said, sliding it into her tunic with the other one. I'll be in touch. Closing down her lightsaber, she turned and headed back toward the door, her senses fully alert. She hadn't felt any duplicity in the man, but it was still marginally possible that this whole thing was a straight-up, faceless lie. If it was, Pharaoh's best move right now would be to try to shoot her in the back before she made it out of his office. But she sensed no stealthy movement behind her, and no blaster shot sizzled across the room. Keying opened the door, she stepped into the waiting room. The lack of an attack didn't prove Pharaoh's wasn't lying, of course. But it was a strong mark in his favor. Axlon was still in the waiting room, pacing restlessly across the far side. He looked up as Mara entered, a flicker of something crossing his face. What are you, I mean? You can go in now, Mara said calmly, tucking her lightsaber back into her shoulder pouch. Circling the cylinder and its flapping butterflies, she headed for the outer door. But, Axlon's eyes shifted briefly to the office door. Aren't you, didn't you? Relax, he's fine, Mara said. We just had a little chat, that's all. She was two meters from the door when its entire edge abruptly exploded into a shower of sparks. Before she could do more than jerk to a halt, the door blew inward. And as Mara stepped hastily back, blinking against the smoke and dust, two men with blasters strode through the jagged opening. With her lightsaber tucked away in her shoulder pouch, the only thing that saved Mara in that first crucial second was the fact that the two men seemed as surprised to see her as she was to see them. They froze, their eyes going wide, their bulk blocking the doorway and the handful of other men she could see pressing in behind them. But that moment wouldn't last, and Mara knew she would never have time to open the pouch and draw her weapon before they recovered and started shooting. She took a long step backward toward the cylinder enclosure, snatching up her pouch and squeezing, crushing the thin material inward around the lightsaber. Her searching fingers found the activation stud. And suddenly the room lit up with a magenta glow as the blade lanced out, burning through the side of the pouch. The sight of the blade seemed to snap the men out of their paralysis. One of them shouted something and abruptly the smoky air lit up with a blaze of blaster fire. But Mara was no longer in the direct line of fire. She was already in motion, sidestepping the cylinder as she tried to deflect the incoming shots, even though the pouch strap across her shoulder severely restricted her lightsaber's movements. A few of the shots hit the cylinder, the direct fire blasting holes in the transparisteel, the more angled ones ricocheting off. Mara made it around to the far side, and with the cylinder temporarily blocking the bulk of the attack she finally managed to free herself from the strap. Still manipulating the lightsaber through the pouch, she made two quick slashes through the cylinder, one at knee height, the other angled upward from her shoulders, then slammed her shoulder as hard as she could against the side. With a splintering crash, the section she'd cut free toppled over into the path of the men shooting at her. They jerked back, slamming in confusion into the ones trying to push their way in behind them, their shots abruptly going wild as a hundred frightened butterflies swarmed past them and escaped through the hole where the door used to be. Here! A voice shouted from behind Mara. In here! Come on! She glanced over her shoulder. Axlon was standing just inside the office door, beckoning frantically to her. Keeping her lightsaber blade between her and the intruders, 
Mara hastily backed up toward him. The butterflies had completed their mad dash, and the blaster fire was starting to come back to focus as she reached the doorway and back through it. Axlon was ready, hitting the control to send the door sliding shut in front of her. What's going on? Pharaohs demanded tautly as Mara reached out with the force and double-keyed the lock. Someone wants my job, Mara told him, closing down her lightsaber and finally pulling it clear of the pouch. What? Pharaohs asked, sounding confused. There's a mob out there that seems intent on killing you, Mara clarified. Nuso Esva may have decided to go for the more direct approach. Wait a minute, Axlon protested. Nuso Esva's trying to kill him? But why? We'll worry about that later, Mara said, grabbing his arm and pulling him across the room toward Pharaoh's desk. The governor, meanwhile, had pulled out a blaster from somewhere, a small DDC Model 16 holdout type that nestled in his hand. At least he hadn't tried to shoot her earlier simply because he hadn't had a weapon available. Another point in his favor. Let's focus on getting out of here before they blow this door, too, she told them. The words were barely out of her mouth when there was a violent sizzling sound from behind her. And as she spun around, shoving Axlon toward the desk, the office door exploded. Luke was still looking around in vain for some sign of Axlon's imperial agent when a sudden shout rose from somewhere in the crowd still milling around the area. The governor is dead! A voice called. The governor is dead! Long live the rebellion! The governor was dead? But the imperial agent hadn't even shown her face. Or maybe she had. Maybe she'd slipped into the palace without him even noticing. Luke winced. Of course she had. He had no experience at this sort of thing. No experience, and such little ability in the force. But excuses were of no comfort. The hard, cold fact was that he'd been given a job, and he'd failed. Axlon would be furious. So would Han and Leia. So would Rikin and Mon Mothma and all the rest. Pharaoh's death meant the collapse of the negotiations, and no hope of a rebel base in Kandora's sector. Here he is! A voice shouted suddenly from behind Luke, practically in his ear. Here's the man who freed us from imperial tyranny. There was a burly, squint-eyed man with greasy hair and an unkempt mustache standing behind him, waving his hand over the crowd for attention. Was that the imperial agent? But Axlon had said it was a woman. And then, before Luke could react, the man stepped forward, jabbed a hand at Luke's belt, and stepped back with Luke's lightsaber gripped in his hand. Luke stared, chagrined, wondering how he'd been caught so unaware. Here he is! The man shouted again, lifting the lightsaber high into the air. Here's the man who saved us! Long Luke's horror. Long live the rebellion! He shouted. Long live the rebel Luke Skywalker! Say it. Say again? He demanded. A riot? Affirmative. Quiller's voice came tautly from Lorone's helmet speaker. Some insane flash riot, kicking off without any lead in that I saw. And you'll never guess who's in the middle of it, Luke Skywalker. 
Larone felt his mouth drop open. Skywalker? In the flesh? And waving his lightsaber around like he's trying to sweat birds, Quiller said grimly. You know, I didn't really buy Jade's story about Pharaohs and the Rebellion. But it's starting to look like she was right. Don't go jumping on any speeder carts just yet, Grave put in. Skywalker's not the one waving that lightsaber. Someone grabbed it off his belt. In fact, it looks like all Skywalker's trying to do is get it back. Confirmed, Quiller said. I've got a better look now. And oh, there he goes. A couple of the others in the crowd are trying to get him up on their shoulders. Lorone looked at Marcross, wishing he could see the other's expression through his faceplate. This was rapidly passing from the bizarre to the utterly insane. What's Skywalker doing? Trying to get away from them, Quiller said. And get this, the guy with the lightsaber is bellowing that Skywalker assassinated Governor Faraus. Larone felt his eyes narrow. Okay, this is officially getting out of hand, he said. Quiller, how far are you from Skywalker? About a hundred meters, Quiller said. And there's a fair amount of crowd standing between him and me. Wait a second, they're on the move, Graves said. The whole crowd's heading across the street, moving toward the gate. Traffic's at a stop. That one clump of men is still holding back, still trying to get Skywalker up on their shoulders. Larone, we've got a general order coming through. Marcross cut in. Larone keyed over to his helmet's palace comlink setting. At once to the gate and wall, a grim voice was saying, Repeat, all roving patrols proceed at once to the gate and wall. Possible riot in progress, threat assessment at critical. Everyone's being ordered to the gate, Larone relayed to the others. This could get bloody. They're not going to fire on an unarmed crowd, are they? Brightwater asked. I don't know, Laron said. But if they can't get the outside guards in fast enough, they may figure they have to. We've got warning shots, Quiller snapped. Looks like they're coming from the wall defenses. Confirm that, Graves said. Two of the lasers are laying down a pattern. The rest are tracking the forward edge of the crowd. Not good, Marcross muttered tensely. Very not good. Which may be exactly what whoever started this thing is going for, Larone said grimly. A bloody confrontation, with multiple deaths and injuries. That doesn't sound like the usual rebel tactics, Marcross said doubtfully. I'm not convinced it is the rebels. Larone glared across the grounds at the stormtroopers and gray-suited security men hurrying across the grass toward the wall. Skywalker in the middle of a riot, jade inside the palace and out of contact, no idea who or what was driving any of this madness. We need information, he said. Right now, we're shooting blind. What do you want us to do? Quiller asked. Larone pursed his lips. Grave, what's your angle on Skywalker? Reasonably clear, Grave said. There are a few business flags and a couple of tap-calf table umbrellas in the way, but nothing serious. Quiller? That man still got Skywalker's lightsaber, Quiller reported. There are another eight men still grouped around the two of them. From their positioning, I'm guessing they're there to keep Skywalker from leaving. Larone felt his throat tighten. Suddenly, like a flash of lightning from a roiling black storm cloud, he realized what was going on. Part of it, anyway. Bright water? Within view of Quiller. Okay, Larone said. First job is to get Skywalker out of there. Quiller, you engrave clear a path. Brightwater, you go in and grab him. Him and the lightsaber? Brightwater asked. 
I doubt he'll leave without it, Graves said. Yes, absolutely get the lightsaber, Laron said. Destroy it if you have to, but don't let the mob keep it. Don't let them keep any pieces, either, if you have to blast the thing. Got it, Graves said. What about you two? We're heading inside to find Jade, Laron said. If I'm reading this right, she may be in serious trouble in there. Be careful, Brightwater said. Believe it, Laron assured him. Come on, Marcross. Let's see if the Emperor's hand needs a little help. You want it? The mustached man asked mockingly, waving the lightsaber in front of Luke. Well, come on, Master Jedi Skywalker. You want it? Come and get it. Luke clenched his teeth, watching the blade weaving back and forth in front of him, fully and painfully aware that the whole thing was hopeless. With better control of the Force, he might be able to get a telekinetic grip on the handle and wrench it aside. Or he might be able to pick up one of the chairs from the Tapcaf's outdoor tables and hurl it at the man. Or he could even pick up the man himself and physically move him aside. But he couldn't do any of those things. He wasn't the Master Jedi, the other had derisively called him. He wasn't any kind of Jedi. And even if by some miracle he was able to get the lightsaber back, what then? There were eight other hard-looking men gathered around him, all of them big, all of them probably armed, all of them clearly intent on keeping him here until the palace guard or a stormtrooper patrol got here. Even with the lightsaber, there was no way he would be able to cut all of them down before one of them got him. Behind the ring of thugs, a shout rang out, and the crowd suddenly surged away from them. Luke glanced over his shoulder and saw them streaming into the street, halting the land speeder traffic that had already slowed to a crawl. They're heading to the palace, the mustached man confirmed. They're going to storm it. Luke winced. They'll be killed. Or they'll get in and take it over, the mustached man said offhandedly. Makes no difference to me. Not so long as the rebellion gets the credit. You're not part of the alliance, Luke bit out. Yeah? The man grinned evilly. Good luck proving it. With an effort, Luke pushed back the shifting sands of despair threatening to roll over him. The force was with him, and there was a way out of this. All he had to do was find it. The mustached man swung the lightsaber again, casually, mockingly. And as Luke watched him wielding the clearly unfamiliar weapon, he had an idea. He couldn't yet call on the force for the strength to physically attack the man. But his full throttle flight down the Death Star trench had showed that he could call on the force for guidance. Maybe that would be enough. I don't have to prove it. Luke said, reaching down and unfastening his belt buckle. All I have to do is bring you in. You can prove it. The mustached man frowned as he watched Luke pulling his belt free. What do you think you're doing? He demanded. Like I just said, Luke said, sliding the belt through his hands. As he did so, he slipped the comm link free, palming it in his right hand. Fighting with a lightsaber isn't as easy as it looks. He continued, finishing the belt slide with the tip in his left hand and the buckle hanging free. Let's see how fast a learner you are. The other looked down at the belt as Luke began swinging it loosely in his hand. You're joking, he said flatly. I've got a friend who says that hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, Luke said, glancing to his right and left. The rest of the men in the circle, at least those he could see, were watching the unfolding drama with the same fascinated disbelief as the mustached man was. With luck, that would slow their reaction time when Luke made his move. That goes for stun whips, too. The other snorted. You have a stun whip in your belt?
This would take both timing and accuracy. Hopefully, the force would supply both. Stretching out as best he could, he snapped his wrist, sending the belt swinging in a wide arc toward the other man's right knee as if trying to get the buckle past the glowing blade between them. But the belt wasn't long enough, and the man was far quicker than Luke's swing. As the buckle arced toward him, he twisted his wrists, swinging the lightsaber down and to his right and slashing it across the belt. And with the mustached man's hands now turned over and fully exposed, Luke threw his calm link as hard as he could into the man's right thumb, the one pressing down on the activator stud. The man bellowed in pain, reflexively yanking his injured hand away from the lightsaber. And with the usual sizzling hiss, the blade vanished. The man recognized his mistake instantly, of course. But it was already too late to fix it. Even as he tried to get his hand back to the lightsaber's activation stud Luke was on him, grabbing the hilt of the lightsaber with his left hand and slamming the knuckles of his right fist into the back of the man's left hand. With another bellow the other let go, lunged forward, and gave Luke a shove that sent him staggering two meters backward. Then, shaking his injured right hand once, he reached into his jacket and pulled out a blaster. He wasn't alone, either. All around the circle, there was a sudden flurry of motion as the onlookers also went for their weapons. Clenching his teeth, Luke ignited the lightsaber, stretching out to the force again and trying not to think about the impossibility of getting all nine of them before they took him down. The mustached man leveled his blaster and jerked backward as a blaster bolt from above sizzled into the ground in front of him, blowing small splinters of permacrete from the walkway. Startled, Luke looked up. Standing on one of the nearby rooftops was an Imperial stormtrooper with a long sniper rifle pressed against his shoulder. The trooper fired again, this shot blowing more permacrete from the ground somewhere behind Luke and eliciting a yelp from one of the men in the back. Behind you! The mustached man shouted and dodged to the side as a fresh volley of blaster fire erupted from that direction. Luke spun around, dropping into a crouch. Another stormtrooper was on the ground barely thirty meters away, charging toward them in that loping run that Luke had seen both Imperials and Rebels use when they wanted to cover ground and shoot accurately at the same time. One of the thugs on that side of the ring opened fire, his first shot glancing off the stormtrooper's shoulder. He didn't get a second shot. He fell, cursing as a pair of blaster bolts burned through his leg. Another of the thugs yelped as a bolt from the sniper on the rooftop cut through his right forearm, sending his blaster flying into the street. Behind the stormtrooper, a scout trooper on a speeder bike swung into view around the line of land speeders that had been stopped by the rampaging mob and headed toward them. With that, the mustache man had finally had enough. Get out of here! He shouted, already heading for one of the side streets leading away from the palace. Rendezvous point three. Move it! With a speeder bike and its underslung blaster cannon bearing down on them, the other thugs didn't have to be told twice. They took off, a few of them heading for the same side street down which the mustache man had disappeared, the others running into the tap calf or nearby shops. Two of them paused long enough to shove their blasters back into concealment and grab the man with the wounded leg. Lugging him between them, they headed for the closest doorway and disappeared inside. And now, instead of facing nine thugs, Luke was facing three armed stormtroopers. All in all, the thought occurred to him, it wasn't much of an improvement. So why did he feel an unnatural calmness flowing into him from the force? The running stormtrooper had jogged to a halt. His eyes and blaster turned away from Luke and toward the swirling mob and the sounds of blaster and laser fire that Luke suddenly realized were coming from that direction. Focused on the force and his own danger, he'd completely lost track of what was happening on the far side of the street. He winced as someone screamed with pain or rage. 
and jerked back as the speeder bike braked to a halt beside him. Get on, the trooper's filtered voice ordered. Laron says you need to get out of here. For a second the name didn't register. Then Luke got it, and he felt his eyes widen. Laron, Marcross, Grave, Quiller, and Brightwater? He asked. You were expecting Lord Vader? Brightwater growled. Come on. Luke still had no idea what was going on. But with a rampaging mob and imperial firepower in one direction and nine armed and irate thugs in the other, this was no time to get picky. Closing down his lightsaber, he retrieved his calm link from where it had bounced off the mustached man's hand and swung his leg over the bike's saddle behind Brightwater. He'd barely gotten settled when the trooper hit the speeder's throttle and took off. Where are we going? Luke called, gripping the trooper's utility belt as they shot past both the mob scene and the street and shops where the thugs had fled. Brightwater? Don't know, the other called back. Larone just said to get you out of there and find out what you know about this lunatic attack on the palace. I don't know anything, Luke told him. It's nothing we're doing, that's for sure. Who's we, and what are you doing? Luke hesitated. When he and Han had last dealt with Laron's group, the former stormtroopers had renounced their imperial connections and were working on their own for the people of the galaxy, delivering justice and aid wherever they saw a need. But now here they were, apparently fully integrated into Governor Farrow's security forces. Did that mean they were back on the Empire's side? Or were they simply on Farrow's side? And did he know any more what Pharaoh's side really was? Skywalker? Brightwater prompted. Come on, we've got our next stretch from here to Imperial Center on this one. We were invited here by Governor Pharaoh's to support him against an alien warlord named Nusso Esva, Luke said. He still didn't fully understand what was going on, but the Force had given him a sense of calm as Brightwater came up. He would take his cue from that and assume Laron and his group could be trusted. You sure that was the name? Brightwater asked, his voice suddenly odd. Nuso Esva? Pretty sure, yes, Luke said. There was also some talk about Kandora's sector seceding from the Empire, but I'm not so sure about that. Pharaohs might have just thrown that in to persuade us to bring a good-sized force here. Anything else? Again, Luke hesitated. He trusted Laron and the others, trusted them implicitly. But he had other loyalties, too, and he couldn't betray them. Nothing else I can tell you, he said. But our plans definitely don't involve a riot at the palace. Or anywhere else. For a moment Brightwater was silent. Then, abruptly, he made a hard left into another of the side streets, this one lined mostly with apartment buildings. I have to get back, he said, bringing the vehicle to a halt. You have someplace you can go? I don't know, Luke said, trying to think as he climbed off the speeder. My ship's back at the spaceport. But our chief negotiator is still in the palace. If that riot breaks through, he may need my help getting out. So you're staying here? For now anyway, Luke said. I need to talk with our people. I have no idea what's going on anymore. Join the club, Brightwater said darkly. Good luck. Thanks, Luke said. And thanks for the rescue. No problem, Brightwater said. Wait a second. Reaching to his waist, he unfastened his utility belt. There's emergency rations and a few other items in there that you might find useful, he said, handing the belt to Luke. If you're going to ground, you may need some extra gear. Thanks, Luke said. Good luck and watch yourself, Brightwater said. Whatever's going on, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. 
Swinging the speeder around in a tight circle, he roared down the street and headed back toward the palace. Luke took a deep breath and glanced around. There were no vehicles and only a few pedestrians in sight, and none of them was paying him any attention, despite the fact he'd just been dropped off by a scout trooper. Apparently the citizens of Whitestone City had learned to keep their curiosity to themselves. That was fine with Luke. Kraken needed to be brought into this right away, and Luke had no time to look for a private place from which to call him. Looping Brightwater's utility belt over his shoulder, he pulled out his comm link, only to discover that it was broken. He stared at the device, a hard knot forming in his stomach. Even granted that he'd thrown the comm link at the mustache man's hand as hard as he could, he hadn't thought he'd thrown it hard enough to break it. But clearly he had. Which meant he was alone here. Even more alone than he'd realized. He took a deep breath. He wasn't alone. The force was with him. He looked around, getting his bearings, and set off toward a group of small shops clustered at the street corner beyond the apartment complexes. The first thing he needed to do was get some new outerwear in case the mustache man and his gang were still on the hunt for him. Then he would find a quiet place to empty the pouches of Brightwater's belt and find out what he had to work with. And once he'd done all that, hopefully he would be able to come up with a plan for getting Axlon out of the palace. The first wave of attackers through the remains of Pharaoh's office door were careless or untrained or both. They charged through the ragged gap firing blindly, most of the shots going wide but a few of them coming straight at Mara as she stood in front of the governor's desk. Unfortunately for the attackers, those straight shots were the ones most easily deflected directly back at them. Three of them died, and two or three more were wounded, before the rest got the message. Unfortunately for Mara, calmer heads had taken over since that first mad rush. The remaining attackers were crouched at the edges of the opening, or behind the bodies of the fallen, shooting in coordinated volleys that were becoming increasingly difficult for her to deflect. Worse, sooner or later it would probably dawn on them that if they stopped firing, charged in, and fanned out to both sides, they could present her with a crossfire that even she couldn't survive. The only thing preventing them from doing that right now, in fact, was that Pharaohs was crouching by the side of the desk with his blaster, firing carefully measured shots through the doorway. Charging in now would merely give the governor better targets, and even though he couldn't stop a concerted rush, it didn't seem like any of the attackers was all that eager to sacrifice himself for whatever cause it was they were fighting for. Still, the standoff couldn't last much longer. A fully charged DDC-16 only carried about 20 shots, and although Mara's attention had been too focused on her own defense to keep count, she knew he had to be running low. Unless he had a spare power pack in his desk, she was soon going to be on her own. Completely on her own, in fact. The battle had dragged on for at least five minutes now more than long enough for Pharaoh's security forces to have been alerted and come running to the rescue. The fact that no one had done so implied that they'd been killed, locked out, or otherwise coerced into inaction. Which meant Mara was going to have to either get Pharaohs out of here fast or else drastically switch tactics. There would be an emergency exit somewhere in the office, she knew. Nearly all governors and moths had won for precisely this sort of situation. But with Pharaoh's pinned down by his desk, there was no way he was going to make it over to wherever his bolt hole was and get it open. She was just going to have to do this the hard way. Moving toward the attackers would be dangerous, since closing the gap would shorten the time she had to react to their shots. But it was the only way to push them back. Once they were out of the doorway, she might buy herself some breathing space and Pharaoh's some mobility. She took a step forward. And then, even as the enemy gunfire increased, a new sound flicked into her straining consciousness, the deeper, 
heavier sound of a stormtrooper's Blast Tech E11. The barrage coming at her faltered, then stopped completely, and for a handful of seconds the two different sounds competed with each other. Then both sets of weapons trailed off and stopped. As Mara lifted her lightsaber back into defense position, two stormtroopers appeared, easing their way over the bodies and through the blasted doorway. Are you all right? One of them called. Taking a deep breath, Mara closed down her lightsaber. Even through the vocoder's mechanical filtering, she had no trouble recognizing that voice. Good timing, Laron, she said. Yes, we're fine. No, we're not, Axlon called tautly from behind the desk. I need help back here. They found Pharaohs lying stretched out on the floor, his head cradled in Axlon's lap. A blackened line sliced across a mass of swelling skin on the left side of his scalp. I think he must have caught a ricochet, Axlon said grimly as Mara knelt down beside them. I tried to tell you, but I don't think you heard. No, I didn't, Mara said, checking his vital signs and leaning closer to the wound. It looked mostly superficial, possibly scorching the cranial bone but not penetrating through to the brain. For the second time today, it seemed, Governor Pharaohs had cheated death. Medpoc? Doesn't one already had his out and open? Doesn't look too bad, he said. No, but his heart beats a little thready, Mara said, pulling out the spray hypo and loading an anti-shock booster vial into it. She injected the dose, then put the hypo back and selected a pair of burn patches. Any idea on our attackers? No, Marcross said. But I'm guessing they're with the rioters out front. Mara frowned up at him. We have a riot going on. Reasonably big, very loud, and getting nastier by the minute, Marcross told her. The whole palace security contingent has been ordered to the wall to stop the people who are trying to climb over. Which could also be accomplished by opening fire and slaughtering a few of them, Laron added. Fortunately, the general in charge seems to be trying to avoid that. That would be General Yularno, Mara said as she laid the patches across Pharaoh's burns. Very stolid, very by the book. Not very imaginative. I can believe that, Marcross said. He keeps calling for Governor Pharaoh's to check in. Probably hoping for some fresh ideas. You're not actually going to take him out there, are you? Axlon asked anxiously. You mean out where someone else can take a shot at him? Mara countered, closing the med pack and handing it back to Laron. Don't worry. We're going to find some place to go to ground until we get this mess straightened out. You mean the riot? Marcross asked. I mean the fact that someone set me up, Mara said bluntly. They set up Pharaohs to commit treason, then they set me up to kill him. She gestured toward the bodies lying in the doorway. And they wanted to catch me in the act. There may be another possibility, Laron said. There's a person. Can this wait? Mara interrupted. Yes, of course, Laron said, sounding a little embarrassed. Sorry. I assume we're not going out the front. Marcross said, nodding toward the office door. That depends, Mara said. How many dead guards did you see outside the office suite on your way in? And did you see any of our attackers cross the courtyard while you were waiting out there for me? The two stormtroopers exchanged looks. There were two dead guards and a woman I assumed was a receptionist, Laron said. We didn't see anyone in the courtyard who wasn't security or a stormtrooper, Marcross added. What does any of that have to do with anything? Axlon asked. 
a lack of dead guards would have meant that a sizable fraction of Pharaoh's security force was in on it, Mara told him. The guards would have simply stepped aside instead of letting themselves get killed defending him. And since the attackers didn't come in through the front gate in the last half hour, they either had a private way in, or they came in earlier and were hiding somewhere inside, Laron said. The security corps in general may still be loyal, but someone in the palace is helping them. So we go for Pharaoh's bolt hole, Mara said, looking around the room. Let's spread out and find it. Try back that way, Axelon said, pointing toward one of the rear corners. I think he was getting ready to move in that direction when he was hit. Mara studied the corner. The walls back there included a lot of hand-carved scrollwork that would be more than adequate to conceal release buttons. Laron, watch the door, she said, heading across the room. Marcross, pick up the governor and come with me. That's all right, Axelon said. I can carry him. I apparently didn't make myself clear, Mara said, pausing and looking back at him. We're leaving. You're staying here. Governor Pharaohs is my friend, Axelon said firmly. More than that, he's my ally. I won't desert him in his time of need. So you're a rebel? Axlon flinched, but nodded. Yes, I am, he said, with no regret or embarrassment in his voice. But like it or not, sometimes enemies have to work together against a bigger enemy. He gestured at Pharaohs. Whoever's trying to kill the governor is that bigger enemy. Just one small problem, Mara said. I don't trust you. I don't trust you either, Axelon countered. So let's get practical. There may be more trouble out there, trouble you'll need to shoot your way through. You really want to find out the hard way whether stormtroopers can lug an unconscious man and shoot at the same time? Mara grimaced. They didn't have time for this. <laughs>